A Growing Affection, Book 4, Part 1, by Zovon Rentail. The village hidden in the leaves did not receive many visitors, and as such, it only had three places for travelers to rest. The Octagon Shuriken was a high-class, high-price hotel, with a five-star restaurant on ground floor and four large suites on each of the other three floors. It was commonly rented out to the most wealthy and influential clients of the Kanoha, though occasionally some of the more well-off ninjas would rent a suite for a small party or a romantic evening. The Tsukino Inn had been the manor house of a now-defunct shinobi clan, but had been sold off and converted into a bed and breakfast in the land of mist style. It generally played host to foreign ninjas who had business with the leaf or to clients who were too frugal to stay at the octagon shuriken. And lastly, the Dragon's Roost was a seedy motel that failed to live up to its grand name. It was a refuge for the most desperate of petitioners or for one-night stands between the Kanoha's citizens. However the three hotels were not often full, except for two weeks every two and a half years, when the leaf village played host to the Chunin exams and New Year's Eve. The shuriken had been retrofitted after the last Chunin exam, at the center of the building there were now four fast, quiet elevators, one for each stack of suites. Gaining entry to each lift required the key to one of the three rooms it served, affording guests an additional level of security and privacy. Now the B elevator door opened onto the foyer of suite 3B, and the porter slowly wheeled the room service cart out into the entryway. Unlike most leaf civilians, he had little love or interest in the leaf ninjas. He held no hate, fear, or prejudice towards them, he simply did not idolize them either, and with a few exceptions, could not have picked out a given ninja in street clothes from any other random citizen. Despite that, he was painfully aware of the identities of four of the suite's thirteen inhabitants, and he checked the contents of the card again before knocking anxiously on the door. Just a menu. The supplication was cut off as the door suddenly swung inwards, accompanied by a half-dozen outraged shouts of Enko. The porter's eyes widened at the sight of eleven women in various states of undress. All but three of them hid as quickly as they could, some simply diving behind the couches and chairs, but a few used ninjutsu to vanish into the suite's other rooms. The remaining three simply stared at him impassively, even the slender teen with long blonde hair who was completely topless. The brunette woman with the red triangle tattoos on her cheeks resumed tying her bustier, not paying him any further thought. Do you have everything? Enko Mitarashi demanded. The kunoichi's long, purple hair was loose for a change, and she had answered the door in a strapless bra and thong panty set that would not have stood up to the rigors of a ninja mission. She held herself proudly, even suggestively, and found it hard not to laugh as the young man struggled not to stare at her chest or hips. Yes, ma'am, he croaked, taking the cover off the tray. It held fourteen glasses of ice water and a variety of lipsticks, blushes, hairsprays, and other cosmetic accoutrements. The uninhibited Jonan looked over their order and nodded, pulling the cart into the room. As she started to close the door, the attendant found his voice. Wah, what about my tip? he asked quickly. Your tip is telling me you already got your gratuity, Anko smirked, and her eyes flickered lower. The already blushing young man turned red from his forehead down to his neck, and he quickly turned and darted back to the elevator. Mitarashi closed the door, and Eno laughed lightly, finally reaching for her own strapless brassiere. That was cruel, Enko, short-changing him like that, Hannah Inazuka stated, though her tone didn't match her words. The veterinarian Kunoichi finished securing her lingerie, and then stalked over, collecting a water and the lipstick she had requested from the tray. Come on, that peak had to be worth at least one hundred rio, Anko chuckled. You might have warned us first, Yugao chided her teammate, emerging from one of the bedrooms, most of us are not as unabashed as you three are, and using substitutions isn't good for keeping your hair in place. The Huka sisters emerged from behind one of the sofas, both red in the face, and Hinata nodded her agreement with the former ANBU operative. I'm surprised you ducked out, Tamari, Enko ignored her friend and addressed the San Shinobi as she and Sakura returned to the main room from the second bedroom, you don't strike me as the bashful type. I acted on instinct, the blonde Jonin shrugged. She also grabbed a beverage, before returning to her bag. She shed her more utilitarian undergarments and began replacing them with more seductive versions. Like most of the women, her hair was loose. 
Now I feel even more sorry for you, Inosan, Keiko Takamichi stated boldly as she and Moegi left their hiding place behind the other couch, and Sasami uncurled from her spot behind the recliner. Enko smiled at the teen dangerously, but the recovering Jenin met the Jonan's glare without flinching. If I minded, I would have hid like the rest of you, Yamanaka shrugged as she finished adjusting her bra. What's with you wimps? Orochimaru's former apprentice sounded genuinely annoyed, no one here has anything to be ashamed of, unless it's being a little too skinny. What would you do if you had to show some skin for an assignment? Hinata, Hanabi, Moegi, Sasami, and Sakura all blushed at the suggestion. But Yugao shook her head in objection. I don't think there is a woman here who would not expose herself, if it were truly necessary for her mission, the younger purple-tressed woman countered, but that is separate this situation. And I doubt your fiancé would be happy to learn you are flashing random porters to avoid paying a gratuity. I didn't do it to get out of tipping him, Anko looked slightly chagrined, that was just a bonus. I just didn't think is was worth waiting. Shizen-san, Tenten-san, do you want me to bring you your waters and the eyeliner? Sasami called to the north-facing bedroom where the last two kunoichi were still sequestered. Two statements of assent followed, and the petite redhead collected the mentioned items and carried them into the other room. Tamari moved behind Hannah and began braiding the dog trainer's hair. Why is Shizen-san hiding in the other room? Hanabi asked softly, sliding on her camisole undershirt. Unlike most of the women, the youngest girl's new underwear was not designed for sex appeal. Sakura began to work on Keiko's hair, but the medic also surreptitiously checked on the four long scars on the younger woman's lower back. Senpai doesn't want Hanasan to see her before she is ready, Sakura answered brushing out Takamichi's long, gray locks. Hanabi's pale eyes widened, and Moegi's jaw dropped for a moment. Ino fixed the Inazuka Kunoichi with an appraising gaze. Does that mean you two are going out tonight as more than just friends? Keiko prompted the tattooed Kunoichi. Hannah nodded carefully, so as not to pull her hair out of Tamari's hands or disrupt the San Shinobi's movements. I'm sorry, Hanabi gasped. Most of the women chuckled at the teen's reaction and Moegi realized she, Keiko, and Hanabi were the only ones who had not known the two women's plans constituted a proper date. Why? Hannah asked, unperturbed. I didn't know you were. The younger woman trailed off. Since her encounter with Madara, she had become overly self-conscious about her treatment of others, and she did not want to risk offending the Takujo. Interested in women? Hannah finished for Hanabi, and the girl nodded contritely. I don't know that I am, the animal healer shrugged non-committally, I've always found other women attractive, and not just in an aesthetic way. But I generally prefer men. I like the way they smell, and there is nothing like a long, hard. Tamari coughed suddenly, and Hannah trailed off. Hanabi had taken a play out of her older sister's book, and her face was a brilliant crimson. Moegi and Sasami were also blushing, though not as furiously. No longer an inexperienced virgin, Hinata still turned a little red, as did Sakura and Yugo. But Keiko leaned away from Sakura with an expectant look, and Ino nodded in agreement. Bicep to hold on to on a cold night, the Inazuka daughter completed her statement, though none of the other women looked convinced by her dodge, but there was something about Shizun, she and I just clicked. There is a bit of an age difference, but we have so much in common, like our interest in medicine. And practice running herd on untamed bitches? Enko interjected. Some of the kunoichi chuckled, and a few looked aghast. But Sakura smirked at the older woman even as she pulled the Takamichi Jenin back into position. I'll try to remember not to mention that to the Hokage, Shizun called out from the other room, and Haruno nodded her agreement. And I would appreciate it if you didn't talk about Kiba-san in that fashion, Hanabi said softly. The other girls goggles at her, and then most burst out laughing. Damn it, Hanabi, Enko wiped tears of her face, you're gonna make me ruin my makeup. But that was good, Keiko complimented her teammate, and the young ninja smiled happily at the success of her jibe. So, I'm not clear, Hannah asked carefully yet pointedly, does that mean you have forgiven my brother, or not? During her hospital stay, Kiba and Naruto had had a run-in outside of the younger woman's room. The dog trainer had taken the chance to get a few digs at the former Jinchuriki, including suggesting that the Kyuubi's death had been a lie to get people to accept him. But Hanabi had overheard them, 
and she had told Inazuka to leave. After Kiba stalked off, she and Naruto had discussed his life as a demon host, cementing the forgiveness and acceptance between the tween and her older sister's fiancé. And the next time they had met, she had started using a new honorific to refer to Uzumaki. Well, I'm not sure, Hanabi blushed again, but this time not so thoroughly, I still think he should not have said those things to Naruto Nizan, but he would not be Kiba-san if he did not feel and act in that way. And he also helped us, although I doubt that was what he intended, or that he would be pleased. Someone needs to give that guy an attitude adjustment, Eno snapped, flexing her fingers as if she wanted to slap him again. What do you think about Kiba's reaction, Hanasan? Hinata asked carefully yet curiously. Sum's eldest child considered that briefly, before speaking. My little brother is passionate and stubborn, she stated, like the rest of my family. He would rather hold a grudge than admit he is wrong. And he is entitled to his opinion, even if I don't agree with him. Hinata nodded, thankful for a more moderate opinion of her friend and former teammate. Is that why you're not going out with the hound tonight, Chibi? Enko prompted. Hanabi shook her head. Kiba-san does not think of me in that way, she added as Ino grabbed her ears to stop her head from moving. The immodest blonde began combing out the younger Hyuga's hair. I am not sure if he is oblivious to my interest or is simply pretending he doesn't know. He's oblivious, Sakura snorted. How do you know that, Sakura-san? Hanabi looked slightly confused, and Ino had to steady her head again. He's a man. They're all oblivious, the pink-haired medic stated, and there was another round of head nodding by the kunoichi who were not currently having their hair styled. Oh, it's not just men, is it Enko? Yugo stated so smoothly that those ladies who were not fully privy to Enko and Iruka's past missed the barb. The snake summoner stuck her tongue out at the other purple-tressed jonin. Is that why you're going to with Kaysan? Moegi prompted Hanabi. No, Hanabi tried to shake her head slightly, but Ino was too quick and too strong for the younger teen to indicate her denial, Kay asked me, and I accepted. Even if Kibasan had asked me later, I would not have abandoned my commitment. Even if Kay merely invited me out of obligation, and perhaps pity as well. Oblivious, Keiko mouthed the statement silently so Moegi, Hinata, Hana, and Tamari could see her, but Hanabi, and thus the others, could not. Hinata grinned slightly and Tamari chuckled. You are done, Moegi chan, the elder Huga girl stated, as she finished securing the complex braid in the Genin's vivid orange locks. Thank you, Hinata san, Moegi said, sliding forward and checking the weaving in the mirror Hinata held up for her. What do you want me to do with your hair? Just a ponytail, I think, the white eyed Takujo answered as they switched places. Anything too fancy won't hold up, and I usually have it braided. Dancing again? Ino asked, rolling her eyes. But despite that, there was a hint of jealousy in her voice. Do you two own part of the golden shoe yet? We like dancing, Hinata said defensively, and it's good for timing and footwork. Plus it gives you two an excuse to hang all over each other in public, ten ten teased from the other room. Hinata blushed, yet also offered a small, sly grin. Then her expression cleared as she spoke again. And we aren't exactly going alone, Hinata glanced around the room her gaze finally settling on Enko. Remembering Hinata's aborted party for his sixteenth birthday, Naruto had decided to rent the entire golden shoe for New Year's, dipping into Yukihana's savings for the first time to do so. All of the kunoichi in the suite, save one, and their dates, were attending, plus a few others not present. Naruto's buying the booze, I'm not about to say no to that, Enko shrugged, trying to cover her own love of the fancy dance hall. Try not to drink him out of house and home, Enko, Yugo suggested tactfully. You insisted Kay and I join the rest of you, sister, Hanabi said, petulant in her uncertainty. You could have said no, Hinata frowned unhappily. No, it's fine, Hanabi said hastily, it isn't like we had any other plans. And I'm sure Kay will be more comfortable than if we were somewhere alone. What are you doing then, Eno? Sakura said rather pointedly. I managed to convince my father to let us attend the party, the blatant blonde answered smugly. Every year on New Year's Eve, the Yamanaka clan hosted a lavish swari. Besides the other clan's leaders and wealthy local businessmen, some of Eno's mother's former associates in the fashion and entertainment industries were always in attendance. 
but only adults who were also of drinking age were generally invited. Sakura knew her friend and rival had been trying to wrangle an invitation for years. Wow, Moegi exhaled enviously, her eyes practically glittering like stars, do you know who was there last year? I would rather spend New Year's with friends, the pink-haired medic interjected, and Hinata nodded. They had both taken their blonde comrade's rejection of Naruto's invitation somewhat personally. Well, not all of us get to spend a month lazing around on a movie set as bodyguards, Ino shot back, tugging on Hanabi's hair a little more firmly than she intended, making the younger woman grimace, so we have to take any chance to hobnob that we can get. It's too bad you won't be joining us, Sasami said neutrally, attempting to head off any more arguing, though I can understand wanting to spend the holiday with your family. Sakura and Ino continued glared at each other despite the Thraducer's words, until Hanabi squeaked in pain under the blonde's normally skillful hands, causing both of the older teens to relax. Yeah, well, if we get bored, maybe we'll swing by, Ino conceded. Keiko, you and Udon-san are coming too, aren't you? Hanabi prompted her teammate. Yes, the other girl answered, it isn't like a date, we were just going to the party, so we decided to go together instead of going alone. The gray-haired girl paused with an annoyed look. She and Sakura had finished styling one another's locks, Keiko also preferring a simple style, and the medic's short hair being easier to work with and offering fewer options. The genin was pulling up her dress, but it, like her new underwear, was more snug around her hips and but than it had been when she had picked it. I need to get back to my normal workout schedule, the recently injured Kunoichi groused. Enko snorted, drawing a confused look from the teen. I don't think that will help, Keiko-chan, Yugo explained, you're going through puberty, your hips and bust are going to get bigger. But. But it's been over a year since my first cycle, she looked embarrassed to admit it, I thought I was going to stay more slender. You're hardly voluptuous it kid, Anko noted confidently. Your previous diet and exercise regimen hindered your growth, Sakura offered, and in an unhealthy way. But that changed while you were in the hospital and now that you're in physical therapy. And as long as you're under our care, you'll keep eating right and letting your body develop naturally, Shizun lectured from the other room. You'll still probably never be as big as some of us, Ino leaned over and poked Hinata's left breast, mostly to illustrate her point. Hinata let out an angry squeak, but turned bright red as well. But what about Kay and I, the Takamichi girl sounded almost desperate, ignoring Yamanaka, we won't be able to fight as twins anymore. Kikuan could always start dressing like a woman, instead, Hannah offered with a mild grin. A few of the other women chuckled, and Keiko grinned sheepishly. We have discussed that option, in passing, Takamichi admitted, blushing. Maybe Naruto could teach Kekuan the sexy jutsu, Tamari suggested, setting off another round of laughter and drawing horrified looks from both of the aforementioned Jenin's teammates. I could ask Naruto, if you would like, Hinata added innocently, having mostly recovered from Ino's assault. Onizen. Hanabi squeaked in protest. You ladies are having too much fun, Ten Ten announced, emerging from the bedroom where she and Shizun had been sequestered. Her hair flowed behind her almost to her knees, Shizun Haven given the younger woman's tresses a wave that was just beyond subtle. The weapon expert's makeup was similarly understated, with just a hint of blush on her cheeks and a light pink gloss on her lips. Her dress was a shimmering green silk sheath, going over her left shoulder only. It ran almost down to her ankles, but had a slit in the left side that ran up to the middle of her toned thigh. She carried a small, black leather handbag and wore matching pumps. If you don't hurry up, Niji's fiancé continued to admonish them, you won't be done before our reservation for this suite runs out. I'm trying, Keiko pouted, sliding her dress a few centimeters higher, but I don't want to tear it. Hold on a moment, Keiko-chan, Yugo approached the young woman, signing, Ninja Arts, Alterations Jutsu. The elegant warrior ran her fingers down the sides of Keiko's dress, straining against the young woman's curves. As she did, the dress loosened slightly, and the genin was able to slide it into place. Thank you, Yugao-san, the younger woman said in relief as she slipped her arms through the straps. The red dress was straight cut and ended just above the teen's knees. The moderately thick straps provided some extra coverage above her modest cleavage and crossed in the back. You might not want to buy such tight-fitting clothes for the few years, Hannah advised her, 
the canine trainer's eyes momentarily slipping away from the door Ten Ten had just exited. The other Kunoichi all briefly looked at Keiko's hair, makeup, and outfit, and deciding it was acceptable, they returned to their own preparations. Sakura was the next to finish, and was arguably the most simply dressed. She wore a pale, yellow tank top and a layered white skirt with a matching, short-sleeved, half-jacket. Her lips had been tinted the color of her shinobi uniform, and she had applied a dark eyeliner to give more definition to her green orbs. She also frowned in spite of herself, Keiko's tight dress made it look like the younger woman was more voluptuous than the medic, though that was not far from the truth. Are you going to hide in there all night, Shizun? Enko prompted as Hannah secured the belt on her pants. The veterinarian slipped her suit jacket on and buttoned it. She wore no shirt underneath, and the cut of her coat showed more than a little décolletage as well as the top of her bustier. The pinstripes of the black material matched and complemented the light gray silk of Hannah's undergarment. Her braided hair was tucked into the jacket, and the canine expert slipped a rakish fedora onto her head. I'm waiting for Hannah to be done, the healer answered nervously, remaining out of sight. I'm ready, Shizun, the Inazuka heiress stated, after checking her makeup and securing a gold chain so its sapphire pendant hung just above her cleavage. The master healer stepped into the room slowly. Her short, ebony hair had been given a layered style by Tin Ten, and the weapon mistress had also put a light crimson blush on Shizun's cheeks, and a darker shade on the her thin lips. Shizun's dress was of a deep, almost black, purple satin, wrapping straight around her breasts and going down to her knees. There was a band of silvery silk under her cleavage that helped emphasize the medic's more modest curves. The sheath dress boasted two spaghetti straps, but was tight enough that they were more for show than for support. She also wore a silvery silk cuff around each of her wrists, and Sasami had no doubt that there were multiple sunbon needles tucked into the decorative bracers. I guess we know who wears the pants in that relationship, Enko noted shamelessly, still not bothering to put on anything clothes besides her lingerie. Actually, Shizun picked this out for me to wear, Hannah said softly, her blush partially hidden by her clan tattoos. Most of the women looked at the Hokage's assistant in surprise, but Shizun just smiled sweetly at them. All done, Ino noted, stepping back from Hanabi, and offering the girl a mirror. Under the Chunin's expert hands, the youngest Kunoichi's face had been carefully augmented with eyeliner and rogue, until she looked closer in age to Moegi than to Keiko, though the effect was aided by the early development she shared with her sister. Let me help you get dressed, Yamanaka added, so you don't wreck your hair. Hanabi nodded carefully, still marveling at her appearance in the looking glass. Ino had wrapped the younger Hyuga's long hair into a complex series of overlapping, ever-lengthening loops, the central arc hanging down to the middle of the tween's back. Ino lifted her tresses gently up as Hanabi stepped into her white gown and slid her arms into the sleeves. Then the stylish shinobi zipped up the dress and smoothed it over Hanabi's shoulders. The girl turned, shaking out the loose, calf-length skirt portion of her dress, and then dipped her head slightly to her artist. Thank you for all of your help, Inosan, she said in earnest gratitude. Sure thing, kid, the mentalist answered, having picked up some of her new teacher's vocal tics. What do you want me to do with your hair? the young woman asked, sliding behind Yamanaka, I'm not as skilled as you are. Can you do a merging triple braid? the blonde asked. Aye. Hanabi trailed off. It's easy, I'll talk you through it, the chunin offered, start by splitting my hair in three like you would for a normal braid. After she and Shizun finished looking at each other's ensembles, Hannah started her own work on Tamari's hair. Unlike the others, the sand jonin had not waited until her hair was done to get dressed. She had slipped on an alligator skin vest, low cut and ending just above her navel. Below the waist Gara's sister wore a matching mini skirt and thigh-high boots. She started applying her lipstick as the vet started combing out her long, golden hair. What do you want, Tamari? Hannah asked. I agree with Hinata, just a ponytail will be fine, the fan wielder decided, anything more would be troublesome. She frowned and set down the lipstick angrily. I can't believe I just said that, she complained, as the others started laughing again. It could be worse, Sakura noted through her chuckles, at least you aren't running around saying believe it tut. I only did that once, Hinata protested softly as she turned bright red. Tamari smiled appreciatively at the teammates. 
Moegi finished securing Hinata's ponytail, and the white-eyed woman and the younger redhead started getting dressed. Kanolamaru's comrade and girlfriend slipped into a simple, silver, loose-fitting cocktail gown. Unlike most of the other kunoichi, Moegi's dress was designed to mask the 14-year-old slender build, rather than cling to her curves. Hinata's dress was a charcoal cotton sheath that tied around her neck, but with cutouts to make it look that the top was two strips of material wrapping around her body. But instead of bearing her skin, the gaps were filled with a gossamer orange fabric. The lower, skirt part of the gown was solid and hung just past her knees. Hinata slipped on a pair of dark gray pumps and rechecked her makeup, though as usual, she wore very little. Good job, Hanabi, Ino complimented the girl as she finished verifying Hanabi's work on her hair. She then collected her little black dress and slipped into it. She zipped it up and then adjusted it around her bust so that her undergarment did not peek out of the low-cut top. Sakura and Shizun both cringed visibly at the six-inch stiletto heels Yamanaka removed from her bag. With those, you'll be taller than Choji, Enko warned her student. It's okay, Ino shrugged as she buckled her shoes on, Chaj likes me in heels. Sasami nodded as she buttoned up her artificially faded, forest green, fitted, silk blouse. After smoothing her top into place, she slid on her black, pleated skirt and snapped and belted it tightly around her waist. She also had heels, but even if they had been high enough to boost her height by a foot, she would not have been taller than her date, Shino. She looked over herself, and then at the other women, frowning slightly. I look more like an office woman than someone going to a party, she said sadly. You look lovely, Sasami, Yugo reassured her charge. You should have more confidence, Hinata added, I am sure Shino will like it, too. Sakura grinned and raised an eyebrow at the irony of her friend's statement, a fact most of the other women caught as well, though they did not laugh this time, both for Hinata and for Sasami. The thread user nodded and slung her purse over her shoulder before putting on her shoes. I'm surprised you're not wearing a kimono, Inochan Shizu noted, her attention shifting to the less practiced healer, I remember the Yamanaka parties always being very traditional. That sort of faded away the last few years, Ino shook her head carefully, besides a kimono is too much of a hassle. She winked at Tamari as she said that, and the sand ninja snorted. Yugao shook her head as she removed her dress from its hanger. Her choice was also black, but was a shimmering material, unlike the matte cloth of Ino's and Sasami's outfits. It had a mildly plunging neckline and was low cut into the back. It flowed down to the Jonan's ankles with a short slit on either side. You could have been a model, Yugao-san, Moegi noted in all. The former ANBU agent smiled, yet shook her head in denial. It would be too exposed for me, Kakashi's fiancé countered, I like my privacy. A few of the other kunoichi nodded their agreement. As the conversation dropped off, the other women all started staring at Enko. The serpent user still was clad only in her underwear, and under their gaze she leaned back lazily and took a steady sip of her water. What? she asked innocently. Were you planning to get dressed any time soon? Shizun asked sharply. I was thinking about going like this, Midorashi shot back smugly, but without even a hint of teasing or sarcasm. But it's almost freezing outside, Moegi stated. I have a coat. The golden shoe might not have the firmest dress code, Hinata argued, her cheekbones gaining a touch of red that was not from cosmetics, but I don't think they would let you in like that. Everything is covered that needs to be, Enko shrugged, besides, Naruto reserved the whole place, so he's in charge, right? The phone rang, and Yugo answered it. As she started speaking quietly into the receiver, Shizun prompted, Stop playing around, Anko. All right, thank you, Yugo concluded, before gracefully setting down the handset. She turned back to the rest of the kunoichi. That was the manager, she informed them, he wanted to remind us that we have to check out in ten minutes, and to let us know that there are some people downstairs waiting for us, though he did not elaborate further. Fine, Anko sighed in defeat. She opened her garment bag and took out the aquamarine frock contained therein. She shimmied into the tight-fitting dress, pushing it down to her knees. It covered more than most of the other women would have expected, with strips coming out from the sides and wrapping over her opposing shoulder, before connecting again to the, the main part of the dress in the center of the back. Yugao took note that it left her friend's entire neck and collarbone uncovered. 
happy, she asked. Though she sounded annoyed, there was a buried tone of worry in the forward Jonan's voice. You look almost like a proper woman, Anko, Yuzuki winked at her former teammate. Damn, I knew I should have went with a hot pink halter top, she shot back, but she turned a little red and smiled slightly at the compliment. All right, ladies, let's not keep the boys waiting, Anko grabbed Yugao and Hinata's arms, seemingly roughly, but in such a way that she didn't muss their hair or clothing. Well, except you two, she smirked at Hana and Shizun, who linked elbows in a more intimate fashion. Ino slipped out of onto the balcony, taking a deep breath of the crisp air and letting it out as a long sigh. A few moments later she heard the door open and close again. A jacket dropped over her shoulders. Thanks, Choji, she said quietly, recognizing his lover's footsteps. You don't seem to be enjoying yourself, he rumbled gently, without any preamble. What's not to enjoy, she tried to keep the bitterness from her voice, all the important people in the village are in there, standing around talking and sipping wine. The daimyo came, with his wife and daughter. And I haven't seen Yoko for almost a year. I think I saw the stars of Monaco's favorite soap. Yuki Fujikase is even here. Choji recognized part of her annoyance stemmed not just from the state environment, but from her recognition of the fact her father had only let them attend because the Hisoka Hanakata had brought his own underage offspring along. Not anymore, he countered, Yuki snuck out about an hour ago to go to Naruto's party. Nyoko went with her. They both thought it was pretty boring here. Ino grunted indistinctly, not wanting to let on that she agreed. We could still head over to the Golden Shoe, Choji offered. And listen to Sakura gloat? Ino snorted, no, thank you. Then you better come back inside, before you catch a cold, he told her carefully. She finally turned to look at him, and decided again he looked almost debonair in his tux. Although, she said sneakily after a moment's thought, someone should probably make sure Yuki and Yoko made it to the shoe safely. Neither of them are familiar with the village, and it is pretty dark out. Aha, uh -huh, Choji grinned knowingly. Come on, we better hurry, in case they got lost, she insisted, all but charging for the door. You should have just said yes in the first place, he grumbled quietly, before following his girlfriend. I am very sorry, Sakura, Lee said again, even with all of my shinobi training, I do not seem to be very nimble on the dance floor. It's all right, Lee, she told him, sending chakra into her foot as she rubbed at the newly forming bruise, we'll just stick to the slow songs for now, okay? That would be fine, he stood up straighter at the suggestion. Then he turned back to the platform, with a look of envy. There were only three couples dancing at the moment, because the fast pace of the song and their grandiose movements had caused the, the other pairs to retreat to the safety of the eating area, though most of them still watched with varying emotions. No one ever told me Naruto could do that, Nyoko Hanakata commented to no one in particular. She craned her head to look past Shizun and Hana, watching the youngest couple dancing with a hint of jealousy. Hinata Nizan and Naruto Nizan regularly come here to dance, Hanabi Huga answered, pausing as she was carrying a pair of drinks back to the table she shared with her teammates and Udon. The fire princess turned to speak with the younger woman. You must be Hanabi, Nyoko noted, the girl's pale eyes confirming the honorifics the Kunoichi had used. The tween nodded slightly, and the royal continued, I'm Nyoko, a friend of your sister. Hanabi's eyes went wide as she realized whom she was talking to, and she bowed deeply, sloshing soda out of the glasses. Forgive my impertinence, Highness, the genin said, her lifelong training meshing with her recent personality shift to leave her thoroughly mortified that she had casually spoken to such an important personage. What impertinence? Nyoko asked kindly, it's a party and you talk to me. Thank you, Hanabi bowed again, and then quickly said, I'm very sorry, but I must get my teammate his drink. If you will please excuse me. Of course, the flame-haired teen agreed sadly, don't let me keep you. Hanabi hurried back to her seat and Nyoko sighed. It's annoying, isn't it? Koyoki Kazahana noted as she rejoined the younger noble, but it could be worse, I get to deal with those kinds of reactions both as a star and as a daimyo. I'm used to it, Nyoko bobbed her shoulders slightly, though I don't usually have to worry about it here. There are some people here who treat me like a person, not a tiara. Her eyes followed a certain blonde man as she said it, and Yuki chuckled. Yeah, Naruto is definitely like that, the actress concurred. 
Then she lowered her voice and whispered conspiratorially, You have it pretty bad for him, don't you? I, uh. Nyoko stammered, struggling to keep her voice down, No, I just think he would be a good candidate for my consort and strengthen the Hanukata line. She trailed off, noticing the elder princess's look of amused disbelief. Is it that obvious? Not that obvious, Koyoki admitted, but I do have an advantage, I used to carry a torch for Kakashi Hataki. Nyoko's eyes widened in surprise, and she shifted her attention to where the white-haired ninja danced with his partner. She had to admit, for an older man, he cut a dashing figure. The fire princess turned her gaze back to her snow counterpart thoughtfully, considering the other woman's use of the past tense. So, how did you get over him? Nyoko asked. I realized he would only ever be happy with a kunoichi, Yuki answered, a touch of sadness in her voice. Yeah, Naruto is probably the same. Come on, Yuki put her hands on the teen's shoulders, it looks like those six are finally letting other people back on the dance floor. Dance with me. But. But you're a girl, too, Nyoko protested lightly. So, if those two can do it, why can't we? She waved at the table where Hana and Shizun had settled, both breathing heavily, beside, who else here is suitable to dance with a princess? Koyoki winked at the younger woman, and Nyoko let herself be pushed forward to the stage. Wow, Hannah panted, before carefully taking a sip of water. She set the glass down, and Shizun caught it up, drinking from the other side. I had heard the rumors about Naruto and Hinata, the vet continued, but I didn't think Kakashi and Yugao would be able to outdo us as well. I wouldn't say any of them outdid us, Shizun said, placing her hand over Hannah's. The gesture was not just an expression of familiarity and affection, the medic also gently sent some of her chakra into the other woman, easing her fatigue. Hannah's eyes flashed as she recognized the technique, and she turned her hand over so that they were palm to palm. The younger healer sent her chakra back into Shizun, restoring the black-haired woman's energy in kind. Ready to go back out there? Hannah inclined her head. Let's wait for the next slow song, the Hokage's assistant suggested, tightening her grip on the vet's hand slightly. Okay. How is your leg? Sasami asked carefully, as she and Shino sat down. Sasami, his impassive voice held a whisper of irritation as he addressed his date, I have been back on active duty for three months. I appreciate your concern, but my prosthetic is fully adjusted, the feeling is fine and I have full control. I know, she said softly, it's just this dancing isn't the same as our normal work. My thighs are burning, so I was worried. Then perhaps I should be the one worried for you, she no countered in fond amusement, for I am not tired at all. Do you want to take a break? No, she shook her head, I'm fine. I just need to sit out a song. And maybe have a little snack. A piece of cake or something. I'll get you something, he said, standing. No, I'll. She surged to her feet and in her haste bumped into him. Shino caught her, both to keep her from falling and to maintain his own balance. But even after they were steadied, he held on to her for a few extra moments. Then Sasami blushed and they separated. Allow me, please, he stated, and she nodded. She watched him without sitting as Shino maneuvered gracefully through the crowd towards the buffet tables. Ten, nine, eight. As preparations for the big countdown began, the dancing stopped, and the various couples secured spots in the recently darkened room. The handful of individuals who attended alone, as well as those pairs who were just friends or just teammates conglomerate next to the dance floor. Some looked around for a partner, even those who had dates. And a number of eyes turned to the princess and the actress. Yuki leaned in and whispered something in Yoko's ear. The younger noble nodded, and the two women closed ranks and lightly clasped arms. Seven, six, five. Where are Naruto and Hinata? Kakashi whispered in Yugao's ear, holding his fiance loosely in preparation. I don't know, she answered, I haven't seen them since the band went on break. Three, two, one. Nyoko and Yuki quickly embraced, and each kissed the other on the cheek, just enough to dissuade the hopefuls. Similarly, Keiko and Hanabi gave Udon and Kei a quick peck on the cheek, respectively. Sakura's kiss for Lee was similarly brief, but Haruno applied her lips to her date's mouth. Kanoamaru and Moegi shared a proper smooch, 
but the Kunoichi was more forceful than her boyfriend, who hastily pulled away before anyone could see them, though she followed him to extend the lip lock slightly. Shino glanced around the room, while Sasami watched him anxiously. After a few seconds, he put his right hand on her left shoulder and leaned down to kiss her experimentally. Sasami lifted up onto her toes to meet him, but the insect trainer hastily pulled away a moment after their mouths touched. He pursed his lips in uncertainty. You didn't have to do that if you didn't want to, the thread user said carefully, trying not to show her disappointment at his reaction. It is tradition, he answered, his voice as flat as usual, I would not want to risk an unlucky year by flaunting it. Oh, of course. Nor am I necessarily opposed to kissing you, he said, with a tone of nervousness concealed in his words. Oh, Sasami tried to remain neutral, but a slight smile creased her face. Across the room, the recently arrived Choji and Ino broke apart with matching happy sighs. In the most hidden corner of the golden shoe, Shizun pinned the slightly taller Hana to the wall. She gently swept aside a wisp of brown hair framing the younger woman's face and cupped her tattooed cheek. Then the medic pressed her face to the vets, bringing their lips together hungrily. Shizun gently pressed her tongue into Hannah's mouth, and the dog trainer responded tentatively. More than a few moments after most of the other couples had concluded the ritual, and just as the lights started to come back up, the two women finally disconnected. They stared into each other's eyes, each surprised but also contented. I think it's going to be a good year, Hannah whispered, and Shizun nodded silently. As the countdown ended, and the fireworks started outside, Shikamaru and Tamari glared at one another. You're really not going to kiss me, she demanded, her voice soft yet harsh. Why would I, he answered, his tone more controlled, because some stupid superstition says I have to. We're modern ninjas, Tamari, you know there is no magic, and the only way we could be cursed to have a bad year is if someone placed a few injutsu on us. And I doubt that, if that were the case, kissing any random stranger would remove the seal. Is it really such an imposition to kiss me, she asked, this time sounding more hurt than mad. If I'm being forced to do it, for no good reason? Yeah. For no good reason, she stammered in disbelief. But before she could cry or get angry, he hopped forward and planted his lips on hers. She looked shocked and did her best to resist his ministrations. But after a few heartbeats she closed her eyes and pressed in closer. However, when the kiss ended ended she fixed him with a dangerous expression. You think that is going to? She hissed at him, but he cut her off with a finger to her lips. Superstition? Not a good reason to kiss you, he told her, because you want me to kiss you? All the reason I need. Her eyes softened for a moment, before returning to a look of mock anger. Don't think you're getting off that easy, Buster, she told him firmly. Of course not, he sighed. As befit the environment, Niji and Kakashi dipped their respective fiancés. Niji massaged Tenten's lips hungrily, while Kakashi's kissed Yugo lingeringly, parting their lips slightly without using his tongue. Both men carefully lifted their blushing lovers back to their feet. Enko and Irika's kiss was the longest, and to the outside observers, looked almost like a sparring match. After a while, some of the onlookers realized that the two jonin were each trying to dip the other. The struggle lasted for a few minutes, and their hands began roaming. Hanabi, Kei, Sasami, and Kanoamaru all blushed at the display, but none of them looked away. Finally, Kakashi walked up next to them and loudly cleared his throat. If you do plan to keep that up, you better go home, before you get arrested, the ranking shinobi informed them. Enko glared at him, but Iraka turned beet red, and he stealthily smoothed his girlfriend's dress back into place as he put a sliver of distance between them. Fine, Midarashi grumbled, then loudly demanded, where's our host? We need to get the music started again. On the roof of the golden shoe, Naruto reluctantly took his lips away from Hinatus, even as he pulled her closer under the blanket he had draped over their shoulders. They stood there, watching the decorative explosions blossom overhead, sharing their body heat, their great affection, and their smoldering passion. Happy New Year, Hina-chan, Naruto said lovingly. Happy New Year, Naruto, she answered joyfully. As winter melted without protest into spring in the land of fire, the rumors of odd warriors causing problems blossomed into real, known incidents of mysterious shinobi. The interlopers were acting much like common bandits, except they wore full stealth shizoku and possessed chunin-level skills. 
the renegades were also notable in the colors of the uniforms. Unlike the matte black color of a standard stealth Shizoku, these rogues' costumes were made of dark tan, dark forest green, dark navy blue, dark red, or dark gray material. But besides the coloring, their uniforms were identical, and none of them wore a headband or any other sort of village insignia. Most of the ninja villages had lost agents to the attacks, including a team of Chunin and their Takujo leader from the Hidden Leaf. And so far, no one had been able to capture any of the attackers alive. What was not common knowledge was that a small number of the dead raiders had been identified. The Sand and Mist had both been able to determine who some of the renegades had been. Two had been missing Neen, but the others were all simple bandits with no previous ninja training. How they had suddenly acquired the ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a fully vetted shinobi was a question the Conclave of Shadows had not been able to answer, and as such, the five Kages were keeping a tight hold on that bit of information. As a result of the strange happenings, the hidden villages had stepped up their training efforts, and any off-duty ninja not a tokubetsu or full jonin had been pressed into extra classes to make sure their skills were up to date, and to encourage them to learn some addition ninjutsu or taijutsu. And though they were not forced, many of the higher-ranked warriors had also increased their practice regimens, or had called upon their colleagues to share their knowledge. 98, 99, 500, Naruto finished calling out, and both he and Hinata slumped slightly at the end of the set. Spring had come early, and despite the fact that it was barely into March, the engaged shinobi were dressed in their summer uniforms for the day's practice. I. I think that's enough taijutsu, Naruto, the young woman told her lover. Yeah, you're probably right, he agreed, slightly less winded thanks to the fox blood kekiai jinkai, I just want to make sure we get all the new techniques down. It changes the tiger and heron more than I expected. It was nice of the Hokage to give us your father's part of the scrolls, she noted. Nice, he snorted, mildly annoyed, Grandma Tsunade should have given us the scrolls back when we first started studying the tiger and heron. She smiled indulgently and did not bother to contradict him. Naruto shook his head, knowing he had gone over this before, both with his fiancée and with his surrogate aunt-slash-grandmother. He saw no reason to waste their time dredging it up again. All right, our muscles may be sore, but we've still got our chakra, he stated before asking, should we work on some ninjutsu? Are you sure you don't want to work on jinjutsu? Hinata suggested, trying not so sound evasive. Naruto frowned and studied her face. Uzumaki could still be somewhat dense, but he had spent enough time with his girlfriend that he was able to recognize the tiny catch in her voice. No thanks, he grimaced hyperbolically, we just did jinjutsu yesterday, and even if I can use jinjutsu now, I'm not really into it. Besides, weren't we going to spend more time refining the raisin gan? I know we pretty much gave up on a doton raisin gan, but we could try a katan raisin gan. Or we could work on getting you to the point where you can do the right ton raisin gan without using a clone. Well, Hinata started, but found she could not finish the statement. What is it? Naruto asked quickly, with a hint of anticipation, did you already get it? No, it's not that. Sakura drew her new bow nervously yet deliberately. She sighted along the arrow, careful not to let the fletching touch her cheek. The medic had drawn her own blood more than once, by letting the stiff fibers slice her skin as she loosed a missile, but she no longer made that mistake. The powerhouse Kunoichi held the arrow launcher at extension for a few moments, watching and listening for any strain in its limbs. She did not want to doubt her teammates' craftsmanship, but she had broken no small number of bows in her early practice, and she knew Uzumaki was not well versed in archery or its tools. But the recurve short bow answered her strength easily, and did not so much as shudder as she tested it. Moderately reassured, the medic loosed the arrow. The missile shot across the practice field faster than the medic intended. It struck an inch off of the bull's eye, but despite the blunt head of the practice arrow, sank into the target up to the fletchings. Sakura blinked for a moment in surprise. The target was a one-foot-thick layer of tightly woven, replaceable hay, a rough analog for the human body, attached to a two-inch-thick wooden plank. For her arrow to have gone so deep, it must have fully penetrated the stronger backing. And she had not even taken a full draw on the weapon. For the first time she began to take seriously Kakashi's suggestion of what she might be able to do with a bow. 
the pink-haired young woman sighed as she realized her archery instructor was late. There were no S or even Irank masters of the bow in the Hidden Leaf Village, not since Yukihana Uzumaki's death. But there were a handful of shinobi with B-rank skills in archery, and Sakura was taking turns studying with three of them. Just as she started to pull back a second arrow, she heard unmasked footstep approaching, and as she eased the string back to its default state, another jonin jogged effortlessly onto the target range. Good morning, Sakura. I apologize for my tardiness, Niji Huga inclined his head slightly as he greeted her. That's all right, Niji, the younger shinobi offered, Kakashi-sensei would have been much later, and I know you and Tintin have been having trouble getting time alone. Haruno knew that Niji's fiancé had been spending more time with Hinata, though now the lessons were going both ways, with the younger woman helping the older teen with her taijutsu. On top of that the weapons mistress had been working with many of the village chunin, at the Hokage's request. That was part of the reason why Sakura had asked Niji to teach her the bow, instead of Tenten. She had learned that both of the jonin had inherited all of Might Guy's archery skills, the boisterous jonin insisting that with his Byakugan, Niji could be an expert marksman. Though she would have preferred Tenten, Niji was an easy second over Guy. And Sakura had to admit, Niji had loosened up over the last few years, and was a better and more patient teacher than she would have expected. Yes, well. Niji grinned in chagrin, but there was a hint satisfaction under his stammer, and Sakura could not prevent a twinge of jealousy. Is that the bow that Naruto crafted for you? Hinata's cousin quickly changed the subject. His eyes fell on the weapon, and he whispered, Be a Kogan. Yes, the medic nodded, I was just trying it out. She did not tell him that she had been in possession of the weapon for almost two weeks, but she had been too nervous to use it. But two days prior she had snapped another practice bow while working with Gunma, so she had decided she had to get over it and test the weapon crafted for specifically for her strength. He said he based it on a design his mother was working on, she voiced the other source of her worry, though she tried to mask it as a just a random comment. May I? Niji asked, and Sakura handed him the short bow. Purple heart, bronze, silk scrolls with jutsu inscribed in silver ink, oak, elk horn, the Huga ninja enumerated the first few layers, staring into the weapon. Then he tried to tug gently on the string and could barely budge it. He grimaced, planted his feet, and pulled back more firmly, but could only get a few finger lengths of draw out of the bow. He considered using his chakra to bolster his strength, but decided that even then, he would be lucky to get the string back halfway. What is the draw weight, he asked, returning the weapon to her, and taking his own shortbow out of a scroll. 350 pounds, she answered, trying not to sound like she was boasting, and not entirely succeeding, and if I send enough chakra into the limbs, the jutsu in here should increase the arrow's speed by another 20%. The Huga Jonin paused in amazement as he calculated the speed and power of the missile. He exhaled sharply. That is a very dangerous weapon, he conceded, but it is still only as good as its user. Shall we get to work? Yes, sensei, she stated with trace of irony. Shadow clone jutsu, Hinata placed her hands together and spawned a single copy. After a small amount of affectionate cajoling by her lover, the young woman had agreed to show him what she had been working on in private. The original Hinata held up her hands, forming a small cradle with her fingers. Chakra began to spin rapidly above her palms. The duplicate beauty leaned in, and her fingers began dancing around the ball, changing the structure of the still-forming raisin gan. The blue sphere became striated, with bands of darker blue and nearly white chakra forming. The edge of the orb grew indistinct, almost misty, and Naruto thought he felt a thin, cool fog settling onto his exposed skin. The clone stepped back and vanished, her work complete. The spiraling globe stabilized, and Hinata lifted the cloudy, streaked ball with her right hand. Sweetan, Raisin Gan, she whispered apologetically. Naruto padded closer, looking closely at the sphere. As he closed the distance, the foggy feeling turned to one of sea spray, though there was no aroma of salt. He lifted his head, his critical expression changing to one of excitement. That's awesome, Hinata, he told her. Her shoulders relaxed, and she sighed in relief. Were you really that afraid to show it to me, he asked, surprised but also disappointed. 
you were really upset last week, when Sakura and I were able to learn the Hand of Waves Jetsu, she reminded him, and you couldn't. But that was about me, not you too, he reassured her, then grumbled quietly, I just can't get the hang of water chakra. Probably something the fox did to me. You can still use four elements very well, she complimented him, that is more than most jonin, even the S-rank ones. And I can't use air chakra, so we are both in the same situation. Yeah, he agreed gratefully, touching her cheek, and now you have your water raisin gan, like I have my wind raisin gan, so we're even there, too. So what's it like? It is cool, if not cold enough to make ice, she explained, and it seems to break apart both fire and lightning techniques, though I haven't tested it too much yet. Other than that, it is just a somewhat stronger version of the raisin gan. Want to try it out, he asked eagerly, I can work on my some of my newer katun and raitun jutsu, and we can see how your raisin gan works on them. Sound good? All right, she nodded happily, and assumed her fighting stance, the aqueous sphere at the ready. Naruto hopped back and started signing. Excellent, Niji noted, I can tell you are still adjusting to that bow, but those groupings are as good as you have ever shot. Thanks, Sakura exhaled in release as she lowered her weapon. She had never known shooting to be a workout, but her arms both ached from the shoulder down. She decided it was probably because she had not previously had a bow that matched her power. Does that mean we are can start working on archery jutsu? she asked carefully. Of her three instructors, Niji was the most stringent, and he was requiring her to master the basics before he would teach her any advanced arts. Not yet, he shook his head, but we are ready for the next steps, hitting moving targets and firing while on the move. He took out a number of training kunai, soft rubber blades with a dense metal core. They mimicked the size and weight of a real ninja blade, but only inflicted large bruises instead of lethal cuts. Will you still be able to hit your target while under attack, he asked without mockery, and ran halfway up one of the larger trees before tossing one of the knives at her. Sakura ducked even as she fired, and her arrow skipped off the edge of the target. Gai-sensei's archery style is oddly lacking in flash, considering the source, the Hyuga Jonin informed his student as he blended into the foliage, but instead emphasizes mastery of the bow under what Gai-sensei considers more realistic conditions. Sakura ducked under another kunai and knocked her next missile. She grimaced when the third blunted blade bounced off her knee, but she also could not help but appreciate the philosophy behind Might Guy's style. She rolled forward and fired again. Two. Three. Hinata forced out the count while struggling to keep her breathing steady. The third sphere formed over her middle finger, and she started concentrating her chakra over her ring finger. It began to spin more slowly than the first three, and the pale beauty closed her eyes and started breathing faster from the effort. Finally, another miniature raisin gan appeared over her fourth digit. Four. She groaned, her pale orbs still squeezed tightly shut. Her face started to flush, and her breathing turned to panting, and before she could start to form the last orb, the first four dissipated. I just can't get it, she said sadly. He laughed and pulled her in close. Hinata, it took me like four months for Master the Five Points Raisin Gan, he chided her lovingly, squeezing her a little tighter. I know, she agreed, but you were just using it to practice your chakra control, and happened to discover it worked as an attack. I'm trying to learn it as a jutsu. Besides, I... She trailed off, upset with herself for even thinking it. But part of her could not help but think that she had better chakra control than her lover. Even with the loss of the demon's disruptive influence, and all off his training, Hinata knew she could still shape her key noticeably faster and much more efficiently than Naruto could. But at the same time, she could not deny that he also had an unmatched talent for learning new jutsu. Even though she and Sakura could both use ninja arts with greater precision and less energy than their male teammate, Naruto was frequently the one to execute those techniques first. Hinata could not help but wish she had that ability as well. I have you teaching me, she concluded, shoving those small sparks of envy and superiority deep into her mind. Well, Naruto considered her statement, I guess if I'm supposed to be teaching you, maybe I should do something to help you. No, I didn't mean. She countered quickly. No, you're right, Hinata, he shook his head, but what can I do for you? He pondered that for a moment, and then brightened as he thought of something. 
Hey wait, he suddenly said, you've never got a close look at the five points raisin gan with your Biakogan, right? She thought back and shook her head. Though she had studied most of his other raisin gan variations, she had never asked to see the five points, thinking it just five small copies of the spiraling sphere. The only time she had ever looked at it with her bloodline had been during the final battle between Naruto and Orochimaru, and then she had been more focused on what was happening with Sasuke and Orochimaru's chakra supplies. So, why don't you use the Byakugan and carry name Jutsu? Then we can compare what you're doing to what I do, and see if there is any difference. All right, she nodded with a hopeful look. Naruto reached out and grasped her left with his own, linking their fingers. Naruto, you don't need to do that. I can use carry name without contact now. Despite her protest, Hinata didn't sound unhappy. I know, he grinned, but it does make it easier, right? And I need contact to replenish your chakra supply. I'm still okay, she said softly as he gently sent his energy into her, and I have some food pills, too. Well, maybe I just wanted to hold your hand. But if you don't want me to. She tightened her grip on him, as he expected, and he squeezed her fingers in turn. She smiled sheepishly, and he smirked back. Despite the advanced state of their relationship, she could still be quite shy when they were outside of a locked room. Ready, he prompted her. Yes. Sway Jin Biakugan. She did not bother to stagger her activation, but went directly to her second-level Kekiai Jin Kai Dojitsu. Kari named Jutsu, Hinata linked herself to Naruto, and he closed his eyes, relying solely on her sight. Okay, he mumbled, lifting his right hand, slightly off balance due to his external perspective. A cloud of chakra formed over each of his upturned fingertips, quickly congealing into five turbulent orbs. Hinata frowned in thought, immediately noticing something about Uzumaki's complete version of the technique. What is that thread? she asked pointing with her free hand to a thin circle of chakra, connecting the five spheres. Naruto pursed his lips and leaned forward, even though it did not change his vantage at all. Don't know, Naruto shrugged carefully, so not to disrupt his jutsu or their contact, I didn't know I was doing that. It looks like you are both supporting the shape of the individual spheres and helping to keep their internal speed steady, she noted, already trying to figure out how she could achieve the same effect. Now, your turn, Naruto whispered, shifting his focus in Hinata's all-around gaze to his fiancé's right hand. Yes, my turn, she said hesitantly. Just do the first three, he recommended, that should be enough for now, and we want to get a good look at them, right? Yes, she repeated. She sent energy down her hand, and crafted each of the three orbs in turn. Naruto's face scrunched as he considered her efforts. You are putting a lot of chakra into those, he offered. But it has to have the same power as a normal raisin gan, right, she countered. Yeah, but that just means you have to keep the speed and force of the threads the same, he explained, if you don't make the threads shorter, and use fewer of them, it becomes impossible to get them from getting tied up in knots. When I do it each of the little spheres is only like about 15% of the chakra of a full-sized raisin gan. Her thoughtful look deepened as she considered his words. But if you could get the full amount of chakra into such a small ball. She muttered. I can't imagine the level of control that would take, he pondered out loud, and I'm not sure what that accomplish anyway. After all, the resonating thing is what makes the five points raisin gan work, isn't it? Yes, you're right, she agreed, but with a hint of something else in her voice. She dismissed all of her jutsu, but continued holding his hand. Thank you, Naruto, she said earnestly, I think this will help me a lot. Any time, Hinata, he answered happily, taking her other hand too. Dinner, he asked. Yes, she bobbed her head. It sounds like the test runs have been successful, the woman wearing the face of Tsunade stated in the Hokage's voice. She cut a small slice off her pork chop and took it into her mouth seductively. Yes, Negato said, not looking up from his plate. The Rinnegan user's face was looking less drawn and pale, but he had double helpings of both the entree and the salad. Across from him, Conan cut into her food vengefully. Kahaku, stop teasing Negato, please, Guki requested, despite his amusement, I need him and Conan to focus right now. Fine, the Jinchuriki of the Six Tails chameleon sighed in disappointment and changed into her normal guise. 
I just can't believe he used to have a crush on his teacher's teammate, she simpered. Do you think Jiraiya knew? Enough, the renegade Namikaze said more firmly. She pouted slightly as she settled back, but waved her hand for her husband to continue. Nagato? Yes, Payne's base took a breath to focus himself, in general, the Shizokas have proven a match for the shinobi of the hidden villages. They have taken more losses than we have, but that could be attributed to numbers and surprise. Which brings us to you, Conan, their leader shifted his gaze, how is Madara faring? He is exhausted, the origami user reported, not bothering to mask her pleasure at the immortal's discomfort, so much that I was forced to give him a few days off. Will we have the resources to proceed with the first phase? We are ready, Gukisama, she answered, before sipping her tea. Good, he smiled pleasantly, then as planned, we will begin the initiative on March 14th, White Day. Preview, background scene familiar grass ninjas, Ayamiko, Jinji, and others, running through a forest, Sanade, surprised, the land of grass is falling apart, and they asked for our help? Shizun, thoughtfully, that is correct milady. Background scene of the grass ninjas surrounded by Shizokas, Tsunade, sighs unhappily, then we better send out someone to help. Naruto, excited, I'm ready to go, Grandma Tsunade. Tsunade, smugly, sorry, knucklehead. I've got someone else in mind. Background scene of the team Enko, Naruto, angry, what? Another chapter without me? Naruto, announcer voice, next time on Naruto, a Growing Affection, Chapter 118, Scattered Grasses. Naruto, sternly, in the name of the moon, I'll punish you. Tsunade, annoyed, you idiot. That's the wrong genre and the wrong gender. Seven individuals moved through the forest as quickly as they could, while still maintaining a high level of stealth. Unfortunately, two of the adults were not particularly skilled, and the most talented and experienced of group carefully carried the sole child, hindering her movements as well. The shortest adult of the troop kept his left hand against his ear, as they slipped around the trees, trying to avoid the undergrowth as much as possible. The remaining two members of the troop did their best to wipe out the scents and tracks of their comrades. Damn, Jinji cursed softly, resisting the impulse to rip off the hidden grass shield and bandana that covered his bald pate. His arm dropped back to his side as he stopped listening to the earbud. I am Iko. Squad 2 is? He called out quietly to their leader, then paused, looking at the semi-conscious girl in the Jonan's arms, gone. It's just us and Squad 3 now. And 3 is still 50 clicks from the land of air. The good news is that it sounded like the rogues who took down Squad 2 are going after Squad 3. The bad news is that entering the land of rain doesn't appear to be making them pause at all. They must think we are taking his majesty to the land of air, the beauty said, though there was no relief in her voice, that means there is only two sets of ten of the traitor's mercenaries coming after us right now. Twenty on four. The young woman wore a tradition ninja uniform and a chunin vest, instead of her faux civilian clothing. Her hybrid punching daggers were sheathed openly at her belt. Her head and hands remained uncovered, and her gradient-colored hair was pulled into a loose ponytail and tucked into the back of her collar to keep it out of her way. She raised her hand to call for a brief rest. The other three shinobi arrayed themselves around their leader and their three charges, as Ayamiko stepped closer the 33-year-old man they were escorting, so they could speak in relative privacy. Uncle, what do you want to do? she asked quietly. I would know your thoughts, he answered. We are less than twenty kilometers from the border of the Land of Fire, she explained, but with your family, we have only a small chance of outrunning our pursuers, even if we were to carry you and Aunt Hanako as well. And that assumes they won't follow us into fire territory. Given that the rain country didn't slow them down, we can hardly count on that to give them pause. On the other hand, though their combat prowess has been established, we don't know how skilled these mercenaries are as trackers, so it might be better to continue in stealth. Still, the longer we take, the greater the chance they will run into us by chance. We shall split the difference, he decided, we will increase our speed, but to a comfortable jog, not to a full run. And your team will continue to do your best to conceal our trail. She nodded and quickly indicated their new orders to her subordinates. Jinji took point position again, and the refugees started moving forward more quickly. 
but before they had been jogging another fifteen minutes the four shinobi all noticed a decline in the natural sounds of the forest, too great to be caused by the careful passage of their group. Ninja Arts, Yusagi no Mimi, Ayamiko whispered, shifting her position from behind her aunt and uncle to guard their left side. Her ears began to pull in more sounds, and she frowned as she pinpointed the other disturbance. We have five humans incoming, she informed the others. Better than twenty, the other Kunoichi murmured. Stay sharp, Jinji barked lightly, five, ten, or twenty, they are still a threat, especially given the circumstances. Ayamiko suppressed an urge to smile happily. Since his encounter with Naruto Uzumaki, the tech ninja had become far more focused in his training and his missions, and much less reliant on gadgets. But even as she thought that, Jinji took out an infrared motion scanner, signed a jutsu to increase the device's range, and pointed it in the direction where his superior was focusing her own detection technique. Given their search pattern, he whispered, I don't think they have our exact position. At least, not yet. But they are getting closer. I can't tell how they are tracking us, their movements are too erratic. I think we can still evade them if we turn south. But how far south, the other male ninja asked dubiously, we could end up heading for the rain instead of the fire, and run into the enemies searching for Squad 3. I calculate if we deviate five degrees to the south, the electronics expert explained, we should be able to avoid them, without seriously impacting the time we will cross over into Hidden Leaf territory. Does that match with what you are hearing, Ayamiko? Stop, she hissed even more quietly, skidding silently to a halt. The others paused and closed ranks nervously. The gradient-haired Jonin turned in the direction Jinji had indicated, her forehead wrinkling in concentration and concern. Just as she was about to relax, she caught another hint of what had made her hesitate. More of them, to the southeast, she stated, I think they are driving us into a trap. Jinji swung his scanner around, refocusing his chakra to help the machine draw in more data. He grimaced at the results. They got ahead of us, he agreed, they have set up a loose line between us and the land of fire. If we try to break the net, and they will close in on us like a squid. What are our options, their client asked, glad for the jinjutsu that was keeping his daughter dozing. We can go after the five trying to drive us, and hope we can take them out and run before the reinforcements arrive, Ayamiko answered, or we can charge through their formation, and hope we can escape before they surround us. There is another option, the other Kunoichi said darkly, the two of us can draw them away, so you and Jinji can get the daimyo and his family to safety. Ayamiko started to protest, but the Kunoichi held up her hand. We all know how opposed you are to suicide missions, Lady Ayamiko, the slightly younger woman could not repress a proud smile, especially after the last skirmish. But this is our best chance. Maybe we won't get caught, her sacrificial partner noted, after all, we will be able to run much faster on our own. Ayamiko let her breath escape soundlessly, and looked to her uncle. The recently deposed leader of the Land of Grass shrugged helplessly. All right, the Jonin conceded sadly. Then her hazel eyes hardened and her speaking volume rose slightly as she instructed, but don't die. Your job is to lead them away from us. Avoid fighting unless you have no other choice. We can't afford to lose anyone else. Yes, ma'am, the teen Kunoichi grinned at her leader. She grabbed her male counterpart's arm said, let's do this, kid. I wish you would stop that, he groused as they started to jog to the northeast, you're only fourteen months older than me, and we're the same. They both started to argue loudly and stopped masking their footsteps as they disappeared into the brush. Don't oversell it, Jinji admonished disparagingly. He continued to swing the scanner steadily back and forth, while the remaining five refugees waited. Jinji-san, what is the range on that device? The daimyo's wife asked, trying to use her curiosity to mask her fear. Normally, five hundred meters, highness, he answered, not removing his eyes from the display, but my jutsu boosts it to five clicks, air kilometers. But I don't want to keep it going too long, it is a draining technique. She nodded and they resumed waiting in silence. After a few minutes, the bald Shunan perked up. It looks like they did it, he told his leader and clients, the brush beaters are turning towards them, and most of the mercs from the net are moving to the north. Too bad they aren't totally stupid. They left seven of the fifteen blockers behind, but they are more spread out now. 
we should be able to break through, there. He tapped the screen and then pointed the scanner in a direction slightly north from their original course. Ayamiko leaned over his shoulder and looked at the display. Then she shook her head. That's a trap, she announced, watching their movements on the scanner, they suspect we have split up and are giving us an opening. Those two are too far apart, and the warriors on the ends are angling towards that spot. It's where they want us to break through. No, our best bet is here. She indicated a spot where two of their enemies were fairly close together. There, the daimyo frowned, we'll never be able to slip through there. We won't sneak past, Ayamiko explained, Jinji and I will kill them. He looked astonished and the she quickly continued. These two are out of position, and shuffling about, like they are nervous, she continued, and they keep telegraphing the location of the trap. Those two are inexperienced, so if we hit them fast enough, we should be able to take them out before they can raise an alarm. With both of them out of the way, it will give us a large gap to escape through. Unless that's the trap, Hanako stated anxiously. No, I don't think so, Ayamiko shook her head, checking Jinji's scanner again, they don't have enough troops to properly reinforce that position if we hit them there. We cannot afford to wait too long, the grass royal agreed, darling, we should trust Ayamiko's experience. The woman nodded, and the jonin passed the young girl to her father. We'll get within the unassisted range of the scanner, and then Jinji and I will split off and clear the path. Then you can follow us. Jinji, take lead again. The chunin's bandana covered Pate bobbed, and he darted forward, just under the jogging speed of the daimyo's wife. The royal scrambled after the tech specialist unsteadily, but without hesitation. Ayamiko waited a moment, her still enhanced ears picking up the sounds of battle to their north. She hid her frown and followed. After they reached the ordained position, Jinji handed the scanner to the daimyo, and Ayamiko passed the child to her mother, before they raced off towards their respective targets. Jinji slunk forward, keeping his already slight form close to the ground. As he drew in range, he cocked the crossbow attached to his right wrist. Even though he no longer used the jutsu circuits, he still felt more comfortable with his forearms covered, and had found the projectile to be a suitable replacement. He selected a bolt tipped with a powerful paralytic and slipped into place. He sighted carefully and fired. The bolt pierced the warrior's brown uniform, right next to his breastbone, less than an inch from his heart. The wound was not immediately fatal, and the guard tried to call out a warning. But the drug had already reached his lungs, and without the breath to support it, the shout exited his lips as a dull croak. The rogue started to pitch forward, and Jinji caught his foe and lowered the corpse gently to the earth. Easy enough, he frowned, wondering briefly why this opponent had been so much weaker than the last groups he had fought. The lovely Jonin dropped silently behind her target, using a simple crafting of wind chakra to both slow and mask her descent from the foliage. Her opponent seemed to hear her despite her efforts, and started to turn, but was too late. Her blades boxed his neck, slicing into his voice box, jugular, and carotid. He struggled, trying to break free or raise the alarm, but she pressed harder, and he finally went limp, blood flowing freely over his shoulders and chest. Ayamiko started to lay the body down, when she heard a hissing noise. Her eyes widened, and she cut open the front of his dark green uniform. The rogue's chest was covered in paper bombs, activated by his death. In one move, the grass kunoichi sheathed her still-stained weapons and started signing. Ninja art, headhunter jutsu, she incanted, before turning to run at full speed back to where she had left her uncle's family. The technique sucked the dead warrior into the ground, until only his head was showing. Jinji, she triggered her radio raising her voice slightly in her urgency, these guys are wired with explosive tags. Anything more she might have been planning to say was cut off by a booming thump behind her. Ayamiko could only guess how loud the uninhibited detonation would have been even as dirt and splinters rained down around her. But her attempt to mask the final revenge of the mercenary had been for naught, as shrill whistles sounded only a few hundred meters to both her north and south. When she reached her charges, the shinobi found her young cousin was awake, her distance and the noise having overcome the jinjutsu. The girl was squirming, while the daimyo and his wife kept her gently pressed to the ground, obviously at least as frightened as their daughter. Ninja art, gentle rest jutsu, 
Ayamiko put the girl back to sleep without preamble, and her uncle looked mildly relieved at her reappearance. What happened, he asked quietly. He was wired to explode when killed, she explained, taking the child back into her arms, and I didn't have the time to disarm the bombs. What about Jinji? Hanako asked fearfully. My solid fog jutsu negated the fire chakra in the bombs, the Chunin announced as he loped up to them, thanks for the warning, senpai. For all the good that does, the male royal said dubiously. Maybe it does, Ayamiko pulled them towards Jinji's return path. As they broke into a sprint, she continued. Jinji managed to stop his target from self-destructing. If they do not find his body or notice his absence, they won't be looking for us at his position. If we time it right, we can. I found them, a shout rang out from far to close, and the sounds of feet heedlessly trampling the brush reached them. Aunt Hanako, climb on, the Jonin instructed, kneeling down part way, Jinji, carry my un, his majesty. With no time for propriety, the two nobles clambered on to the ninja's backs, and the warriors took off. But weighted down by their charges, neither shinobi could reach full speed. And even without a jutsu, they could hear the hunters gaining on them. We aren't going to escape, the technically-minded Chunin stated. I am open to suggestions, Ayamiko panted slightly as she said it, burdened by two human bundles to her subordinates one. There are only five of them, Jinji opened, so we find an advantageous location and take them out. Before we get too tired. Then, we might be able to get away before any more of them show up. Ayamiko took a moment to consider it and then nodded. Over there, she inclined her head towards a break in the woods, bordered by a pair of especially large oaks. The two shinobi altered course slightly and entered the clearing. The ancient trees had wrapped around one another, leaving a hollow between them at ground level. The jonin headed over to Natural Alcove and deposited her niece. You three stay here, she said softly, as her aunt and uncle climbed down. The royals settled in, covering their daughter with their own bodies. Ayamiko extracted her chameleon tarp and used it to conceal them, spreading some leaves and dirt over the camouflaged blanket. Then she took up position next to Jinji in the middle of the clearing. The tech ninja was holding a kunai in his left hand and rubbing his left forearm with his empty hand. The young woman drew her composite daggers again and noticed the blood of her last enemy still clinging to them. She flicked them, getting off the worst of the eye core and promising herself she would give the blades a proper cleaning later. If there is a later, she frowned as the though rose in her mind, unbidden. Don't worry, Miko-chan, Jinji grinned, ceasing his massage of his wrist, we got this. I don't recall giving you permission to refer to me like that, she snapped. Give a her a title, and suddenly she's all about propriety, he groused, but then smiled apologetically. Still she did not relax, and he sobered. How long have you known this was coming? The rebellion, he asked quickly, noticing the unmasked footsteps of their pursuers growing closer. Since the land of birds, she answered, tensing, I didn't believe our leader when he gave us those medals. Since then, I felt like he was keeping an eye on me. And when I received my title, I knew my uncle was seeing it, too. If she had anything more to say, it was cut off when five figures burst into the clearing. All were covered head to toe by stealth Shizoku, identical except for the colors. Even their eyes were covered by tinted lenses. Of five Shizokas, two wore green, and one each wore tan, blue, and red. They quickly slowed to a stop and started looking around. Where are the other two? The red renegade asked, seemingly unaware of the youngest royal. The grass ninjas did not answer. You were seen carrying two other people on your backs, he insisted. Where is the daimyo, Lady Ayamiko? My uncle is on his way to the land of air, the beauty insisted evenly. I doubt that, the blue-garbed rogue scoffed. Give him to us, and you may go g the red warrior said, after glancing at his talkative comrade. Even though they could not see his face, the ninjas could tell he was annoyed. Even if we could, we wouldn't, Jinji shot back, we have honor. As expect, the red Shizoku nodded in agreement, kill them, continue the search. While he said that, he signed for the weapon summoning Jutsu, and an iron and bronze gladius materialized in his hand as he jumped at Ayamiko. One of the green warriors joined him, and the other three charged the bald ninja. Jinji raised his left arm, wrist out, 
his knuckles whitening as he tightened his grip on his kunai until it hurt. Spark Javelin's Jutsu The second mark down on the inside row of scars on Jinji's forearm glowed brightly, and for an instant a pattern of tiny lines blazed under the burn. Five spears of lightning shot out, killing the tan and green Shizokas instantly, but the navy-clad warrior managed to avoid the attack while drawing his own gladius. The grass tech ninja stopped grinding his teeth as the pain passed and caught the short sword on his spade-shaped dagger. Ayamiko's two opponents swung matched swords at her, and she blocked one blade with each of her weapons. The jonin quickly appraised her opponents. They both showed about the same level of speed, and green-garbed mercenary was stronger, while the red-masked leader was more skilled. He twisted his gladius, trying to force both of her weapons out of the way so that his teammate could get an open shot at her left side. Ayamiko dropped down into a full splits, withdrawing her weapons. The clashing gladiuses sailed free, and while the red warrior was able to control his blade, the green attacker's greater strength and lesser skill kept his short sword moving, to the point where he nearly hit his teammate. Ayamiko rolled back, and as she did, swung her heels upwards, clipping the emerald Shizoku's calf lightly, but missing the scarlet one completely. As she regained her stance, she clapped her hands together, managing a septet of quick finger seals around the hilt of her blades. Katun, Molten Blades Jetsu, she exhaled, and the edges of her two-part daggers turned red, then yellow, and finally blazing white with heat. Jinji transferred his kunai to his right hand, holding the blue Shizoku at bay. He pointed his left arm at his opponent again, and the mercenary scrambled back. The grass Chunin grinned and tossed his kunai after the retreating hunter. While the navy warrior shifted his stance again to avoid the dagger, the tech specialist signed his real attack. Dotan, mud slick jutsu, he intoned, and the grass around his opponent turned into a pit of viscous muck. As the bandit's foot hit the altered earth, it went in wrong direction. Although he was able to keep his knee and hip from twisting, avoiding injury caused him to stumble. The grass loyalist pointed his scars at the renegade again and announced, Stone Spears Jutsu. The fifth inside brand on his arm flared, and he grimaced again, but the ground erupted with rocky spikes, impaling the prone Shizoku repeatedly. These guys are weaker than the last group, Jinji frowned dubiously. Then the first two corpses exploded, and in the aftermath, the navy masked soldier was instead a smoldering, broken log. Substitution, the computer expert tensed, waiting for the counterattack. Ayamiko's right-hand dagger sliced through the green warrior's gladius, leaving the edges softened and dripping. But the red fighter enacted a quick earth jutsu, hardening his blade against the heat. The green Shizoku tilted his head to stare at his damaged weapon, giving Ayamiko the chance to bury her heel in his throat while she trapped the scarlet renegade's sword with her blades. The less skilled fighter crumbled, unconscious but still breathing, if harshly. The remaining attacker seemed to grimace under his hood and struggled to free his gladius. Ayamiko prepared to launch another kick at her foe, but he released his weapon, twisting out of her reach and signing instead. Swaytun, water whip jutsu, he growled, striking at her with a liquid lash. She sliced through it with her daggers, but the water jutsu neutralized the heat, though the aqueous technique was destroyed as well. The crimson Shizoku hooked the crosspiece of his short sword with his left foot and lifted it back to his hand. He caught it just in time to block her next stab and after deflecting Ayamiko's first attack, he parried her off hand slash as well. The anonymous warrior hissed as Ayamiko spun arms into another set of parallel attacks, realizing he was overmatched in skill and also at a numerical disadvantage. And on top of that, she was at least as strong as he was and slightly quicker. He knew one-on-one, -on -one, it was only a matter of time. Only his loyalty to his master kept him from running, and that same devotion made him bring his free hand to his chest, preparing to activate his paper bombs. But the grass jonin must have realized his kamikaze intentions, she jumped up, knee extended, and knocked his hand higher. He tried to cut her stomach as she descended, but she twisted his gladius away and buried her other dagger in his left shoulder. He twitched as his uniform was tinted a darker color from within. He tried to stab her as she extracted her blade, but she blocked him again and slashed downwards across his chest. Why stop me just to kill me, he grunted in confusion. Time, she answered, and then shouted, Jinji, water release. 
still casting about carefully for the escaped blue Shizoku, Jinji sent Chi into his arm, lighting up another of his scars. Suetun, solid fog jutsu, he incanted with a grimace, and a dense mist filled the clearing. The water chakra negated the paper bombs of the dying red warrior, and allowed the two grass shinobi to spot the form of the concealed murk. Both started to close on him, when a sudden burst of wind swept the fog away into the forest. As the jutsu vanished, Ayamiko suddenly tensed. There were eleven more shizokas bounding the edge of the clearing, most in blue, but with two reds and one gray. The gray shizoku was female, judging by the silhouette of her uniform, and she took a step closer. I suppose expecting you to win again that s rank jonin and her enhanced pet was too much, the renegade stated in a high, clear voice, but at least you managed to hold them until we arrived, sergeant. The only active member of the first group slumped in relief and as he started back towards his allies, said, Thanks, Captain. Kill them, find the daimyo, she ordered, ignoring the talkative renegade. Jinji, rapid fire. Ayamiko ordered with a hint of desperation. The chunin raised his arm, and four of the scars started to light up. But the gray Shizoku reacted faster. Ninja art, jutsu ceiling. Three strips of paper shot out and wrapped around Jinji's forearm. The tech ninja howled lightly in pain as his chakra was arrested and the glow under the tags vanished. Did my words not lead you to the conclusion we had been briefed on your irregularity, the lead rogue asked, sounding mildly insulted, normally jutsu ceiling need to be used on an area that contains the entire ninja, but those scars are the whole jutsu, so I just need to cover them to negate them. Jinji glanced at his superior, and noticed she was holding herself weakly. He recognized it as a sign of exhaustion, his friend and ally was fast and strong, but only possessed average endurance. And she had been carrying her young cousin most of the day. Now, the grey-clad woman barked, and her troops surged forward. Ninja art, shadow seal web, a mildly annoyed voice carried over them. The shadows of the mid-afternoon sun broke around them, forming an inky seal beneath each of the mercenaries. The hexagonal traps met at the edges, supporting one another, and the twelve shizokas were frozen in place. The grass warriors turned to look behind them and saw six figures in the large oaks, though one of them was being carried. Hit M, Chaj, Anko Mitarashi ordered, and a large Takujo jumped out the tree, already forming his tenth hand sign. Ninja art, human avalanche jutsu, he grunted deeply. As he finished the technique, three things happened in unison. Eight copies of the teen appeared, all of them started to expand, and their hair grew longer, harder, and sharper. Once each Akimichi copy was over ten feet tall, they began to balloon around the waist and tucked in their limbs and heads. They began to spin rapidly, their lengthened, weaponized locks completely covering them. Nine enlarged, spiky human boulders crashed into the enemy, killing all but the gray Shizoku instantly. The attack also disrupted Shikamaru's technique, allowing the enemy leader to attempt a retreat. Ninja art, mind annihilation jutsu, Ino Yamanaka snapped. The gray Shizoku unwittingly met the younger woman's eyes, and even through her tinted lenses, the mental attack connected. She let out a pitiable whimper and collapsed to the grass. Suetun, dowsing rain jutsu, Anko announced, and a sudden, swift downpour covered them all, ending the dull hissing under the dead Shizoka's uniforms. Choji stopped spinning, and his clones vanished. Lady Ayamiko, the other grass kunoichi leapt out of the trees, still carrying her unconscious partner. You two are okay, the tired jonin sighed happily. Yes, thanks to these leaf ninjas, she answered, as the rest of Team Enko joined them on the ground, they saved us. It's a good thing you guys made enough noise for us to track you down, the leaf jonin sounded more sarcastic than thankful, adding, where's the daimyo? Ayamiko shook her head, not to sound ungrateful, but why are you here? You asked Daimyo Haruna if she could send the Flower Clan to back you up, Enko did not seem upset by the suspicion she couldn't, so instead she asked the Hokage to send someone to make sure you and her cousin, the Grass Daimyo, made it to the Land of Fire. I'm sure you would have been more comfortable if it had been Sakura Haruno who showed up, but she's busy, and the Hokage figured it was more likely the insurgents would try to impersonate her, so you get us, instead. Anything else? The Grass Jonin exhaled in release. You can come out, uncle, the gradient-haired beauty announced, and the tarp shifted, revealing the now wet and shivering royals. 
your highness, Anko bowed slightly, and kept her voice as respectful as she could, we are here to escort you to the Hidden Leaf Village. Thank you for coming, Lady Ayamiko, the Hokage greeted the younger woman cordially, I know you are anxious to get your daimyo to the capital so he can meet with our daimyo, but I was hoping you could tell me more about what has transpired in the land of grass. The Sanin observed the grass jonin intently. Ayamiko had traded her shizoku and vest for her normal blouse and skirt, and her multi-hued hair was loose instead of her standard braid. Tsunade clinically recognized the beauty of her guest's slim, straight nose, slightly plump cheeks, and full lips, while also reading the worry and sadness in the other Kunoichi's wide hazel eyes. The Kanahagakur's file on the grass daimyo's shinobi niece painted the picture of a talented young woman, whose skill was only eclipsed by her kindness and loyalty to her family. Her kill count was far below the norm for a jonin, especially given her extensive list of completed missions. Sakura Haruno had confirmed that, describing how well Ayamiko had fought, despite the deep wound she had received defending Daimyo Haruna. Of course, Lady Tsunade, the blue and purple-haired Kunoichi bowed deeply, it is the least I can do, in return for the Hidden Leaf's gracious intercession on behalf of my team and my family. The leaf leader waved her hand towards the chairs on the far side of her desk, and the grass Kunoichi sat gracefully. Lady Ayamiko. Tsunade started again, but the other woman held up her hand to interrupt. Please, there is no need to be so formal, Ayamiko stated, her tone and phrasing at odds with her words, my title was mainly for show, and arguably no longer applies. Besides, I am merely a jonin, while you are the one of the five kages. Fine, the elder woman grinned sarcastically, as long as you cut that crap, too. Ayamiko inclined her head regally, before smiling slightly, and relaxing into the chair. So, Ayamiko-san, what's happening in the land of grass? Tsunade asked neutrally. What do you know, the gradient-haired hair noble asked. Let's pretend I know nothing, the Hokage countered, I want to get your point of view, uncolored by what you think I know. All right, Ayamiko nodded, conceding the point. Well, on the surface, it appears to be a simple civil war. My uncle, the daimyo, is the youngest of three siblings. My mother is his elder sister, and they both have an older brother. My older uncle never wanted to rule, he is content being an artist, and my mother was afraid our country would not accept a female daimyo, so she stepped aside for her younger brother. Tsunade nodded, remembering Sakura and Naruto's reports about Toki and Haruna's complaints and suspicions. The problem is, or rather appears to be, that my elder uncle's first son is not content to be a mere noble, he wants to be daimyo. He supposedly used the daimyo's failure to annex the land of greens to cast doubt on his fitness to rule. A nine days ago, shinobi working for my cousin tried to assassinate the daimyo. They failed, but in the process our country was divided and war erupted. You keep using qualifiers, the Hokage interrupted, appears to be, supposedly. What do you think is really going on? My cousin is a puppet, the younger Jonin answered confidently, he is not smart enough to have arranged this on his own. You may have heard the story, about how four years ago he attended the Chunin exams here, and ordered his bodyguards to intimidate or stall Gara of the Sand. He hoped to cause Gara to lose his fight with Sasuke Uchiha. Instead, he got both of his bodyguards killed. No, I believe the leader of the Kuzagakure is the one who wants to seize control of our country. At first, the village hidden in the grass was divided into three camps, those who support my uncle, those who support my cousin, and the majority who felt we should let the nobles fight their own battles without taking sides. The shinobi and samurai on both sides were more or less equal in number and skill. But then those Shizoka started attacking us, and our leader started to convince our comrades who had not taken sides to support the usurper. He said that with the help of the mercenaries, my uncle's defeat was inevitable. Not surprisingly my former comrades decided that they would rather fight for the stronger side than risk any sort of fallout for their neutrality. Ayamiko sighed in disappointment, and the Hokage silently agreed with the sentiment. After that, things grew continually worse, the grass Kunoichi concluded, although we have never seen more than 100 Shizokas at one time, no matter how many we killed, they were always replaced. And as we lost troops and territory, more of the holdouts defected to the renegade side. Five days ago, it became obvious we could no longer win without outside help. So I contacted Har. 
Daimyo Haruna, and asked for the assistance of her ninja clan. We waited three days, but when we did not receive any sort of response, I assumed my message had been intercepted. When the rebels began to close in on the daimyo's palace, we were able to convince my uncle to flee, if only for the sake of his wife and daughter. We sent out five teams of eight shinobi, each escorting two or three loyal nobles. My uncle sent them to counties who were not our enemies, both for safety and to try to gain assistance. But the traitors were able to track us down, though they made the Shizokas do the dirty work. I lost half of my team in an early attack. Only Team 3 made it through unscathed. The other were all wiped out. What about your parents? Sonate asked, both out of concern for her guest and because she needed to learn the fate of the grass daimyo sister for political reasons. They were in the land of greens when this all started, the exhausted beauty admitted gratefully, along with my youngest sister. They will remain there, for the time being. You don't think that will put a target on the land of greens? Tsunade prompted cannily, after all, that was one of the excuses for ousting the daimyo. When we fled, Ayamiko grinned slightly, my uncle ordered most of his remaining samurai and ninjas to sneak into the land of greens and place themselves at the command of my mother and daimyo Haruna. That's not even 20% of our original forces, but added to that the flower ninja clan and daimyo Haruna's strategic alliance with the land of birds and her close relationship with both the leaf and stone villages. My former leader would have to be a total fool to attack the land of greens. At least before he has some time to regroup and re-equip. Speaking of, Tsunade began carefully, why didn't your uncle request help? Especially when it became obvious that the rebels were hiring troops for outside the land of grass? Pride, fear, old grudges and rivalries, the younger beauty shrugged apologetically, take your pick. Tsunade considered that. The grass country had been a battleground between the stone and leaf ninjas during the Third Great Ninja War. Despite the grass village being one of the three second-tier shinobi outposts, they could not stand against the wrath of two of the great villages at once. The Hokage could understand why the, the grass daimyo had been hesitant to put himself in another similar situation. So, the Hokage switched topic smoothly, offering the refugee a respite, I am told your teammate, Jinji has some interesting marks on him. You mean the scars Naruto gave him? Ayamiko raised an eyebrow at the veiled query. So they are the same. The healer considered that, I suppose you probably don't want to talk about that. There isn't much to talk, the grass jonin shrugged, even though they finally admitted they circuits themselves were not viable, our scientists tried to recreate what Naruto did to Jinji. But they failed again. They couldn't decide if it was something about the specific jutsu he used, or because of the demon Naruto used to carry. Tsunade nodded. The medic considered the possibility that the neurological nature of the Ranshincho was responsible for the scars still acting as jutsu circuits. But it doesn't matter much, Ayamiko continued, each scar is a single technique that Jinji can use, so they lack the flexibility of the original Kote design. And they cause him a great deal of pain to activate. It's a testimony to his pain threshold that he can use them as much as he does. What do you intend to do now? The Sanin asked, after taking a moment to digest the information. Your daimyo has offered us sanctuary, so I will accompany my uncle to your capital, Ayamiko started out strongly, but then trailed off into uncertainty, from there, I don't know what we will do. We have heard some other rumors of odd goings-on, which might limit the assistance we can hire. And unless we can do something about the Shizokas, I don't know if we have the power to take back our country. Well, if there is anything the Hidden Leaf can do to help you, don't hesitate to contact us, the Hokage said kindly. Then she smirked, and added, I'll give you 10% off our normal fees. So that's what saving one of your shinobi and two daimyos allied with your country is worth, the noble Kunoichi asked with only a hint of sarcasm. No, that's worth 20%, Tsunade snarked back, but since I did just save you, three of your teammates and three grass country nobles, free of charge, I figured we were even on that count. Thank you, Ayamiko said sincerely, for everything you have done. And I will keep your offer in mind. Tsunade stood up and extended her hand, and Ayamiko followed suit. The two women exchanged a firm handshake, and the younger shinobi turned and left. Shizun, the Hokage called for her assistant, and the other medic entered the office. Yes, milady. 
please send for the clan leaders and Mike Guy, she instructed, I need to speak with them immediately. The events unfolding making me think we may need a large-scale mobilization soon. I want to explain the situation to them, so I can get their feedback and so they can prepare. Right away, Shizun frowned, wondering why her mentor had asked for Guy in addition to the heads of the Shinobi families. But she had the impression it was not the time to ask, so she hurried back to her desk, calling for messengers as she jotted down a note for each leader, containing the Fire Shadow's wishes. Each missive was written specifically based on its recipient, most receiving a polite request, while Mike Guy and Shikaku Nara were given strict orders as to when they were to arrive. After checking the missives a second time, she handed them to ninjas on messenger duty along with their delivery instructions. When the Hokage and Shizun entered the conference room 30 minutes later, the leaders of the nine active shinobi clans of the Kanahaka Corps were all waiting. In addition, Hinata Hyuga was seated next to her father, and in the corner of the room furthest from the door stood Mike Guy. The bull-haired jonin looked somewhat uncomfortable, and a few of the clan leaders looked at him suspiciously. Where are Kakashi and Naruto? Tsunade whispered harshly to her apprentice. They declined, Shizun murmured back, Naruto says he's not officially a clan leader yet, and he doesn't even have a clan to lead. And Kakashi's response pointed out that he reject the position of acting head of the Uchiha clan, and that he was already going to be late getting to his class. Fine, the last Senju growled under her breath. Then she faced the assembled clan leader sternly, masking her annoyance under a facade of professionalism. I have been called to a meeting of the Conclave of Shadows, she announced, burying a spike of worry at the summons. After she had given her instructions to Shizun, the wall in her office had lit up, showing a request by the rakage for a special meeting of the five leaders. However, unlike the immediate session she had asked for upon Naruto's abduction, the lightning shadow had offered the others one hour to prepare. Tsunade could not help but wonder what Goryatsuki was up to. So we will need to keep this brief, she concluded as she sat down. She glared at Guy briefly, who finally followed suit. I'm sure all of you are aware to some degree of the renegade group calling themselves by the uninspired name Shizokus, she began, glancing around for their reactions. None of the clan leaders betrayed any surprise or confusion, and she continued. Up until now, they have been acting merely as bandits. And there was some suspicions that they were only testing the strength of the various hidden villages. Now those rumors have been proven. Recently the Shizokus have stepped up their activities, and are showing greater numbers than we previously experienced. This caused a small shuffling around the table, but as Tsunade expected, neither Inoichi Yamanaka nor Shikaku Nara seemed surprised by her statement. Two weeks ago, the nephew of the daimyo of the Land of Grass and the leader of the Hidden Grass Village launched a coup d'etat, which in only two days escalated into a full civil war. Eight days ago, the rebels hired the Shizokus, gaining themselves 100 mercenaries as reinforcements. Three days ago, the rebels broke the loyalists' lines. The daimyo and the nobles on his side evacuated, splitting into five groups. One group fled to each of the nations around the grass country. Only two made it through. Finally, the daimyo sent his remaining soldiers and ninjas to the land of greens. She paused to catch her breath and to observe them again. This time, she saw she had also rattled Anoichi. She wondered if the Mind Reader clan's information network had been compromised. She cleared her throat and waited for the clan heads to settle down again. Unfortunately, that's not all, she indicated Guy, earlier this week, the hidden waterfall village was attacked by Kisame Hashigaki and Bunjiro Iguru, leading an estimated force of 200 of the Shizokas. At Shibuki's request, I sent Mike Guy's team to help evacuate the waterfall's children. Rock Lee and Niji Hyuga are both still recovering from the injuries they received during the mission. As of our last intelligence, the waterfall will not survive tomorrow if they are still fighting now. We are preparing troops to assist them, despite that fool's insistence we take no action beyond the rescue mission. If they are working with Kisame, does that mean these Shizokas are connected to the Akatsuki? Chosa Akimichi pondered aloud. That's possible, but unlikely, Shikaku disagreed with his former teammate. Kisame severed ties with the Akatsuki, Hinata pointed out. The patriarchs and matriarchs turned to look at her, and she flinched. True, Tsunade agreed, and the Akatsuki essentially disbanded. 
but we know that Payne, Conan, and Madara are still working together, and as Payne's plan to harness the Nine Bijou is no longer possible, that Shark would have nothing to fear from working with them. It's possible the two broken swords merely hired the Shizokas to carve out their own little kingdom, Inoichi mused, that would explain why they chose a water-aligned nation to conquer. I was hoping to have more time to discuss this with all of you, the Hokage nodded, the mentalist having discerned one of her own trains of thought, but I suddenly do not have that choice. Instead, I have two requests of you. First, please call on your informants again. Find out everything you can about the current states of the grass and waterfall countries. Also, since they are now moving more openly and in greater numbers, see if you can learn anything more about these Shizokas. Second, I want you to decide if you will support me if I decide to send troops to the waterfall village even though Shibuki said no. The men and women in the room frowned thoughtfully. Tsunade wished she could stay to influence their initial debate, but she did not have time. I'll leave you to it, she stood quickly and many of the clan heads followed suit, Shizun will stay, so she can relay any messages to me as soon as I return. She stepped hastily out of the room, breaking into a jog as soon as the door closed. Does anyone really plan to say we should not help the waterfall country? Saburo Takamichi asked dubiously and formally, they have not always been our allies in the past, but since Shibuki took over the Takigekyur, things have been far more cordial. And more importantly, I do not think we can allow the mist traders and these Shizokas to control one of our neighboring lands. Could be two countries in their pockets, Shikaku added, depending on how deep in the grass the mercenaries' hooks are. So, what do you think we should do, Hinata-san, the Yamanaka leader asked openly. The others mostly turned to look at their young guest, though a few shot the blonde jonin confused or annoyed looks. Oh. Um. The young woman quailed under the attention, well, the Yamanakas and the Naras have the best spy networks, so I guess we should see what they can found out. Is that all? Sum Inazuka didn't hide her disappointment. Hinata closed her eyes and took a deep breath. When she exhaled, her eyes reappeared with new resolve. No, Hinata shook her head, if we intend to follow the Hokage's plan, we will need more direct information. We should pick the four members with the best stealth skills in each of the Inazuka and Aburing clans, and send them as two-man teams into the waterfall country. They should not go to far in, but can use their dogs and insects to get a better view of what is happening closer to the Takigekyur. Her father nodded, as did Inoichi, but Hinata was not finished, and her cadence increased as she grew more confident of her suggestions. And we should send teams to reinforce the border. Fugas to scan, and Akimikis for their combat power, probably with a third teammate, probably an equal split between members of the Takamichi and Kuroikan families. They should be obvious, to discourage incursions. But then we should also send a few extra Huga and Inazuka scouts in secret, to keep them honest. Then she trailed off, blushing furiously as she recognized they were all staring at her intently, and that she had all but given orders to the majority of the heads of the Hidden Leaf Shinobi clans. Anyone have any objections? Shikaku Nara asked sardonically, and there was a round of head shaking in the room. Good, that makes it less of a hassle, the lazy leader noted, we can start getting things ready, for when the Hokage gives us the go-ahead. Guy, what else did you learn in the waterfall village? Shibi Aburim queried softly. Well? Guy started grandly. You did well, Hinata, Hayashi Hyuga leaned over to whisper to his daughter. She could not help but notice his movements were still stiff and carefully controlled. I am proud of you, the injured leader added, and the pale beauty's smile spread slightly. Lady Hokage. Tsunade had nearly reached her office when an ANBU member darted out to meet her. What is it, she snapped, I'm in a hurry. I bring an urgent message from the daimyo, the young shinobi said apologetically, and only then did she recognize the voice and mask of one of the ninjas set to guard the land of fire's ruler. Now, she frowned angrily, and snatched the letter. Then she forced her face into neutrality, and nodded to the animal-masked warrior. Thank you, she said, dismissing him. He bowed slightly and vanished. The Sanin raced the rest of the way into her office and sealed it behind her. She read the short letter from Hisoka Hanakata, her brow creasing with surprise and increased worry. She tucked the letter into her shirt and went through the process of extracting the black candle from her desk. 
she enacted the ritual and steeled herself before entering the meeting room of the Conclave of Shadows. Sorry I'm late, Tsunade announced, her voice carefully emotionless. Gara of the Sand, Yasuo Mizuno, and Mitsuru Jishin all turned to look at her, even as the latecomer noticed that Goryatsuki had not arrived yet. The Hokage closed her door and settled regally into her chair, frowning. Goro called this meeting and has the gall to keep us waiting, the leaf shinobi growled slightly, her grip on her feeling slipping. Do any of you know what this is about? she asked her comrades. The Mizukij and Suchikij shook their heads, but Gara's brow creased in thought. I suspect the Rakage wants to discuss the recent actions of these renegades, the former Jinchuriki suggested. You may be correct, the stone Kunoichi rumbled, but it does not gain us much to speculate. Goro is far from predictable. If that's not why he called this meeting, I would still suggest. Yasuo's statement was cut off when the door leading to the Rakage office finally opened. Before he could even step foot into the meeting hall, Tsunade lit into him. It's about damn time, Goro, she barked at the silhouette in the portal, echoing her earlier protest, you called us here, and then have the nerve to make us wait? My apologies for the delay, Tsunade-sensei, an unexpected voice attempted to pacify the Hokage. Its owner stepped into the underground room. He was tall and well-muscled, though only his shoulders could have been called bulky. His auburn hair was cropped short, and his sharp blue eyes regarded the four shadows with amused confidence. Like his brother and nephew, his nose was slightly stubbed, but it did not detract from the overall appeal of his face. He wore a matte black stealth shizoku, with a layer of blackened steel chainmail covering his vitals and also his wrist. His head was uncovered, but otherwise he wore the full regalia, including gloves and tabi. And, like the room's other inhabitants, he was unarmed. But Goro Yatsuki will not be joining us today, Goki Namikes informed them, as he is no longer the rakage. Nor, for that matter, is he alive. You, Tsunade snarled, leaping from her seat and preparing to charge her former student. The Mizukage also stood, though it was not clear whether he intended to try to stop the Hokage or simply to get out of her way. You would attack the rakage in the Conclave of Shadow's Chambers? Guki asked quickly, and the medic froze, a look of horror filling her hazel eyes. You claim to be the lightning shadow, that such a kid's powerful voice echoed more than it should have in the small room. I did light the candle, Guki pointed out blandly, as he closed the door behind him, and I am sure you are all well aware of the Hidden Cloud Village's rules of succession. Each of the five villages had unique laws as to who could claim the title of Kage and how to go about it. Both the Mist and Cloud Villages allowed the title to be taken in single combat, though the Mizukage had been slowly working on changing that rule. But as the other four leaders considered that, Gara was the first to notice the apparent flaw in Guki's assertion. The Hidden Cloud does allow any ninja to become Rakage if he or she defeats the current Rakage in a duel, the red-haired youth reminded, but a foreign shinobi also requires a Cloud Jonin in good standing to sponsor his or her challenge. Who was your advocate, Guki? Tsunade demanded, already suspecting the answer. Yuji Toni, he said simply, then he smiled as if remembering something sad, you see, she survived the extraction process, so the Akatsuki kept her prisoner, to study how she managed to live. A few months ago, I happened to rescue her. She told me her story, about how the rakage was afraid of her power and popularity, so he all but sold her to the Akatsuki. I was outraged, and after I had nursed her back to health, she took me to the Cloud Village, and sponsored me as Goro's replacement. What a wonderful lie, the Hokage snarked, except that we know Yuji Toni died, and was brought back as part of pain. Even if such a thing were possible, Guki countered dubiously, it is awfully convenient that you kept it secret until now. It is much more likely you concocted that story to discredit me. We have proof, Tsunade countered. Proof? Guki sounded amused, what proof do you have that couldn't be faked with a simple transformation and a few lies? Is what you said about the previous rakage true? Mitsuru interrupted softly, was Goro working with the Akatsuki? He was, Guki sobered, his voice carrying the weight of truth, though Tsunade was not thoroughly convinced, he really did think Yujito would attempt to replace him, so he allowed Haydn and Kakuzu into the Kumoga cure, took no action to defend Yujito, and launched only a perfunctory search for her after she was captured. He had a deal with Pain and Madara to assist them, 
in return for promises of safety and even additional power once all of the bijou had been captured. Is that why you called us here, Missing Neen? the Mizukage asked darkly, to announce your new position, and flaunt that there is nothing we can do about it? Informing the Conclave of Shadows that there is new rakage is only the first reason I asked you here, Guki graciously ignored the insult, I also wish to discuss certain events unfolding in the ninja world right now. You mean the conflicts in the grass and waterfall countries, Gara deduced. Namikaze inclined his head in agreement. At the request of the leaders of those countries, my personal troops have stepped in to help restore the peace, Guki said, his voice twinged with regret. Restore the peace? Yasuo snapped uncharacteristically, if the broken swords and those Shizokas really are working for you, you invaded the hidden waterfall village. Not at all, the rakage said, unperturbed, the daimyo of the waterfall country came to us with proof that his shinobi village was plotting to assassinate him and take power. It is at his request that Kisame and Bunjiro took a portion of my troops to neutralize the threat. Feel free to contact the waterfall daimyo. Of course, by now even if he has never seen you before, he would be convinced that you are good friends and that you saved him, Gara could not keep a hint of anger from his normally impassive voice. It seems you are all determined to think the absolute worst of me, Namike sounded hurt, despite my good intentions. What about all the thefts by your Shizokas over the past six months, the Hokage shot back, almost every hidden village has lost shinobi to those bandits you just admitted were your followers. It is impossible to demand total loyalty, Guki shook his head, something I'm sure you can all understand. A few thieves joined my cause under false pretenses and then fell back into their old habits. It is unfortunate, but hardly preventable. Enough. Yasuo shouted, slamming his fist on the smooth stone table, I will not allow you to make a mockery, not of us and not of the people we serve. I put this proposal to the Conclave of Shadows, that we call for an immediate removal of all foreign shinobi from the grass and waterfall countries, and demand the hidden cloud village replace Guki Namikaze with a rakage who is not a missing neen. I'm not in the bingo book, the renegade turned Kage stated softly, bemused by the Mizukage's uncharacteristic outburst, I've checked. I was surprised, and to be honest, a little disappointed when I saw that. Tsunade knew Yasuo was opposed to senseless bloodshed, or at least his interpretation of the phrase, so she was surprised by his vehemence. Then she deduced the source of his anger. Kisame and Banjiro had both left the hidden mist because they disagreed with Yasuo's politics. She could tell the Mizukage felt some responsibility for the invasion of the Takigekir. But even more, the way in which the two surviving broken swords were openly displaying their power could renew dissension in the Kirigakur. Yasuo had to act quickly and decisively to prevent further defections or even worse, an insurrection. Seconded, and approved, Gara said firmly, and the Mizukage nodded. I vote in favor, too, Mizuno asserted for the record. I, naturally, vote against this proposal, the rakage noted blandly. The three men started to glance back and forth between the two kunoichi. Neither woman spoke, and Tsunade looked at Mitsuru hopefully, while the Tsuchikage frowned and squinted in seemingly unpleasant contemplation. Removing Guki's followers would only serve to destabilize the region, the leader of the Hidden Stone Village finally said, her gravelly voice sounding as if she were eating something particularly sour, and Guki was appointed rakage legally. In the absence of proof that his people are acting illegally, I must vote against this proposal. All four sets of eyes turned to Tsunade. Yasuo, Gara, and Mitsuru looked at her hopefully, while Guki smiled impassively. Tsunade wanted nothing more than to resume her original impulse and slug her traitorous student. Instead, she closed her eyes so she would not have to look at them, and dug her nails into her palm, drawing blood to punish herself for what she was about to do. I. She took a deep breath and forced the word out. Abstain. What? Yasuo stammered, looking like Tsunade had hit him instead. Two for, two against, and one abstention, Guki stated, the motion fails. Now if you will all excuse me? Without waiting for an answer, the rakage left. Tsunade opened her eyes, and Mitsuru gave her a knowing nod. Then the Tsuchikage exited as well. The Hokage attempted to escape, but her allies cut her off. What was that, Tsunade? Yasuo demanded, livid, you let him go. I had no choice, the medic said guiltily. Why not? 
Gara said more evenly, reading her displeasure. Orders, she growled, yanking the letter back out of her shirt. She tossed it to Gara, but recited the simple note from memory, even as he read it. Do not take or support any actions against the Land of Lightning, the Hidden Cloud Village, or the Rakage. Signed Hisoka Hanakoda, she barked. The Daimo of the Land of Fire ordered you not to oppose Guki? Yasuo's last remnants of anger were washed away in a wave of confusion and doubt. And based on the look she gave me, Mitsuru was given similar instructions, the Sanin's fire cooled under the weight of her new assertion. The Kazakagi nodded his understanding and agreement with her conclusion. Could the letter be a fake? the Mizukage asked hopefully. I know the daimyo's signature, I checked the stamp, and I recognized the shinobi who delivered it, Tsunade shook her head in denial, I'm as sure as I can be that it's real, without talking to Hisoka-sama in person. Yasuo took off his glasses, and started rubbing the marks it left on his nose. The other two leaders recognized it as an act of frustration. Do you think Hanakata-sama was tricked? Or did Guki coerce him in some way? Gara pondered thoughtfully I don't know, Tsunade's temper flared again, but I sure as hell intend to find out. How did it go? Kahaku wrapped herself around her husband's arm, pressing her currently modest bust tightly to his left bicep. Guki smiled wearily at the Jinchuriki of the Six-Tails Chameleon and then nodded at Nagato and Conan. The new rakage wondered briefly where Madara Uchiha was, but decided he did not care. He walked over to the plush couch in Goro's former office so he could sit with his mate. Arguably, better than it should have, Namikaze admitted, I was not physically attacked, though it was close once or twice. In addition, it appears the leaf and stone will not be interfering with us for the time being. And without a clear majority there can be no unilateral action against us. He sighed happily and shifted his gaze to the air of the Rinnegan. Negato, do you have enough Shizokas for your pet project, without totally depleting our forces here? Yes, Guki-sensei, the thin young man answered eagerly. Then, I would like you to wait one more week while we cement our hold on the grass and waterfall countries. After that, the Amage cure is yours. Thank you, Lord Rakage, the true pain bowed deeply, an almost idyllic grin touching his lips. Conan smiled too, her lover's joy temporarily banishing her worries. Conan, how is the integration of the Cloud Ninjas coming? Gookie turned his attention to his female apprentice. Not so well as you had hoped, she told him honestly, even more shinobi have defected to the rebels, and some of those who have not run are trying to avoid taking the oath. Send out more of the Grey Shizokas, he ordered with a slight frown, we will need the additional troops before we can attack the Sound, Snow, and Mines villages. Your Majesty, the Hokage bowed deeply as she entered the throne room. Tsunade, the daimyo kept his voice diplomatically neutral, but there was a strain around his eyes, I have been expecting you, although, to be honest, I had thought you would seek an audience with me far sooner. I believe you wished to discuss my instructions regarding the Land of Lightning and its shinobi. I regret delivering such an important directive in such a short note. You must be confused, and possibly put out? Not at all, Tsunade deflected, I am sure there is some manner of political purpose behind your orders that we leave the Cloud Ninjas alone. I know you must always keep the best interests of our nation in mind. A hint of red touched Hisoka's ears, and his eyes narrowed slightly but he smiled and nodded, before indicating that his retainers should bring the shinobi leader a chair. In that case, to what do I owe the honor of this visit, he asked, seemingly openly. Tsunade tapped her foot impatiently. She had broken through the floor under her desk before with her impatient habit, and though she could not stop herself, she found that focusing on keeping her massive strength in check was almost as distracting as the repetitive action itself. Besides, she was in no mood for another lecture from Shizun on the cost of replacing furniture and flooring. Though depending on what the kunoichi she was waiting for had to say, the Hokage expected she might end up beyond caring about a few oak planks. The leader of the Kanahaga Corps had returned from her meeting with the Conclave of Shadows in a measured rage. She had marched back to the room where the clan leaders were still meeting, and informed them that they would be taking no further action regarding the land of grass or land of waterfalls. She had ignored their barrage of questions and dismissed everyone except Inoichi Yamanaka, Shikaku Nara, and Hayashi Huga. After swearing them to secrecy, she had informed them about the new rakage and the fire daimyo's orders. 
after regaining control of the room, she ordered the three clan leaders to begin investigating the daimyo, and the capital in general. She asked them to try to find a link between Hisoka Hanakata and Goki Namakaze, and to determine if either group of the new rakage servants had infiltrated the Land of Fire. Leaving them, Tsunade met with the second in command of the ANBU, and dispatched the four most invisible members of the Black Ops to check on another matter. The three clan leaders met with her again two days later, but they did not have anything concrete. The leader of the Land of Fire had not been replaced, nor were there any Shizokas or hidden cloud ninjas in the capital. And there was nothing unusual in the daimyo's finances. But there were other rumors, whispers that alone meant little, but combined to give Sinade a sneaking suspicion. Thus she had dispatched the jonin for whom she now waited anxiously. The Hokage had been phoned as soon as the agent re-entered the leaf village, and she ordered her assistant to send the kunoichi straight into the Sanin's office, as soon as the younger woman arrived. Tenten entered the Hokage's office only minutes after she passed through the Kanoha's main gate. The weapons expert still wore civilian clothing, not having bothered to change before beginning her return to the Hidden Leaf Village. And, the Hokage demanded without greeting, as soon as the younger woman closed the door. Tenten took a shallow breath, both her muscles and chakra exhausted from her run. It's as you suspected, Tenten confirmed, Nyoko has not been to school in eight days. The official story is that she has a mild yet lingering cold, and that it is highly infectious. Supposedly she is in her suite, recovering, and only select maids and guards are allowed in to see her. Except that she isn't, all of her rooms are empty. And I watched her maid bring in a bowl of soup, sit down in the entryway, eat it, and then take the empty bowl back. So she is gone, and the daimyo is trying very hard to conceal the fact, Tsunade muttered angrily. She turned her chair around, and glared out her window in the direction of the capital of the Land of Fire. Lady Tsunade, there's something more going on here, isn't there? Tenten asked, and the Hokage turned her wrathful look on the other jonin. Tenten paused nervously, and then forced herself to continue, I mean, there has to be some reason the daimyo doesn't have us scouring the continent, looking for the princess, right? I don't know, the Sanin admitted, her voice more mellow than her expression, but I definitely need to have a talk with Hisoka-sama. I have heard through the rumor mill that Nyoko Haim has taken ill, and that her recovery has been remarkably slow. So I thought I would offer my services, I'm sure I can find a medical jutsu to get the princess back on her feet. The daimyo winced, and Tsunade found herself wishing she could talk him into playing poker. She kept her face neutral, while he sighed to cover his mistake. That is very kind of you, Hisoka said expansively, but it is only a mild cold. I'm sure my daughter just needs some more rest. I'm not so sure about that, your majesty, the Hokage countered as diplomatically as she could, for the illness to linger for this long, and remain so dangerously communicative. I'm not sure what your civilian doctors have told you, but to me this sounds like the incubation period of a more dangerous disease. And even if it is just a tenacious cold, if it gets out, it could become a minor epidemic. Don't you think it is better for me to find out what it will take to cure this now, either to nip it in the bud, or to be prepared for when it does start to spread? Hisoka Hanakata closed his eyes and took a deep breath. He knew it was dangerous to look the last of the Sanin in the eye while trying to come up with a lie. But he could tell she was suspicious, and could not think of anything that would convince the Kanikunawichi. When he looked at her again, he saw she was regarding him sadly. Shall we dispense with these games, your majesty? Tsunade asked mildly. He regarded her carefully for a moment, and then nodded. Clear and seal the court, he instructed loudly, I will speak with the Hokage in private. But your majesty, his lead bodyguard, protested, we cannot leave you alone. Tsunade-san, the daimyo did not bother to argue with his samurai, if I asked you, how long would it take you to incapacitate my guards and toss them outside? Assuming you didn't want them seriously injured, she prompted, and the Land of Fire's ruler waved his hand in agreement. She looked around at the twenty thickly muscled, well-armed, and heavily armored men. Then she shot the ranking warrior a smug grin. Thirty seconds, she answered, forty, tops. A few of the men blanched, and the daimyo sighed angrily. If I have to give another order on this matter, the royal informed his protector sternly, it will not be to any of you. The lead soldier nodded tersely, and moments later the Hokage and the daimyo were alone. 
the reinforced doors slammed shut. Tsunade's expression softened, and the leader of the fire country dropped his mask, transforming from powerful ruler to frightened father before her eyes. What is going on, Hisoka-sama, the Sanin switched to a slightly more familiar form address, her voice showing her concern, where is your daughter? I don't know, he shook his head, I don't know where he took her. Koki Namikaze, she prompted, and he nodded. How do you know it was him? Tsunade asked carefully. He sent me her school bag, and a video of her in a room somewhere, the daimyo answered hoarsely. All right, let's start from the beginning, the Sanin's tone became more analytical, when did Nyokoheim go missing? Eleven days ago, the Friday before last, the royal explained, on her way home from school, someone disabled Nyoko's shadows and took her. We did not notice right away, because she had arranged to doing some shopping first. But before she was supposed to return home, we received a special delivery. As I said, Nyoko's bag and a video. The video showed her, unharmed, and then shifted to Guki. He told me my daughter was insurance against the Land of Fire's interference with his new position as the Rakage. He swore a blood oath to me that Nyoko would be treated well and not harmed or molested in any way so long as my soldiers and ninjas remained neutral. And he promised if he ever planned any hostile actions against us that he would return Nyoko at least three months before the attack. When her guards returned, he frowned, I scolded them for losing sight of her and told them she had taken ill. I'm not sure they believed me, but it would have meant contradicting me and admitting their mistake to you, so they said nothing. Blood oaths can be faked, Tsunade informed him, especially on video like that. But unless Guki has changed more than it seemed from our recent meeting, we can probably trust his word. Hisako nodded, soothed by her words. His reaction grated on the medic, and she was not able to fully rein in her infamous temper. And none of that explains why you didn't tell me, she barked. So you could put her at risk, the daimyo shot back, he was already able to take her out of my city, without anyone noticing. And I did order an investigation, but there were no clues, no witnesses, no indications that the crown princess had been taken in broad daylight, with four ANBU members secretly guarding her. Her guards were disabled without serious injury, and without ever seeing their attacker. If I had gone to you, he would have known. And if you try to rescue her, who knows what he will do to her? Cookie won't do anything, she shook her head, he'll leave it to one of his flunkies. And I think you have underestimated the leaf ninjas and overestimated my former student. But I guess we will find out. What are you saying, he demanded, an edge of hysteria in his voice. We are going to find and rescue Nyoko Haim, of course, the Kunoichi said firmly. No, he said darkly. You would rather leave her in the hands of her kidnapper? Tsunade questioned incredulously, a traitor to your own country, and the enemy of the whole world? That is something of an exaggeration, the daimyo objected dubious. With all due respect your majesty, bullshit, Tsunade snorted, Guki has his own private army, if a small one. He took control of the hidden cloud village, and has conquered two countries bordering the land of fire. The reason he made that promise, and told you to restrict me from interfering, is because he intends to go after more nations, probably including some of our allies. And it is only a matter of time before he comes after us. All the more reason to let him keep Nyoko, he asserted uncertainly, he promised to return her long before he attacks the land of fire. We can use that to know when we need to prepare for his attack. You would have us break our word, deny aid to our allies, and wait until he has us surrounded and alone? Tsunade prompted incredulously. I. The daimyo broke under the strain of her words. She knew him to be a highly moral man, whose personal beliefs sometimes clashed with the demands of ruling. She's my daughter, my only child, Hisako croaked, I can't see any other way to keep both her and my country safe. Tsunade stood slowly, torn between her desire to reassure the daimyo and to storm out in anger. She settled for bowing stiffly. Then I will take my leave, your majesty. Without waiting for him to acknowledge her, she turned and strode evenly towards the large double doors. Tsunade, his voice caught up with her before she could escape. I order you not to search for Nyoko, he instructed her with all the strength he could muster, when she turned back to look at him, you or any other ninja. She stared at him for a moment, and then nodded slightly. Promise me, he demanded desperately. 
her eyes flashed in rage, and she tore open the left side of her blouse, revealing most of her left breast. She sliced her fingertip open with her nails, and then smeared the kanji for honor over her heart, messy in her angry haste. I swear I will not dispatch any leaf shinobi either by order or by request, myself included, to find or rescue Princess Nyoko Hanakata, on pain of death. The blood vanished into her skin, and she pulled her shirt closed. Satisfied, she prompted darkly. He dipped his head in regretful acceptance. In that case, I have other duties to see to. This time Tsunade did not mask her annoyance as she stomped out, slamming open the heavy doors like they were made of bamboo instead of silver and steel-laden oak. But once she was past the guards, a smirk played across her lips, and the Hokage was already plotting as she exited the palace and met up with her assistant. You wanted to see me, Lady Tsunade? Tamari said formally, as the Sanin darted past her into the office. The Kanoha's resident San Jonan had been surprised by the official request that she be waiting to meet with the Hokage, the moment the leader of the Hidden Leaf returned to the village. Tamari had heard from her brother of the events in the Conclave of Shadows Gathering, and was certain the summons was related. Inside, Tsunade ordered, adding, we need absolute privacy. Though exhausted from her run, the medic pulled her guest quickly inside, rather than simply sitting and letting Tamari enter on her own. The leaf medic activated the chakra seals and other devices that shielded the room. The original Fuenjutsu had created in tandem by the first five kages, as an extension of the guards and wards in the meeting chamber. In addition, each individual Hokage had added their own protections, most recently Tsunade's installation of bleeding-edge signal jammers and white noise generators. Inside her office, the last Sanin was reasonably assured that even the gods could not hear or see what was being discussed. Unless they were in the crawl space over the fall ceiling a young Naruto had liked to frequent. I assume Gara told you about what happened at the conclave meeting six days ago, Tsunade started directly. That Guki Namikaze, an ex-class renegade from the Hidden Leaf is now the rakage, and your daimyo ordered you not to take any action against him? Tamari noted grimly. That's the gist of it, the Hokage agreed as she lowered herself into her chair, moaning softly, I'm getting too old for all day, cross-country marathons. Tamari waited anxiously for the grumpy leaf leader to get settled in. I just returned from the capital, Tsunade explained, and the daimyo and I had an, well, let's just say interesting discussion about the reason for his orders. The Sanin's brown eyes locked on the younger blonde's blue-green orbs, and the flippancy left her voice. Guki has kidnapped Nyoko Hanakata, and is using her to force the land of fire's neutrality in current events. Given the events around his daughter's abduction, as well as promises Guki offered, his majesty is complying with the traitor's demands. Tamari digested that for a moment, and when Tsunade did not speak, the sand kunoichi offered a thought of her own. The land of Earth Daimyo has a young son. Do you think that Namikaze could have taken him as well, and that is why that Suchikage voted with the rakage? The elder woman pursed her lips in thought, and then nodded appreciatively. I hadn't considered that, but you could very well be right. So why did you ask me here, Lady Tsunade? Tamari pressed anxiously. The daimyo ordered me not to send any leaf ninjas to search for the princess, and in a fit of rage, I made a blood oath to that effect, the sand nin looked mildly embarrassed as she admitted that, and the sand ninja could not suppress a slight grin. Well, I have ways around that, Starting with investigating the leader of the Kuzagakure, Tsunade shrugged away her error and continued, the grass is still technically independent from the cloud, and I started the investigation before I made that oath. Besides, what kind of arrogant ass actually changes his name to leader? But that's not enough, is it, the sharp young woman intuited, and her host nodded. No. That's why I asked you here. Hisoka-sama probably didn't think of this, or thought I was too proud or too stubborn to ask for help. But to make it clear, I'm not asking for help, Tsunade insisted gruffly, I want to hire the Hidden Sand Village to find Nyoko Hanakata. But just to find her, if your people try to rescue her, and fail, it could lead to an international incident. Discover where she is first, and then we can decide what to do. Tamari nodded, I will speak to Gara immediately. I will contact him as well, once I hammer out the specifics of the mission request, the Sanin agreed, but I was hoping you could get the ball rolling before that. Of course, Tamari was pleased that her ally trusted her that much, is there anything else I can do? 
Yes, Tsunade frowned melodramatically, whatever you do, do not tell anyone else about this. Especially not your boyfriend, who would be sure to go right to Ino or Naruto. I don't want anyone else finding out about this. Tsunade's overemphasis made her true intentions blatantly obvious. I'll do my best, Tamari said, sounding hypercritically dubious of herself, but Shikamaru is smart and can be pretty observant. I'm not sure I'll be able to keep it from him. Just do your best, the Hokage smirked at their mutual, overacted, understanding. Then she sobered, her smile turning more sincere. Thank you, Tamari. Having you here, living in our village, has been a real blessing. I know my brother feels the same about Korinai, the younger Jonan said dismissively, but she could not hide a slight coloring of her cheeks, I'll call him as soon as you let me out of here. Tsunade dropped the barriers around the room, and Tamari did not bother to offer a parting before she darted out the door, already drawing her phone. Tsunade prepared to make some calls of her own. Now, to find out more about this leader. She muttered distractedly. The couple pushed their cart through the crowded streets of the hidden grass village, wearing matched expressions of nervousness. The husband was slightly overweight with crew-cut, thinning brown hair, and large eyes whose orange irises looked too small for the rest of his orbs. His wife was about an inch taller, rail thin, with her pale lavender hair pulled into a ponytail, bound at three points down its length. Her face was severely pinched, giving the impression her cheeks might have shattered if she smiled too widely. They were not unfamiliar with the Kusagakure, but had never seen so many people in its streets, especially not ninjas wearing full stealth gear. Hey, Dango Seller, what do you think you're doing? A shrill voice challenged them, and the vendor turned to look at whoever had stopped them, his anxious expression struggling not to break into a full panic. But when he saw the one-eyed face of the grass Jonan Kao, he breathed a sigh of relief. You're a week late, she growled affectionately, if I had to go much longer without your treats, I was going to hurt someone. Or at least send my squad out to look for you. My apologies, Mistress Kao, the merchant bowed his head, with everything that has been happening, it was harder to acquire ingredients, as well as to get here unmolested. Yeah, I guess, she agreed, her voice hinting at annoyance. Then her eye narrowed as she studied him, you worried about something? It's just. He lowered his voice conspiratorially, there are so many people here. And these mercenaries have a, shall we say, less than positive, reputation. I have never felt unsafe in the hidden grass village before, but they keep staring at us, and I can't see their faces, so I don't know if they are hungry, or they are planning to rob and kill us. I don't think you have to worry about that, she said, but the Kunoichi could not quite make her voice as reassuring as she intended, but just in case, you should keep to Market Street, and make sure you're in back at the inn before dark. Thank you, mistress, the salesman nodded. Now then, on to business, the jonin licked her lips in anticipation. The usual then? He brightened, and his wife began preparing the spherical pastries. No, I don't think two trays is going to be enough, Kao countered hungrily, better make it three. The seller nodded, and his partner served up the small plates in rapid succession, each bearing three skewers of three dango in assorted flavors, some savory but most sweet. The kunoichi had already finished the first set before the second was done, but she savored the second tray, and still had one skewer left by the time she was past her third helping. Delicious as always, the grass shinobi complimented the silent chef, and then paid the woman's husband for her snack. I'll be looking for you again tomorrow, Kao warned them, how long will you be in town this time? Probably a week, the merchant answered, and his wife frowned at him and indicated the cart with a tilt of her head, so he added, maybe less if everyone buys as much as you do. Maybe I'd better scare your other customers away, Kao stated possessively, and the couple both shared looks of dismay, so she laughed at them, noting, I'm kidding. Well, mostly. See you later. She vanished into the crowd, and the merchant surreptitiously removed the note tucked into the bills. He handed it to his wife with a frown. Are you sure about this, he asked, mixing whispers and hidden leaf sign language, we have just sacrificed this cover, and if Kao is not really an agent of the loyalists, we will be walking into a trap. Lady Ayamiko trusts her, and the Hokage trusted Ayamiko in this matter, the female ANBU agent answered in kind, and frankly, I was getting sick of making dango. She memorized the codes and seals on the note, and then subtly slid it into the cart's burner. 
the fake food sellers continued their route through the Kuzagakure, servicing customers and observing the distribution of the Shizokas and the grass ninjas. After the sun had vanished behind the treeline, but before the blush of twilight had faded, the merchant couple checked in to the only boarding house in the Kusagaku and locked themselves securely in their rooms. They allowed their disguised jutsus to lapse, revealing a pair slightly younger, much more physically fit, and moderately more attractive than their aliases. She touched her husband's face gently, and then they got to work, abandoning the civilian garb and dressing in the high-quality stealth suits that were hidden in their luggage. Finally they retrieved their masks from the last, most thoroughly concealed pockets in their bags. She slipped the reinforced, stylized, porcelain hawk's face over her own, while her mate hid his visage behind that of a wolf. Garbed for their mission, the leaf ninjas quickly double-checked their equipment. Each carried no weapon, but for a single stealth kunai. Like the ninja blades, most of their gear was made from wood or ceramics, but reinforced with chakra as much as possible without potentially attracting the attention of the various key sensing kekiai jinkai. And unlike the multi-purpose daggers, the rest of their tools were strictly for infiltration. Each carried standard equipment, 50 meters of high-test cable, a grappling hook, a few small mirrors, a plastic misting bottle filled with distilled water, a few wooden shims, a small hammer, assorted screwdrivers, and similar accoutrements. But Hawk also carried a dozen blank chakra tags with extra ink and pens, while her wolf had a more elaborate set of lock picks and a USB flash drive in a special case designed to shield it from metal detectors and other magnetic fields. As certain as they could be of their preparations, the two shinobi slipped silently out the window. The last glimmers of natural light were gone and had been replaced by the glaring aura of the street lamps. The growth of the hidden grass village was such that while most of the lights were electric, some of the gas torches had yet to be replaced. Also with the nightfall, all sense of welcome had vanished the Kusagakure. Any upstanding citizens and ninjas had retreated to their homes, leaving the street in the hands of the mercenaries and the village's seedier residents. As the Kanoha agents darted from shadow to shadow, they could not help but reflect that the excuse they had offered eavesdroppers was indeed true, the city felt darker, more dangerous, than it had in any of their previous bi-yearly visits. Their eyes met, even through the shaded glass of their masks. Hawk and Wolf had been together long enough, both personally and professionally, that each generally knew the other's thoughts without the need to speak. Sensing their shared reminiscence, and the worry that accompanied it, both spies nodded in unison, as if to banish the other's musings. Their focus returned to the task at hand, they increased their speed, heading for the command center for the hidden grass ninjas, which also served as the home of the man who called himself leader. The building was mostly dark when they arrived. As the primary operations post for the grass ninjas, there were naturally parts of the manor that were always active. But their intelligence stated that, just over one year ago, Leader had started retiring early in the evening. Using information gleaned from selling Dango near the base, as well as the data KO had slipped them, they were able to enter the structure undetected. Avoiding the motion sensors and cameras was child's play for the two Takujo, and thanks to their informant, Hawk was able to fool the few Injutsu designed to detect authentic grass headbands on any person who crossed its threshold. Inside, they moved in hurried silence to the office of the trader. But as they reached the hallway that led to their goal, they slowed greatly. The office and bedchamber of their target were both part of the same suite, and according to their sources, he had inordinately sharp hearing, such that it bordered on being a bloodline trait. Wolf picked the lock on the door, wordlessly cursing each inaudible tap of ceramic on metal. However the barrier opened without alarm, and the couple slipped inside. The first room was the office, and was unsurprisingly empty. Both shinobi darted over to the desk, and Wolf disconnected the computer speakers, while Hawk placed a jutsu tag on it to neutralize the noise of the drives and fans. Then the male ANBU agent booted up the system, while his wife moved to the cabinet. Officially they were there to find out what, if anything, Leader had planned once he cemented his control over the land of grass. But neither ninja was new to the game, and they had both had heard rumors, so they knew their other, unspoken, objective was to try to find the location of the missing fire princess. Wolf was mildly surprised by how long it took him to hack the Kusa leader's password, and by the time he started cloning the hard disk to his portable drive, Hawk had already finished rifling through the paper files, taking pictures of everything she thought was relevant. 
she noticed a small closet, not truly hidden but subtly blended into the wall. The Kunoichi's instincts told her that there was something important stored in the seemingly unimportant recess, and after doing all she could to verify there were no traps or alarms, she slid her fingers under the latch and opened it. Wolf nearly fell out of his chair in shock when his wife gasped audibly and jumped violently backwards. He scrambled up, drawing his kunai as she did the same. Hawk paused, tilting her head in confusion even as he rounded the desk. As he did, he saw what had startled her enough to break stealth. Leader was standing in the closet, facing them, his eyes wide open. But after a second, he came to the same realizations as his partner. Their target was surrounded by a bizarre and unfamiliar machine, and more importantly, he was not reacting to their presence. And as he looked at the shinobi's glassy-eyed stare, he recognized something else. His eyes, he whispered, keeping his voice quiet just in case. I know, she raised her camera and snapped a shot. The device used standard film, but was powered by a ninjutsu and her chakra, so did not require a flash regardless of the lighting, a functionality for which she was now especially thankful. Check the other room, see if he is in there, she requested. He padded hastily over to the bedroom and slid open the door. After a few moments he placed his hands together and focused his chakra, murmuring, release. Jinjutsu, triggered by the door, he noted softly, and as he returned to her side. Other than the open eyes and upright posture, all indications are that he is asleep, she informed him, but I'm not sure what this device is. She studied the contraption for a moment longer and then carefully resealed the closet. Hawk inclined her head to the side, towards the entrance, and Wolf nodded. We should head back, Hawk signed as they returned to the rooftops of the city proper. I agree, Wolf's fingers indicated, that was more than enough for tonight. I meant back to the Leaf Village, she shook her her head as her digits explained, this information is too important to wait two weeks. But we haven't found what we were sent here for, he countered. And we might not, she argued, but this is real, actionable intel. Also given our other orders, it changes the mission parameters. But our cover, he frowned under his mask, if the dango sellers leave in the middle of the night, after just one day. If Keo or Ayamiko have not already revealed our role as leaf spies, she reminded him of his earlier complaint, we can simply claim that the mercenaries' harassment was too much for us to take and we fled. All right, he agreed, somewhat thankful that he was unable to refute her. You are sure about this? Tsunade asked flatly. We both saw it, Hawk shrugged, I verified that he was alive and not a Jinjutsu. But no, we did not attempt to wake him and ask are you one of the Paths of Pain, if that is what you are suggesting. The Hokage smirked at the ANBU Kunoichi. But the smile quickly faded as she looked back down at the photograph of the, the Hidden Grass Village's leader, staring outwards blindly with the Rinnegan. Well, that definitely answers some questions, the Sanin muttered. Then she continued more firmly, good job, you too. I'll have the rest of the pictures and data you brought back analyzed. You can take the rest of the week off, but I'll probably have a new assignment for you after that. Thank you, Lady Hokage, the couple stated in unison, and then bowed before exiting. Tsunade picked up the picture showing leader with Payne's unique, multi-ringed, blue eyes instead of his original green orbs. She started to wonder how long the former Akatsuki frontman had been in charge of the grass village. Lost in thought, she was not sure how much time had passed when Shizun knocked loudly on her door for the third time. What is it? Tsunade sighed as she asked the question. Milady, Tamari is here to see you, Shizun said, a hint of excitement in the younger medic's voice. The Hokage sat up straight in her seat and turned to face the door. Well, what are you waiting for? Her tone indicated both annoyance and expectation, sent her in immediately. Shizun nodded, and a heartbeat later, the San Jonin walked into the room. As she sat, the Hokage sealed the room, though she was in too much of a hurry to activate all of the protections. The Sanin practically dove back into her chair and stared at the younger blonde intently. I wasn't expecting to be seeing you again so soon, Tsunade began without offering a kind of greeting. Gara already had teams in the field, investigating Guki's actions, Tamari offered, when I informed him of your request, he shifted their purpose. And, the healer prompted. 
and we found information on three different places where a teenage girl with orange hair and a preteen boy with brown and gray hair are being held by the Shizokas, the Kazakage sister answered, one group is in a hidden grass safe house near both the stone and waterfall countries. One is in the former Akatsuki base in the land of forests. And the last group is in the land of lightning, in a farming town that is also a cloud ninja training camp. Decoys. Tsunade pondered that, but which group is the real hostages? The first one, Tamari stated, but her voice was less than adamant, or so we believe. The girl at the grass safe house was described by the Shizoku we interrogated as having gray eyes. The other two have blue eyes. Also, the mercenary said that the first group is being controlled by one of Gookie's elite agents, though he was able to partially break free and commit suicide before we could find out who. The other two bases don't have that sort of leader, at least from what we can tell. It would be convenient to keep the captives close to their home countries, if he really does intend to release them before he attacks, the Hokage frowned in thought, but it is also more risky. But if pain really is close at hand, that would minimize the risk. In fact, with the whole grass village at his disposal, it would be safer than the land of forests, and almost as safe as the land of lightning, while also being more unexpected. The blue-eyed woman pursed her lips and narrowed her eyes, not sure what her ally and client was talking about. Tsunade recognized Tamari's confusion. We also have some new intel on the hidden grass leader, the Sanin told the go-between, I'll fill you in later, once my people have vetted it. The sand kunowichi nodded. So, what do you intend to do? Tamari probed carefully. Nothing, Tsunade smirked ironically, I swore I wouldn't. And I have to make sure that none of Nyoko's friends in the village do anything, either. In fact, I intend to talk to them about that right away, to warn them against making any foolish moves. The nineteen-year-old nodded sagely, but did not move despite the implied dismissal. Tsunade paused as she reached for her phone, and raised an eyebrow in interest. Was there something else? the Hokage asked. Tamari smiled bitterly, and produced a short stack of papers. There is the matter of our fee, Shikamaru's lover managed to sound smug and embarrassed in the same sentence, as you said, you hired the sand for an official mission. You wanted it on the books for the confidentiality clause, right? So I did, Tsunade grimaced, and snatched the invoice from Tamari's hand. She blinked when she saw the total, and so quickly went through the individual line items. She discovered that the frighteningly large number was correct, even generous, given the effort the sand village had put forth. She withdrew her checkbook from her center desk drawer and opened it to the first incomplete page. She tore out the middle check, and when she filled it out, rounded up to the next full 10,000 rio, both as a bonus for her allies and to make her bookkeeping easier. She handed the monetary stand-in to Tamari, who studied it for a second, before deciding it was unlikely the Hokage would stiff them, especially after adding a gratuity. Both Kunoichi signed the bill, and each took a copy. If there is nothing else, then, the younger woman stood, sketching a slight bow, before darting out of the room. Before the door had closed, Tsunade was already dialing. Naruto looked around the room hopefully. For reasons he did not know, the Leaf Village had had a very light caseload over the last three weeks. And even though he loved spending time alone with his fiancée, both training and in other forms of exercise, the Takujo was itching for a mission. Hinata kept a tight grip on her lover's hand. She had also been looking forward to a mission when the Hokage called them, but when she arrived and saw Niji, Tintin, Ino, and Choji, she started to have an inkling about why they were summoned. And she was concerned about what her lover's reaction would be. Tsunade regarded the teens cautiously, as she activated the privacy mechanisms in her office. She steepled her fingers, considering them. Before we proceed, I'm going to have to request a blood oath from each of you, I need you to swear you won't discuss what you are about to hear with anyone outside of this room, at least until the sensitivity of the topic has passed. If you can't or won't do that, you are free to leave. Niji stood, but before he could step away from the chair, Ten Ten caught his arm. He looked down at her darkly, but she shook her head. He did not move for a moment, and then turned his attention to the Hokage. What penalty condition, he asked dangerously. Memory loss should be sufficient, the Sanin matched his seriousness. Niji met Tenten's eyes again, and finally returned to his seat. 
the six younger shinobi all swore the Fuenjutsu promised leader laid out for them. Okay, Tsunade exhaled in slight release, I'm sure by now you have all heard that Princess Nyoko is sick. And you have also probably heard rumors that she is not sick, but missing. Unfortunately, that is not just a rumor. Tenten smirked darkly, and Ino's eyes narrowed in rage. Niji turned to his fiancée with an expression of apologetic understanding. Hinata closed her eyes in sad contemplation. And Naruto leaped to his feet, his girlfriend still clutching his palm desperately. Nyoko is missing? Uzumaki demanded angrily, I told Shikamaru that wasn't possible. That there's no way we would just be sitting around if that was true. Nokoheim was kidnapped just over two weeks ago, the Hokage informed them, a hint of threat in her tone. Two weeks? Naruto shouted, what the heck, Grandma Tsunade? Why haven't you done anything? Sit down, Naruto, the Sanin ordered. She did not raise her voice, but her controlled fury reached them nevertheless, and the blonde Takujo dropped back into his seat with a stunned, almost frightened look. I have done everything I can, short of actively circumventing the daimyo's orders, she informed them. Naruto started to speak again, and she held up her hand to silence him. Nokoheim is being held hostage by the new rakage, Goki Namikaze, she started. Though all of the teens recognized the surname, only Naruto and Hinata were fully aware of what that name truly meant. He is using her to ensure that we do not interfere with his plans in the grass, the waterfall, and probably elsewhere. Guki has guaranteed her safety, so long as the land of fire remains neutral, and has sworn to return her first when he decides to attack us. The daimyo has chosen to take Guki at his word, and has ordered me not to oppose him, and not to send any leaf ninjas try to find or rescue Nyoko. But we're going to ignore that order, right? Naruto asked hopefully. No, Tsunade shook her head, but despite her denial, a smug expression crept onto her lips and into her eyes, even if I were inclined to do such a thing, I swore a blood oath that I would not. Hinata gasped in surprise, and Niji's eyes widened. In that case, why are we here? Choji asked perceptively. I asked the sand ninjas to find your friend, Tsunade answered, and they came through. But now the question is what to do about it. I can't order anyone to rescue her, and even asking them would be breaking my vow. But we can volunteer, right? Ino deduced, after all, we are just having a conversation here, so if we ask to go. Sorry, no can do, Tsunade cut Yamanaka off, but her tone and expression did not match her words, even if you ask to go rescue her of your own free will, there is no way I can authorize an official mission. So, I guess it's a good thing none of you have a history of disobeying orders or going AWOL. She pushed a manila folder across her desk subtly and turned away. As she heard the rustling of the pages, the Hokage had one other thing to say. I'll remind you again, she reaffirmed sadly, this won't be like when you went to rescue Naruto, or to duel Orochimaru. If you decide to do something foolish, there will be no reinforcements. And if you were to get caught, I will have to declare you missing means. She listened, proudly, as they all got up to leave without protest or denial. Before the last couple could exit, she called out to them. Niji, how is your recovery? The medic prompted before the Huga Jonin could leave, you were nearly killed by those two Shizokas. I am fine now, he said, grateful for her concern, though the healers want me to rest for a few more days. Good, she nodded, still looking out the window, when you are ready for duty, there might be a mission I want you to lead. If you understand me. I understand, Lady Tsunane, he said sardonically, but in that case, I really should get back to resting. Tenten -ten closed the door, and Tsunade felt a fluttering of pain in her chest. What, she asked herself, I didn't break my word. No orders, not even a request. And nothing official. But the ache did not fade, and the Hokage realized it was not the blood oath, fear and anxiety gripped her heart. If they do try this, she forced herself to qualify the statement for her oath, and fail. Why the heck are we wasting our time like this? Naruto demanded quietly, glancing around at the other passengers on the bus. We are establishing our cover story, Niji explained again, using simpler terms, there is a strong likelihood that our absence from the village will be noticed. So rather than attempting to hide our exit, we are just six friends using the Hot Springs Resort tickets Eno won for some long overdue rest and relaxation. 
I won for her, Naruto pointed out. Niji nodded tersely to concede the point. One of the stores Yamanaka frequented had been having a raffle, with the grand prize being a weekend for four couples at a romantic spa. But the hotel was in the land of earth, which meant either passing through the land of grass or taking a substantial detour. And with the recent turmoil in the land of fire's northwestern neighbors, the raffle had proven less popular than the shop had hoped. Ino had dragged Naruto to the boutique and had spent enough money to get three spins. Though she had taken the first turn herself and won only a consolation prize, she gave her last two spins to her notoriously lucky friend. And as she hoped, on Naruto's first attempt, the golden ball fell into the tray. Ino had pretended to ask Tamari if she and Shikamaru wanted the last two tickets, but the San Jonin claimed she could not get away. So the six vacationing friends had boarded the bus that would take them to the resort. The driver had proven grateful to have a half-dozen shinobi aboard, even if they were off-duty. He had been worried about driving through the land of grass, even if it was a region of the country that had not been touched by the war. Naruto, Guki-san must be expecting someone to try something, Hinata tried to placate him, but a small group, on vacation, taking their time, without weapons? Even if they suspect us at first, if we follow Niji's plan, no one will believe we are up to anything after our second or third stop. Expanding on Ino's idea, Niji had extended their trip, planning for them to visit a famous amusement park after the onsen. And in the days following that, they would go to a museum, hike up a mountain to take in a popular view, try out a new water park, and finally stay one night at a second hot spring before returning home. Uzumaki had grumbled about wasting seven days pretending to have fun, just to hide their purpose. And for that matter, who put Niji in charge? Naruto groused. Lady Tsunade, the elder Hyuga cousin answered simply. But it's not an official mission, the former Jinchuriki countered. Niji and I are the only ones here with the rank of Jonin, Tenten reminded Uzumaki, and Niji has had the least social contact with Nyoko, so he can remain the most objective. Even if he wasn't the Hokage's choice, he is the right one to be in charge. Will you quit complaining, knucklehead? Ino snapped quietly, this what we need to do to sell the con, and your constant whining in front of civilians isn't going to help matters. Naruto, Hinata whispered as she squeezed his hand, we're all worried about Nyoko. But if they figure out we are coming and move her, it will cost us far more than a week's time. And if what the Hokage said is correct, they might hurt her, too. So you might as well relax and try to have some fun, if only to convince our enemies, Choji added. Naruto sighed and dropped his head in defeat. Then a moment later he looked back up with a goofy grin. In that case, bring on the onsen, he stated. Was he just waiting for someone to force him to relax? Ten Ten pondered, and Ino had similar, if less polite, musings. Naruto's face was bright red, and not just from the heat. He kept his eyes firmly locked on Hinata's orbs, as did she in kind. Hinata was crouched as tightly as she could, her nose only millimeters from the water, and one arm wrapped around her magnificent bust. She had scooted as close to Naruto as she could. He knew only propriety kept her from wearing a swimsuit or wrapping herself with a towel. On the far side of the of the spring, Niji and Tenten were similarly positioned, focused upon one another while trying to hide from everyone else. Choji sat, unperturbed on the outside wall of the natural pool, halfway between the two uncomfortable couples. Only Ino prowled the tub openly, unabashedly, trying to get a good look at her four friends and not caring what they saw of her. Come on, she complained, would you guys be acting like this if it wasn't a mixed gender bath? I know we girls have all seen each other naked before, and you guys probably have seen each other too. So it's only like two people who haven't seen you nude. And it's mixed bathing, you're insulting tradition, huddling and hiding like that. No one responded, other than to turn away when she approached, so she tried another tactic instead. The Byakugan can see through stuff, right? Yamanaka queried lecherously, like other people's clothes. You two have probably seen everyone here already anyway. So it's only fair you let everyone else get a peek, too. I would never abuse my dojitsu or my friend's trust like that, Niji said, offended. But Hinata's eyes ran down Naruto's partially concealed body, before meeting his gaze again with a grin she couldn't quite hide. Ha, I knew it, Ino barked a laugh, catching the youngest Kunoichi's action and expression. 
Hinata blushed brighter. I've only done that to Naruto, the youngest Kunoichi admitted. Was that before or after you two started dating? The female contender for Jiraiya's title needled her more conservative friend. Hinata did not answer, but tried to sink lower into the water. Ino, Choji's jutsu enlarged hand stretched across the spring and yanked her back with moderate force. She thumped gently into his chest and landed sitting beside him, leaning against him, with his arm tightly around her waist. Not everyone has the same idea of fun as you do, honey, the big man admonished his lover loudly. Then in her ear he whispered, maybe if you let them relax, they'll let you get your peak stot. Don't worry, you guys, I'll keep her over here, he told the others at normal volume, so just enjoy the water. We should have gone to the individual baths, Eno complained. So we boys could get nosebleeds and try to peek while you girls compare measurements and how soft your skin is? Akimichi elaborated, shaking his head, this isn't some cliché manga, Eno. Some clichés have their place, she shot back. Like drinking flavored milks in a hot spring? Choji suggested, offering her a bottle. Eno sighed, and settled in closer to him, while taking a draw off the chilled beverage. As Choji predicted, after a few minutes, the others unwound somewhat, and the reluctant young women drifted around to sit next to their mates, though Hinata still covered her breasts with one arm. But they still kept their eyes to themselves, while Eno ogled them from her position as her boyfriend sighed. Finally, Ten Ten stood with a sigh that was equal parts contentment and resignation. She did not bother to cover herself until she stepped out of the pool. That's enough for me, she announced, her eyes locking on Niji, I need to get out before I pass out. I'll see you back in our room? The Jonin Kunoichi's lips turned up indecently as she said that, and she slipped lightly into the dressing room. Niji tried to play it smooth, but the instant the door closed, he stood, giving Eno the view she had been seeking, but he quickly wrapped his towel around his waist. He strode across the stone floor, surrounding the pool, not quite concealing the haste in his motions. He left the outdoor bath without a word to his comrades. What do you think, Chaj? Should we head back before we become total prunes? Eno had been hoping to outlast Naruto and Hinata, but the heat was started to get to her, and Tintin's amorous exit and Niji's reaction had sent the lone Chunin's mind spinning even further down that path. The big man nodded, and he finally released his Eki girlfriend. They hurriedly left the spring, Choji concealing himself as he stood, while Ino just strutted back to the dressing room, totally nude. Hey, Choji, Naruto called out without looking, we still up for ping pong later? Sorry, but that's probably gonna have to wait till tomorrow, Akimichi answered, not sounding apologetic at all. Okay, Uzumaki conceded. When the door closed, Hinata exhaled gratefully and moved her arms away from her body so she could wrap her right limb around her fiancé and rest her other hand on his chest. Alone at last? Naruto asked and she nodded happily. So you have been peeking through my clothes, he prompted curiously. She smiled shyly and didn't answer. Since when, Hinata, he asked, poking one finger into her side, I know you're not that ticklish, but you know I know where your weak spots are. She giggled in spite of herself, and then sighed in mock defeat. The first time was during the first part of the Chunin exams, she admitted, but that was an accident. You were sitting right next to me, and I was using my Byakugan to get the answers. Then you shifted, and your hip moved out of the area I was trying not to see, and it distracted me and drew my attention. And before I knew it, I could see all of you. The second time was when we were looking for the Baiko Chu, she continued, on a roll, you saw me practicing in the waterfall, and I told myself it was only fair. So on our second night, while you were sleeping, I turned on my Byakugan and looked at you. He frowned at her in surprise and asked, was that all? No, she looked chagrined, when we started to train together, I looked a few times. I just couldn't help myself, being so close to you, and not knowing when or if you might return my feelings. And people call me a pervert. He shook his head. I'm sorry, Naruto. I shouldn't. He cut her off with a firm kiss. Did I say I minded, he countered happily. Then his mouth turned down again, and he added, so long as it's only me. It's only you, she told him, it has always been you. Eh. She panted slightly at the end of the statement. 
are you gonna be okay? he asked, noticing a difference in the flush of her cheeks, as well as the elegant beads of sweat on her brow and ears. I'm fine, she murmured, nuzzling his neck. Then she shifted her legs so instead of sitting beside him in the basin, she was nearly straddling him. Hinata, you know it's bad manners to do that in the hot spring, he admonished her weakly. Even if we don't do that, she mimicked him, it doesn't mean we can't make out a little. What if someone else comes in, he asked pointedly. She paused, and the rest of the face turned as red as her cheeks. She pulled away slightly, disappointment replacing the bashfulness in her expressive white eyes. Maybe we should continue this debate in our room, he suggested roguishly. The next instant, water splashed on his face as it flooded into the Hanada-shaped hole around him. He turned and only briefly saw her shapely behind before she disappeared into the dressing room. Grinning broadly, he hopped out of the spring and hurried after her. Naruto intertwined his fingers with Hinata's and gently dragged her arm over her head. She resisted at first, but he smiled at her reassuringly. Finally, she let him maneuver her left limb out of her comfort zone. Instead, she gripped his hand tightly, the rest of her body shaking in anticipation. Here we go, he told her, three, two, one. Yee ye ye ye. Hinata screamed as they passed the point of no return. Whoa! Naruto joined his lover as they plummeted towards the earth with ever-increasing speed. Then the track suddenly shifted direction, and it felt like their stomachs plunged into their knees as the cars raced upwards. Behind them, Ino hooped ecstatically, and after she caught her breath, the Huga heiress joined in. As they crested the first hill, they were briefly lifted off their seats, and Uzumaki shouted in joy again. That was incredible, Naruto panted, the hills and that corkscrew thing. It's called a barrel roll, Choji noted. Naruto frowned briefly in confusion, but the new term could not keep the smile from his face, okay, whatever, the blonde man agreed, but it was amazing. I never got what was so special about these things, but man. Beside him, Hinata just nodded, still catching her breath. Ino started to ask if he had really never been on a roller coaster before, but then she remembered a certain uncomfortable conversation at a beachside resort, and also that there was only one of these sorts of amusement parks in the Land of Fire. I guess it goes without saying that he never came to a place like this when he was a kid, the mentalist Kunoichi thought to herself, and since he became a ninja, he probably never really had the time or the inclination. You didn't like it, Niji? Naruto demanded of his taciturn friend. The elder Hyuga cousin was normally pale, but now his complexion looked decidedly green. I don't see the thrill in spending four minutes pretending to fall to my death over and over, the jonin stated carefully, as if trying to retain his hold on his breakfast. Then why didn't you wait out here? Ino asked dubiously. Because Ten Ten loves roller coasters, Niji responded simply, and if I had stayed behind, there would have been an odd number in our group. I'll tell you what, Choji offered, next time, you and I can both sit out, and Ino and Tintin can ride together. You didn't like it either, Choji? Uzumaki was incredulous. Oh, I like coasters well enough, the big Takujo rumbled, though not as much as you guys seem to. But some of these rides have pretty small cars, so it can be a tight fit for me. So I can keep Niji company, while you four ride. Why not just use a jutsu to shrink yourself down temporarily? Naruto suggested, and everyone else glared at him. No jutsu, Niji hissed. We are just a group of normal friends, having fun, Ten Ten reminded him. Besides, then I'd miss out on all the food, Choji smiled blissfully in anticipation, and Ino grimaced slightly. You know, there are other rides Niji likes, Ten Ten changed the subject for Yamanaka, maybe we can hit some of them next? Sure, Naruto grinned, I'm up for anything. So just what kind of other rides are? As the other started discussing various attractions of the park, Ino caught Hinata's arm. The youngest woman looked at her friend curiously, and Ino offered her a sad smile, and inclined her head forward. Maybe when all this is done, the meddlesome blonde noted vaguely, you should take him on a real vacation, to do all the other things that he missed out on growing up. Things that both of you might have missed out on? Hinata nodded thoughtfully, and after a minute she chuckled sadly. Maybe, if we have any vacation time left, after all we've spent on personal missions, the pale beauty countered ironically. Ino snorted in agreement, and then appeared to think of something. 
you could always blackmail the Hokage. Ino, Hinata gasped, scandalized by the suggestion. Hey, hurry up you two, Naruto called back to them, we're going to ride the River Rapids boat thing next. River Rapids boat thing? Ino mouthed to her friend, and Hinata grinned. The blonde caught her younger friend's hand, and pulled her forward. You guys just want to see us in wet t-shirts, she pretended to scold them. After the last two days, you are hardly in a position to make accusations, Ino, Niji said flatly, and both Hinata and Tenten turned bright red. I don't get it. Naruto leaned back to get a wider view, his eyes narrowing, why would someone have a hammer that big in one hand and a long bow in the other? Both take two hands, he couldn't use either one. He could be using the hammer as an arrow? Choji suggested dubiously. It's just a statue, Naruto, Hinata offered uncertainly. The earth daimyo who commissioned it probably never held a weapon in his life, and just thought it looked powerful or something, Ino remarked turning away from the ancient bronze monument in disdain. I guess I just don't understand art, Uzumaki shrugged. That is hardly a surprise, Niji agreed sarcastically. Naruto stuck his tongue out at the older man, and Hinata and Tenten shared grins. Naruto slid into the spring, his swim trunks briefly catching on the stone lip. Hinata sat down next to him, wearing her two-tone blue one-piece. Uzumaki missed his fiancée's purple and gray bikini, but she had not purchased another suit after the last one had been damaged and she had discarded it in a fit of rage. Ah, the former Jinchuriki sighed, that was fun and all, but after four days of running around, it's nice to have a good soak. Oh yeah, Choji agreed. But why does this place make us wear swimsuits, while the other onsen made us go in naked like normal? Naruto asked, his eyes suddenly coming back into focus. I'd rather know why I couldn't untie my top on the Lazy River ride, Ino said, referencing the water park they had visited the previous day. She shifted her suit strings to check her tan lines, we were just floating around in circles. The first resort was trying to be an authentic land of fire hot spring, Ten Ten answer Naruto, ignoring Ino, that's why we had to sign those waivers. Onsen etiquette might seem like common sense to us, but people in the land of Earth aren't as familiar with it. That's why this place makes us wear swimsuits. It is easier for the hotel, and attracts a more casual clientele. That's why it's cheaper, too. It's all about business. Like why someone might hire ninjas from a closer, but weaker village, instead of going to one of the major villages, Naruto grinned proudly as he spouted the analogy. Yes, Niji confirmed with a hint of amazement, that is a good comparison. Don't be that shocked, Uzumaki said smugly, Shizunizen has had me studying some of the business stuff the Hokage has to deal with. Some of it is strange, but the basics make sense. You might make a decent Hokage after all, Tenten teased him. Choji nodded sagely. Yeah, keep it up, Naruto pretended to be annoyed, when I'm in charge, you're all getting D-rank missions and the most loudmouth genin squads I can find. A squad of Naruto's? Ino gasped in mock horror. You just lost my vote, Niji said simply. After a few moments playful glowering, they all lapsed into warm, gentle laughter. See, Naruto, Hinata whispered to him, this trip wasn't so bad. Not bad at all, he agreed, squeezing her lightly, but the best is still to come. Well? Ino asked impatiently. They had all gathered in Niji and Tenten's room, and the two Byakugan users were scanning the area for observers, both human and technological. Hinata shook her head, and both cousins released their dojitsu. From what we can tell, no one has been following us since yesterday, Niji announced softly, it seems like they were finally convinced when we went to the water park. So it looks like the plan worked, Ten Ten smiled grimly, aiming that statement primarily at Naruto. The blonde youth shrugged in defeat. I take it this means our vacation is over? Choji noted, thinking of Niji's contingency strategies. The other teens all grew more serious. I guess that means we're heading home, Naruto contemplated, with just one more stop to make on the way. Niji raised his hand to deliver the first signal to his comrades. Choji collected the cards from Hinata and Ino, grimacing when he saw his girlfriend's hand, and then he slipped them back into the box. Naruto folded over the corner of the page in his book and returned the paperback to his backpack. 
the bus was nearly empty, aside from the six shinobi the only other passenger was a single drunken tourist. And the driver was an ancient woman with thick glasses, who had not even seemed to notice when they had entered the transport. Niji gave the second sign, and an instant later the bus rumbled down the compacted earth road, its operator blissfully unaware that her vehicle had just lost a half-dozen riders. The six teens landed in the lush wheat field without disturbing a single plant. The war had ravaged the major cities of the land of grass, the farmlands that contributed to the nation's name had been carefully avoided by both sides. Even without a binding accord, all parties to the conflict agreed that controlling the country was meaningless if they destroyed the nation's income and food supply. The leaf shinobi quickly changed clothing. None of them had brought their normal uniforms or any weapons, in case their bags were searched. Instead, each ninja had brought a pair of black or dark navy jeans and a black or dark gray liquor t-shirt. The clothing was inconspicuous enough pass inspection, but their choices were high quality, heavyweight fabrics that would provide modest protection and stealth. Each also tied on a pair of black, high-performance athletic sneakers, in place of the more casual footwear they had worn on the trip. In the end none of the pieces of their outfits individually suggested the wearer was a shinobi, but taken together the intent was fairly clear, if just murky enough that they might have been able to talk their way out of trouble. Though their next actions would remove even that doubt. Hit soon. Jinmaki. Naruto and Hinata call forth their weapons. Uzumaki tucked his head and left arm through the bandolier strap on the staff blade scabbard, and his fiancée strapped her kote into position over her uncovered forearms. Weapon summoning Jutsu, despite using the standard name, Ten Ten did not summon a distinct weapon. Instead, her two scrolls appear before her. The jonin caught them both, and clipped one onto her belt, resting against her left leg. That freed up her hand to unfurl the second parchment. She drew forth ten pouches of shurikens and tossed two to each of her allies. Then she provided Niji, Ino, and Choji with three kunai, each. After she completed her friend's equipment, Ten Ten wound her storage scroll back up and secured it over her right hip. The hidden grass hideout the Kazakage identified is approximately 40 kilometers southwest of here, Niji reminded them, our priority is stealth, we do not want them to be alerted to our presence and have the chance to prepare their defenses or to attempt to move the hostage. Hostages he restated the final word, reinforcing the fact that Nyoko Hanakata was not the only person they would be rescuing. Aran Ishigami, the nine-year-old son of the Earth Daimyo, was also being held by Namake's men, and the teens did not intend to leave him behind, even if it meant additional layers of complication for their already illegal mission. Let's get going, Ino said darkly, I don't want my friend spending another night in that hellhole. The blue Shizoku never even flinched, as Hinata placed her left palm on his back over his heart and stabbed the first two fingers of her right hand into his throat. His heart and voice were both shut down before he was ever aware of the Kunoichi's presence. He died without a sound, and Hinata lowered him just as silently into the grain stalks. If someone found him and was not an expert medical shinobi, it would just look like a heart attack. Aren't you gonna douse him? Naruto whispered anxiously. He is not wired with paper bombs, she shook her head. I wonder why not? Choji pondered. Probably so they don't put the hostages at risk, Ten Ten decided. That works out better for us, Choji noted. But when he noticed the uncertain looks on his friends' faces, he added, doesn't it? Not if it means they are expecting us, Hinata said dubiously, it could also simply be that not all of the Shizokas are forced to obliterate themselves on death, Niji countered thoughtfully, after all, there were no reports of this before the battles in the grass and waterfall country started. None of the bandit Shizokas, who were killed before the war, exploded. Maybe it's something they only do at war, Naruto suggested, I mean, if you're in the middle of a huge battle, the chance to take out your killer and his allies makes sense. But if you are guarding someone, or on some kind of stealth mission, suddenly blowing up would be a pretty stupid. Everyone except Hinata froze and stared at Naruto incredulously. But Niji's astonishment faded rapidly, and Hinata smiled proudly. That's... Ten Ten paused as she reviewed Uzumaki's suggestion, that's entirely plausible. You don't have to say it like that, the fox-faced young man frowned. We just didn't expect to hear something like that from you, Ino state unapologetically. 
Hinata started to glare her friend, but her cousin spoke up first. Despite his normal demeanor, Naruto has always had a keen instinct for combat and tactics, the white-eyed jonin asserted. Uh, thanks. Naruto said weakly in response to the backhand compliment. Then his face hardened, and he insisted, whatever's up with these guys, we don't have time to stand around here talking about it. True enough, their leader agreed, the longer we take, the better the chance someone will notice we did not return to the village on schedule. Let's keep moving. They paused when they were close enough for all six leaf warriors to see their geographical target. Along the way, the Huga cousins and Ino had silently dispatched another five of Guki's anonymous soldiers. Though none died in a way more obvious or suspicious than Hinata's first kill, the simple number of scouts they had to eliminate would raise suspicions when they were found or did not return. So the rescuers had carefully increased their pace until they reached the kidnapper's hideout. The hellhole was a modestly lavish two-story house, seemingly the home of a successful farmer or a country getaway for a lower-ranked noble. It appeared sturdy enough to withstand a heavy storm, but not enough to weather a concentrated assault. The fence was more for show or animal control than for any sort of defense. The windows were wide, uncovered, and sported happy little flower boxes. Around the back side of the building, inside the fence there was a small variety of fruit trees, apples, pears, and even one cherry. The teens would have thought they had the wrong place, if not for the six shizokas around the fence, two at the main gate and one more at each corner. And none of them wore green or tan, five were in blue and one of the pair at the entrance was in red. Niji indicated they should stop, and he and Hinata turned their activate Byakugan eyes on the building. There are eleven more inside, their leader noted, all but two are wearing stealth uniforms, so I cannot tell much about them aside from the obvious differences like height and gender. But the last two are in a room on the second floor. They appear to be our targets, but again, I cannot be sure. That is Nyoko, Hinata said firmly, it is not someone using a transformation or genjutsu. Also her chakra network is the same, and I have never seen a jutsu that can imitate tenketsu, so I don't think it is a stand-in. But I've never seen the Earth Prince in person before, so I can't guarantee it is him. But the boy with Nyoko is also not having his appearance altered by any ninja technique I can detect, either. So fifteen Shizokas and two hostages, Naruto muttered, that's two and a half each. We can do that. I say we just charge in there and take him out. Do not forget, according to the information the sand provided, one of them is some sort of elite soldier, Niji reminded his hasty junior, and all of them are blue or higher rank, so it will not be that easy. If we just go charging in there, what's to prevent the ones inside from using Yoko and Ishigamuji as human shields, Ino added more scathingly. Okay, so what are we going to do then? Uzumaki countered softly. Niji considered that for a moment, and then reached into his backpack and withdrew a pamphlet from the first resort they had visited. The jonin glanced over the brochure and nodded in satisfaction. He knelt down and spread the laminated page over the ground Hinata, I need to borrow you eyes, he requested, as he began to slowly sign. Of course, my brother, she answered, her hands flying through the seals before she announced, carry name Jutsu. Niji deactivated his Byakogan and closed his eyes, as he began to use his cousin's wider, sharper field of vision. He completed his signs, and held his hands, palm down over the promotional paper. Ninja art, Sumi Funsha Jutsu, he proclaimed, sending his chakra down to the pamphlet. The colors on the advertisement began to blur and drift across the page, settling into new images and words. The others all crowded around loosely, and presently they all recognized the farmhouse as it emerged from the ink cloud into a picture that looked like a photograph. Another section of the brochure became an overhead map of the area, indicating the directions from the closest town, down the roads, through the fields, pastures, and one small stand of trees, before finally leading up the road to the building they were targeting. One part cleared into black text on a white background, extolling the virtues of wheat winds in. Niji even crafted some photographs of interior decor of the grass safe house. Finally, the elder Hyuga exhaled in release as he ended the jutsu. He examined both sides of the altered pamphlet and appeared pleased by the results. That's great, Niji Ino noted, I've never seen such realistic interpretations. If I hadn't seen you do it, 
I would think those really were professional photos of this place. That is the idea, their leader nodded, before handing the advertisement to the blonde woman, you and Choji will provide a distraction. Circle around to the path and approach openly. Play the role of tourists, be loud, demanding, and moderately aggressive, do not show any fear. Try to draw the others out of the building. Instill confusion in them, so much as you can. And what happens if they don't buy it? Naruto asked. In that case, or simply if they do not react sufficiently to Ino and Choji's intrusion, you and Hinata will be on hand to back them up in combat, the Jonin smirked either way, Ten Ten, and I will use that advantage to sneak in. He lowered his voice, and the teens all moved in closer while he explained his full plan, including where he and Ten Ten would strike, so the others could help them draw attention away from that point, and also where Hinata and Naruto should position themselves. Okay, Ino sighed when Niji finished, I guess that means we need to change again. So if you could all turn around. Niji, Hinata, and Naruto all complied immediately, but Ten Ten shook her head at inconsistent Chunin before looking away, as well. Yamanaka swapped her faux uniform for a simple sundress, dark blue, and just long enough to cover the shuriken pouches after she strapped them to her upper thighs. Choji did not disrobe, he simply took out a bright, loud, floral print shirt and put it on over his t-shirt, buttoning it but not tucking it in, okay, two more things before we can go, Ino decided. She took a bottle of juice and poured it over her head, before using a pair of jutsu to bond the color to her hair and eliminate any lingering odor. The false coloring would not last past her next shower, but it gave her locks a temporary and convincing red hue. She then extracted a compact and turned to her lover. Come here, Choji, and hold still, she instructed. Akimichi frowned and complied, and the others all looked confused. Ino patted down his face with her concealer, covering up the swirls on his cheeks. Is this really necessary? The big Takujo asked despondently, looking to Naruto and Niji for help. But neither interceded. These aren't civilians, Ino explained, they are wannabe ninjas so there is a good chance they could recognize your clan markings. The others nodded their agreement, and the hefty shinobi sighed in defeat. Nagato, Guki called out gently, not wanting to take his subordinate's attention away from the paths of pain at an inopportune moment. But the younger man's unique blue orbs snapped open and regarded his sensei wearily. I apologize if I am interrupting, Namike stated clearly, but I need an update on the status of the attack on the hidden rain village. We are doing well, the Rinnegan user answered, slurring the word slightly, as you expected, the appearance of my deva self has caused panic among the rain shinobi. Many have fled, or even defected. But so far, they have managed to plug the gaps in their defenses. Still, I do not expect they will be able to hold out for more than a week or two. Good, the rakage smiled, thanks to Conan and Madara's efforts, we will be able to send troops to take the mines, rice paddies, and snow countries tomorrow. Are you sure we are not overextending ourselves, Master Guki? Conan asked as she slipped into the room she shared with Nagato. The sound village poses no threat, the leaf renegade insisted, even before their little civil war, their main power was Orochimaru Sensei and his lieutenants, and they are all gone now. The mine's village is key to the defensive of the Land of Lightning, but if they were to learn we are using Madara, they might just come out of their shell and attack us. And since I am not concerned about the land of silver's precious metals, we can attack the mines themselves, taking their legs out from under them. He paused with a slight frown, only the snow village is a real threat. Their star has been on the rise since Daimyo Koyuki returned, and that village has had a large number of Jinin graduates the last three years. But they are isolated, and their strongest ally has been taken out of the game. We might have to take some of our troops out of the grass and waterfall, but our grip over those countries has stabilized, and most of their surviving shinobi are now under our command. So we should have sufficient forces. The origami kunoichi nodded in acceptance, and he grinned broadly at them. Good. Then tomorrow, phase three will begin. See, we found it, a brash, bossy voice carried past the bend in the compacted dirt road through the wheat field. That's what you said three hours ago, her long-suffering boyfriend countered. As they rounded the corner the redhead and her hefty paramour were confronted by two mildly surprised individuals in full stealth gear. 
Look, there, I told you, the young woman woman gestured towards the house triumphantly, there it is. Finally, Eno groused at the Shizokas as she marched up, Choji trailing wearily behind her. She folded up the pamphlet and slipped it back into her bag. The stupid bus let us out in the middle of nowhere, she complained to the guards, the driver said it was just a short walk. Short walk, my ass, Choji panted slightly, pretending to be out of breath. There are no signs on these dirt paths, and the map on the brochure didn't have any landmarks, she told the confused warriors, so it took us forever to find this place. But even if the directions had been clear, we still had to walk way too far. She wagged her finger at the blue-clad warrior, and added, and don't think I won't be talking to the manager about that. The Shizokas glanced back and forth between the two tourists, completely out of their depth. Eno started to tap her foot in annoyance, and glared at them. Well, if you aren't going to take our bags, at least get out of the way, she demanded. Sorry about my girl, Choji placed a hand on her shoulder to try to calm her, but we would just like to check in, so we can get cleaned up and sit for a while before dinner. My feet are killing me. I'm sorry, but you must have the wrong place, the red-garbed soldier told them, but his voice was highly uncertain of his statement. What? Eno shrieked in protest. Then she yanked out the doctored paper again, tore it slightly opening it, and stared darkly at the advertisement. No way, she shot back, brandishing the advertisement like a weapon, this is definitely the place. We never saw any other buildings like that, either on the bus or when we were wandering around looking for this place. The crimson guard took the brochure from her gingerly and looked it over. Even though his face was covered, his body language told the leaf ninjas he was frowning in bewilderment. Why don't we just kill them, the blue Shizoku finally spoke, not trying to prevent them from hearing him. They are civilians, the red guard asserted, as if that explained everything. The other warrior groaned in annoyance and took a step back. Is this how you treat all your guests, the disguised Kunoichi snapped at them. You know, maybe we should calm down a little, Choji insisted, and her blue eyes flashed in genuine anger. You know, why should I? The red Shizoku started to say something, but stopped when the young woman whirled around and punched her paramour in the arm. I've told you not to call me that, she snapped, and then grumbled, seriously, what kind of boyfriend gives you a nickname based on your family name instead of your given name? She took a breath and turned her attention back to the guards. Listen, could you just call the manager and let him know Kakoku Inoue and Masami Kikuchi are here, she asked more politely of the Shizoku, her anger have been diverted to her boyfriend, we reserved a room for the long weekend. Kakoku Inoue, the blue Shizoku spoke again, sounding surprised, like the famous voice actress from a few years? I wish Ino laughed dismissively, channeling her real annoyance that he had recognized the name into her words, but I couldn't be her, she's been in the business for more than two decades, and I'm only seventeen years old. You can't believe how much she hates that, Choji added in mock dismay, now I'm probably going to hear about it all night. Why did my parents have to name me that, don't they know how embarrassing it is? Eno glowered at him again, but this time it was just an act. Meanwhile the higher-ranked guard had given in, he took out a small walkie-talkie and depressed the button. Captain, you had better come out here, he announced, his voice wavering, we have them, guests? What was that, Lieutenant, an equally shocked voice emerged from the device. Two guests, Kikoku Inoue and Masami. Kikuchi, right? They just arrived and want to check in, the red Shizoku confirmed. We have reservations, Ino shouted at the radio. I'll be right out, the other solider confirmed. Niji saw the renegades inside the house shift, and a number of them moved closer to the door. The warrior who was supposed to be guarding the southwest corner of the fence had drifted north to try to see what the commotion was in front of the house. As the Jonin had calculated, the soldiers were bored and easily distracted after spending three weeks in the middle of nowhere. The pair froze as a tree limb hanging over the fence above them creaked and the leaves rustled. Ten Ten glanced up, but there was no one there. As the guard did not react either, she decided it had just been the wind. Another gust swept through the tall grains, as if to confirm her deduction. Now, Niji signed, and he and Tintin cleared the fence in one leap. The mislead guard briefly looked back, but by then the ninja couple had crouched between the lower, brick portion of the fence and a flowering pear tree. After the blue Shizoku returned to craning his neck to get a better view of the main gate, the leaf ninjas darted towards the house. 
a moment later, not one, but four additional Shizokas exited the building. The grey-clad soldier approached the gate, while the three blue mercenaries took up additional positions along the fence. As their commander approached, the Red Guard stood up straighter and passed the ranking warrior Niji's falsified pamphlet. Inoue-san and Kikuchi-san claim that they have reservations for this weekend, the Red Shizoku told his superior, trying to sound in control. That is entirely possible, the captain admitted smoothly. Then he addressed Ino and Choji directly. We don't actually work here you see, he explained naturally, we are the bodyguards for, let's just say some VIPs. They chose this in last minute to hold some secret negotiations. Its remote location makes it ideal, as you can imagine. To ensure their privacy, they rented the entire building. What kind of negotiations? Eno smirked as she asked, and the captain tilted his head as if smiling suggestively under the mask. Negotiations of a confidential and personal nature, the Grey Warrior noted glibly, sensing he was making headway, I'm sure you understand that I cannot say more. Stupid rich people, she shot back, but without any real venom, always throwing around money in making trouble for us normal people. The captain nodded, and Eno sighed in defeat. Choji had to struggle not to tense up at his lover's apparent acceptance of the lie. He was not sure they had bought Niji and Tenten anywhere near the amount of time they needed. But his worry was unfounded. Fine, Eno shrugged, I guess there is nothing we can do about it. Just get us a refund, and we'll leave. The grey Shizoku kept bobbing his head to try to keep her appeased, right up to the instant she uttered the word refund. His head suddenly froze, and his two subordinates shuddered. What was that? the captain asked carefully, but with a vibe of danger. We put down a 1,000 Rio deposit, Eno's voice carried a similar edge, and it goes without saying that we want our money back. Deposits are non-refundable, the leader said harshly, and the red-clad lieutenant dropped his head, having expected his commander's reaction once money became an issue. Maybe not under normal circumstances, the fake red-headed countered firmly, but we didn't cancel here, we were bumped. And without adequate notification, I might add. I'm sure the innkeeper will be happy to reschedule your stay for another weekend and apply your balance to that reservation, after snapping at her, the grey Shizoku suddenly seemed to remember the angle he had been playing, so he added weakly, he is quite accommodating. He sure was, for your fat cat clients, the undercover Kunoichi was not deterred, but we came all the way out here, and now we have no place to stay and return tickets that aren't good for another three days. It's not like we are made of money. We are gonna need that thousand to either find another place to stay, or to pay for alternate transportation. And in that case, we would be out the price of our original bus tickets. She exhaled angrily, look, I don't even know why I'm talking about this with you. Can't you just get the owner out here? The owner is, indisposed at the moment, the Shizoku leader backpedaled quickly, there was an incident, and the innkeeper is, cleaning up. One of our clients is extremely fastidious. Almost germaphobic. We'll wait, Eno said brightly yet sarcastically, crossing her arms in front of her ample chest, it's not like we have anywhere else to go. Even if we can't kill them, the aggressive guard in blue decided to offer his opinion again, we could knock them out and drag them to the nearby town. Choji pretended to prepare to run, but Eno just glared at the would-be murderer. That will be quite enough, sergeant, the red Shizoku sounded like he shared Eno's opinion. The grey-clad captain regarded them carefully. He had been starting to wonder if they were con artists, but dismissed the idea. One thousand Rio was hardly pocket change, but it wasn't worth coming out to such a remote location. Also, any real con would have negotiated at the threat of violence. And based on the layout, he fully expected the grass safe house could have operated as an inn in the past, or even simply when it was not otherwise needed. The brochure looked real enough. All right, he bristled as he spoke, I will give you your money, if you will just leave. Our employers plan on an evening stroll soon, and if they see you. And what about you? Choji sounded concerned. Well, I will need you two to sign a voucher, so I can have the innkeeper reimburse me, the grey Shizoku's like came out more sincerely than he expected. He reached into one of his uniform's many pockets, and drew out a small number of bills. Part of him screamed silently in protest, as he started counting off 150 Rio notes. 
I'm really sorry to make you do this, Akimichi reached up a scratched his cheek in not entirely false dismay. That's. Whatever platitude the Shizoku was going to offer died in his throat as he looked at the large youth again. Ino's eyes widened as she realized her lover's errant gesture had scraped some of the makeup off his cheek, revealing the distinctive swirl at which their target was now staring. Honey, your scars? She tried to cover, but it was too late. Sweitun, scrubbing Jutsu, the gray Shizoku snarled, signing once, and then jammed his money back into his pocket, while he pointed his other hand at them. The cleaning bubbles hit them softly, getting them only slightly wet, but removing the concealer from Choji's cheeks and the improvised tint from Ino's hair. He's an Akimichi, the red warrior proclaimed even as he reached for his weapons. I told you this wouldn't get us inside, Choji moaned as he discarded his outer shirt to gain clear access to the blades stored underneath. It was worth a try, she shot back, faking her anger again as they switched to the secondary plan. They're ninjas, the blue guard exclaimed in delight, already starting to sign. Choji Akimichi and Ino Yamanaka, the captain confirmed, we've been expecting you. Well, were you expecting this? Naruto roared as he leapt out of the cover of the wheat, swinging Kitsune overhand at the gray Shizoku's head. The captain easily dodged the attack and kicked Naruto in the ribs as the younger man landed. The blue Shizoku launched a small lightning bolt at Ino, trying to capitalize on the dampness left by his superior, but Hinata intercepted it with her own gout of water. Yes, we were, the lead mercenary confirmed, as the leaf ninjas regrouped, even after our master decided you were truly on vacation, we maintained our readiness for your attack. Where are Niji Hyuga and Tintin? They stayed on the bus with some transformed shadow clones, to keep up the show, Hinata answered sincerely, and Naruto hoped Niji's estimate that they would not be missed for a few more hours was accurate. The other Shizoka standing guard started to close in, but the grey-garbed leader waved them back. Original guards, hold your positions, and keep watch in case Hinata-san is lying, he ordered, triggering his radio so they could all hear him, the reinforcements who came out with me report to the front gate. And I want two more of the reserves out here, while the remaining two secure the hostages. Eight on four? Naruto smirked, you must be pretty confident. The former Jinchuriki launched his left fist at the gray mask, while more subtly swinging his staff blade at the renegade's knee. The Shizoku stepped back, causing the low attack to miss, and brushed aside the punch. As he did, two more blue Shizokas exited the house, and the three he had brought with to reinforce the gaps in the watch surged forward as well. Lieutenant, hold off Akimichi-san, while I keep Uzumaki-san busy, the captain instructed, that way the sergeants can go after Ino-san and Hinata-san three on one. Take them out first, and remember their powers. Partial expansion jutsu, Choji intoned. His right arm swung out, now as large as the rest of his body. His target was the red Shizoku, and if his aim proved true, he would knock his opponent into the one of the four blue Shizokas attacking Hinata. Iron Guard Jutsu, the Scarlet Kidnapper countered, crossing his forearms in front of his body. To Akimichi, it felt like he had punched the main gates of the Leaf Village, and the lieutenant only slid back a few inches. The moment Choji ceased applying force, Guki's agent drew his iron and bronze gladius, and stabbed at the Leaf Takujo's shrinking fist. Choji pulled his hand back faster, but was unable to avoid a light cut to his middle and ring fingers. The heavy warrior investigated his injury, but decided it was not serious, and started plotting his next move. Metal clanged on metal as the gray Shizoku absorbed Kitsune's attacks on his own short blade. Naruto lashed out again, watching the strain in his opponent's arm as he absorbed the attack. He's not as strong as me, Uzumaki decided, but he's just as flexible and maybe a little bit quicker. And mostly, he's a lot better with the Gladius than I would have expected. As if they illustrated the younger man's thoughts, the grey-garbed renegade twisted their linked blades around, knocking Kitsune wide while giving himself a shot at Naruto's gut. The blonde Takujo twisted out of the way of the jab and transferred the momentum to his staff blade, aiming at the Shizoku's neck. But the masked kidnapper knocked the blow away with his left hand, revealing the climbing claw in his palm. Ninja art, quick change jutsu, Ino chanted, regretting the loss of her sundress as it shredded to make way for her stand-in uniform. She drew two of the kunai Tintin had provided her, and blocked the first Shizoku strike, before kicking away the second blue-clad attacker. 
Yamanaka noticed, to her annoyance, that the sergeants were not obeying orders, only two were attacking her, while the other four surrounded Hinata. I might be the only Chunin here, she growled internally, but I'll make them pay for underestimating me. She stuck the daggers back on her belt, and unleashed half the throwing stars in the pouch on her left leg. Only one of the two blue Shizokas took a hit from the half-dozen shurikens, and that was a light scratch on his left thigh. But her female opponent dodged completely. And the projectiles served their true purpose, buying Eno time and space to start signing. Rotation, Hinata pushed her four attackers away, but none were struck as firmly as she had been hoping. Instead, Guki's troops remembered their leader's warning and were expecting her Byakugan techniques. And as the chakra dome faded, two of the navy-masked renegades were signing, and Hinata recognized the beginnings of fire-release ninjutsu. Retreating was not an option, with the other two Shizokas waiting, their short swords at the ready. So, instead, Hinata stepped closer to the fire users, her own hands crafting a ninjutsu with far greater speed. Katen, fire streamer's jutsu, the sergeants incanted, not quite in unison. Dotan, stone barricade jutsu, Hinata pulled up a thick plane of rock and dirt between her and the flames, stopping the red, orange, and yellow comets, and scattering no small amount of the crops into the air. She briefly wondered how many loaves of bread could have been made from the wasted grain. The Huga Sion dismissed her regret, and turned back to face the two armed warriors, still carefully watch for the other Shizokas to move around or bring down her defensive wall. Niji and Tinten slipped past the blue Shizoku in the main room, deciding not to risk alerting the remaining two guards by killing her. The female renegade growled lightly, as she stared out the front window at the battle evolving outside. She was so caught up in the fights, and in her annoyance at being excluded, that she hadn't even noticed the shifting air when the leaf Jonan pair had entered the room through the back window. The elder teens snuck up the stairs noiselessly. Having left the two blue-clad warriors on the first floor, they had only the last guard to deal with. As with the others, Niji's Byakugan could not make out the color of the uniform without normal visual contact, but from the way she held herself, he expected the last guard was at least a red-ranked Shizoku, if not another full gray. But unlike the others, her uniform appeared almost frayed around the edges, and the Huga Jonin wondered if that was indicative of the guard having more battle experience. As they advanced, he also took a closer look at the prisoners. Both Nyoko and the Earth Prince looked worried, but there was also a smug look of expectation on the Fire Princess's lips. Neither was secured, beyond being locked in the reinforced, windowless room. The Leaf Shinobi stopped on the last step, tensing. Unlike the others, the final guard was not distracted by Choji's team. She was crouching on her chair rather than sitting in it, her eyes facing the stairs. Her fingertips were touching, and her left arm rested against the door, daring them to try to open it without her noticing. You go first, hit her with Kanai, Niji's hands told Tenten, -ten, I will be right behind you and neutralize her with gentle fist if that fails. The weapons expert nodded, taking four of the multipurpose knives in each hand. Her lover focused his chakra into his fingertips and nodded. The slender young woman darted around the corner into the wide hallway, unleashing her blades before she even got a good look at her opponent. As she did, she gasped in both surprise and fear. As Niji followed Tin Ten and got a real look at their opponent, he understood his teammate's reaction. What Niji had thought was a fraying of their enemy's uniform, was instead the ends of cloth hanging off the knotted-together ninja headbands covering her body. In front of the guard's linked hands was a sphere of superheated air had deflected Tenten's kunai while melting them into slag. The guard stepped forward, thrusting her hands at them. Dual arts, sweltering wind, the reaper of ninjas hissed, transforming the sphere into a blustery column of heat. Eight trigrams, enfolding dome, Niji reacted, and the Byakugan art enclosed both of the lovers. Though the Huga's quick thinking saved them, much of the inferno still bled through the protective hemisphere, and both teens could feel their faces redden and blister. Not the Huga I was hoping for, the murderess summoned her trident, but I suppose you will do for an appetizer. The grey Shizoku slashed Naruto's uncovered forearm with his climbing spikes, while keeping Kitsune trapped against his short sword. The leaf soldier forced his opponent back with a grunt, and glanced down at the shallow furrows in his flesh, even as they closed. Uzumaki blocked the next strike, 
and this time grabbed his opponent's wrist as he tried another claw swipe. The renegade tried to slip free, but Naruto held him fast and forced one edge of the double-bladed gladius perilously close to its user's neck. The Shizoku focused some chakra into his arm, and the buckle on his glove loosened. The captain slipped his hand out of his glove, surrendering his claw to free his limb. Ninja art, shadow sword jutsu, the great glad warrior intoned, signing around the hilt of his weapon. As he lashed out again, a phantom blade appeared parallel to the physical gladius. Naruto parried again, cautiously angling his staff blade so it would catch both the real and the chakra sword. Any suspicions Uzumaki might have had that the second weapon was an illusion or distraction was dispelled when he felt the increased and spread apart pressure on Kitsune. Man, that's a cool jutsu, Naruto thought, imagining having two kitsune side by side. But his admiration quickly faded. Any advantage Uzumaki had possessed in physical power vanished, the twin blades effectively doubling the Shizoku's muscle output. But at the same time, it did not slow the captain either. Naruto also had to be more careful blocking, making sure he caught both blades with every parry. The leaf Takujo was not certain if one blade would continue if he stopped the other, but he wasn't about to chance it either. Crap, Naruto vocalized his dismay when he realized that in between the attacks, the gray Shizoku was signing, slowly building a ninjutsu. The blonde youth started to act in kind, but he knew that the renegade had a head start. So he picked a simpler jutsu he had fully mastered years ago. Cyclone spikes, Naruto said quickly, and the Shizoku gasped slightly in amazement. Swaytun, water burst jutsu, the gray warrior unleashed his art before it was complete. The liquid explosion hit Uzumaki's darts, destroying them. But the tiny tornadoes tore apart the surface of the water and slowed it, so while Naruto was soaked, he was neither injured nor staggered by the jutsu. Katan Shuriken Jutsu, Ino announced when her seven hand signs completed, launched four fiery shurikens at each of her enemies. She continued signing, and the next seven more seals were the same, but for one. She finished with, Raitun Shuriken Jutsu. The first Shizoku dealt with the eight energy-throwing stars by cutting them from the air with his sword. But the other blue-garbed warrior dodged the flame projectiles, but was too off-balance to fully avoid the second set, and took deep lightning hits to her right bicep and thigh. She whirled around, facing Ino as she signed. Ninja Arts, Ikioi Graft Jutsu Ino grimaced as she heard that. The Ikio Graft was a dangerous jutsu she had learned about in her lessons with Tsunade. The technique was an attempt to imitate Madara Uchiha Susuri, but instead of banishing injuries into the future, it created a patch of false flesh to cover the injury. It prevented bleeding and pain and allowed the user to function normally. But the wound was not truly healed, so any moderate or heavy activity would worsen the injury. And due to the technique, the ninja would not know. Yamanaka pushed down her pity and drew a kunai again to block a swipe the healthier Shizoku took at her with his gladius. The blonde Chunin also noted that she had been the most successful against her opponents so far, though her pride quickly melted into worry. Maybe I should try to destroy his mind, the mentalist Kunoichi considered, but we also need to try to keep them distracted from what's going on inside, so I can't kill them too quickly. Is that what the others are doing too? But Niji didn't order us to stall after the initial infiltration, and Naruto isn't the type to do that on his own. Ino shrugged internally. When she started to lace her fingers to activate her clan's psychic jutsu, the Shizokas both drew back and prepared to dodge. Choji extended his enlarged hands on either side of the red Shizoku, as if planning it crush him. The masked warrior crouched and held his sword parallel to his chest, preparing to dodge and strike back. But instead, Akimichi curled his fingers into giant fists and slammed them into the turf, also channeling some earth chakra down his arms. The ground beneath the Shizoku bucked wildly, and he grabbed the grains around him with his empty hand to avoid being thrown into the air. The stalks were ripped free, but the lieutenant maintained his balance. The crimson-garbed renegade rolled to the side, throwing his weight behind his blade as he jabbed at the leaf ninja's wrist. Choji spun his whole body, swinging his endangered limb away from his opponent, while his other hand flew toward the rogue's back. As he watched his target fly away, the Shizoku appeared to anticipate the large shinobi's action, and he flipped backwards over Choji's arm. He lowered his blade weakly, and scored a light cut on the back of Choji's attacking hand. 
Ow, Choji grunted, shrinking his forelimbs back to their regular size, okay, need to either play more defensive or fight him at long range. And range isn't really my thing. Dotan dust em up Jutsu. A layer of dirt, clay, and pebbles surrounded Akimichi's hands, enslaved to his will. He slammed his fists together experimentally, and then grinned at the Shizoku. Partial expansion jutsu, he announced again, launching a left cross at the his opponent. The red Shizoku's gladius flashed up, but the earthen gauntlet expanded along with Choji's fist, and the blade only gouged the jutsu-bound material. Instead the scarlet soldier was knocked back heavily by the weighty strike, and he partially disappeared into the wheat field. Undeterred, he darted back out a second later, placing his left hand over his sword's crosspiece. Swayton, cleansing jutsu, the lieutenant channeled the earth jutsu negating technique into his sword, and the gladius took on a noticeable blue hue. Hinata gracefully ducked under a beam of fire and slid around a lance of electricity. Her four enemies were playing it safe, keeping outside the range of her Byakugan arts and pelting her with fire and lightning jutsu. She could have stopped some of the weaker or denser fire attacks with her eight trigrams heavenly spin or one its variants, but that would have locked her in place for one of their other shots to hit. So she kept dodging, her superior speed and flexibility keeping her safe while she crafted the hand seals for her counterattack. She dove over a fire-traced jutsu, recognizing that they were trying to hurt her. But the Shizokas did not realize Hinata was the one moving herself into position. Dotan, stone surge jutsu, she incanted, pulling down almost half of the wall she had created earlier, and throwing the material at the four sergeants. Two of the blue-garbed warriors managed to enact hasty jutsus to protect themselves. And the one closest to boundary of her attack managed to roll desperately out of the way. But the last was unable to complete his counter jutsu in time, and took two large stones to the head and one to the chest. Before Hinata could capitalize further on her success, her head suddenly snapped up, and she turned her head towards what her Byakugan had already seen. Tenten interposed her Ziphos and Wakazashi between the tines of the trident, holding the reaper back. The hall was wide for the style and size of the building, but was still too narrow for a proper duel of arms. So the weapon mistress had chosen the two, curved short blades instead of a single larger weapon. She was surprised the reaper had elected to use the three-pronged spear Hinata had described from their last confrontation, but the older woman wielded her pole weapon with undeniable skill, relying mainly on thrusts but occasionally mixing in broader swings, if not at full extension. The leaf jonin couple had adapted one of the preferred leaf fighting styles for close quarters combat, Ten Ten held the forward position with melee attacks, while Niji stayed back and fought their opponent with jutsu. So far, they had been moderately successful, Ten Ten had kept the trident from hitting either of them, while Niji had stopped most of the reaper's jutsu, though one lightning technique had grazed the leaf Kunoichi's left foot, numbing it. Unfortunately, neither of the jonin had been able to score a hit on the guard. So, you are working for Guki Namikaze now? Niji asked sardonically, for someone with the stated intent of killing all shinobi, you certainly seem to like to throw your lot in with the more unsavory members of my profession. That did not work for Hinata when I was more mentally unbalanced, the reaper shrugged as she tried to twist the wakazashi out of Tenten's right hand, why would you think it would work now? I do have a greater talent for sarcastic mockery than my sister cousin does, Niji also bobbed his shoulders neutrally. Wait, you're saying you're sane now? Ten Ten prompted dubiously. The Reaper succeeded in knocking her primary weapon loose, so the borderline amidextrous Kunoichi juggled her Ziphos to her right hand and as it fell caught the Wakazashi in her left. Only a fool or madman thinks he is sane, the unnamed woman drew her hands together on the haft of her weapon to start signing, but I no longer believe the lies I concocted to distract my enemies and tools are true, nor do I let my rage rule my actions. Guki-san was quite helpful in that respect. And when he succeeds, my goal will have been met as well. The current classification of ninja will be no more. Tenten could not help but notice that the Reaper, who had been well matched one-on-one -on -one with Naruto and Hinata during their previous encounters, was now fighting the Niji and herself of them on even terms. The single-named teen knew it was in part due to the limitations of the fight, she and Niji had to be wary of each other in the comparatively narrow space, and also had to consider the hostages in their actions. She is much stronger than our reports indicated, Niji's words reflected his fiancé's thoughts. 
he deflected a set of wind blades with another enfolding dome. The reaper followed quickly with a trio of quick stabs, angling them past the slender young woman to try to strike the Huga Jonan. Ten Ten was on the ball and deflected all of the attacks. The other advantage of working alongside Gukisan, the reaper responded, you could call me the prototype for the Shizokas. I was the first to undergo the treatment, and as one of Namaki-san's generals I was given a more comprehensive enhancement than the rank and file soldiers. The rogue shuddered slight noting, that method might be painful and risky for the weak, but it is undeniably effective. I should have more than enough to deal with a pair of low-rank jonin, she added, pushing Ten-Ten into Niji when their weapons clashed again. In that case, we can simply wait for our friends to finish your troops and come to help us, Niji argued, regaining his balance and starting to sign an offensive technique. That is a poor assumption, the reaper said mockingly. The male jonin paused in his chakra shaping with a concerned frown. Why's that? Ten-Ten shot back, expecting a trick. Because of your unfortunate timing, the murderess's smile touched her voice, you see, it is just about time for our scouts and outliers to change shifts. Reinforcements Hinata cried out in warning as six additional blue shizokas charged in from the west. Multi-shadow clone jutsu In response to Hinata's warning, Naruto instinctively split off twenty copies of himself. But before the clones could even move to intercept the returning Shizokas, the grey-clothed captain cut down one duplicate and began barking new orders. Sergeants, you have Akimichi-san, Hinata-san, and Ino-san, their field commander instructed, Lieutenant, you and I will take Uzumaki-san and his clones. Four of the new arrivals darted towards Choji, and one each joined the opponents already arrayed against Ino and Hinata. Hinata cursed herself silently for not paying closer attention to the outer reaches of her enhanced vision. I should have noticed them just after this fight began, she thought darkly, placing her own hands in the same gesture Naruto had just used. Shadow Clone Jutsu, the youngest leaf shinobi present split off a single facsimile. The clone stepped forward, countering two fire jutsu with a quick sway ton technique. And behind her, the original Hinata began gathering her chakra in both of her legs and in her right wrist. Her lower limbs creaked in anticipation, and the key in her arm began to glow visibly. As her other self took a hit from a kunai and exploded, Hinata released both the physical and metaphysical energy in her legs and rocketed forward, jumping far over the heads of the Shizokas. They all tracked her, and three started signing. Eight trigrams, empty palm, the pale beauty shouted as she flipped over them. The Huga heiress released the wave of force, aiming it so it would hit the two Shizokas on her left. But they were ready for her Byakugan technique. The leftmost sergeant countered with a negative chakra jutsu, sacrificing his energy to weaken her strike. The two blue-masked renegades in the middle enclosed Hinata's targets in a pair of stone domes. The diminished empty palm shattered the first barrier, but only cracked the second one before its power was spent. Shuriken Shadow Clone Jutsu, the last Shizoku encanted, throwing six stars are the leaf Takujo. The whirling blades multiplied tenfold, and Hinata frowned at the sixty shuriken flashing towards her. Though still inverted and in mid-air, a seal spread out from the young woman's feet as she moved her arms into position. Byakugan Art, Protection of the Eight Trigrams, Sixty-Four Palms even as she rotated into an upright stance for landing, Hinata's arms darted around with casual speed and accuracy, cutting both the real and chakra stars from the air. At the same time, she focused some of the energy threads on the rocky dome, cutting out large chunks and letting them fall in on the Shizokas, switching their situation from protected to trapped. Her base level Byakogan showed her the two sergeants dodging to the edges of the vault, avoiding her reversal. As Hinata touched down on the wheat field, a concentrated sphere of electricity blasted through the stone aimed at her head. But this time she was neither wounded nor exhausted, and she avoided the lightning cannon with only a slight shudder of fear, while her four attackers continued regrouping. Ino aborted her mind destruction jutsu as a third blue Shizoku moved in behind her. The new renegade had a gladius drawn, and was close enough that Ino worried the two seconds her psychic jutsu would leave her open would let allow opponent land a lethal blow. Instead, Yamanaka hopped forward two steps, signing a quick quartet of hand seals before bringing her fingers to her mouth. Raiten, grand lightning ball jutsu, the chunin blew on her fingertips, sending out a stream of electricity that curled in on itself, 
forming a 12-foot diameter sphere of power. The wheat stalks burst into flames and were consumed by the reckless attack. The Shizoku whom she had been targeting for insanity was caught by Ino and collapsed to the ground, his uniform smoldering. But the sergeant still using Ikioi graft avoided the attack, and the Shizoku behind her slunk closer. Ino dismissed the lightning ball and spun, palming shurikens as she did. The leaf Kunoichi's eyes clenched in focus, and she released the throwing stars. The blue-garbed renegade raised his blade and sent Chakra to his arms to increase his speed and control. The masked soldier cut the five projectiles out of the air easily and started to continue forward. It was only then did he realize why Ino had looked so intent when she threw the shurikens. Shadow Shuriken Jutsu, Ino used the name of the technique as a silent mantra. The second set of stars, hidden by the first, were too close and too unexpected for the Shizoku, but Goki's followers still managed to deflect the two throwing knives that would have respectively hit his face and heart. In turn, he took one in the stomach and one in each half of his left arm. The armor in his uniform prevented the gut hit from being lethal or disabling, but his left arm hung limply beside him, nerves pinched and blood flowing. Ino and Hinata both turned their heads in worry as the farmhouse shook, but neither of their lovers seemed to notice, and the building did not collapse, so they quickly returned their focus to their opponents. The red and grey Shizokas regrouped to face the Uzumaki battalion. The captain made a grasping and releasing motion with his left hand, and the lieutenant tossed his his gladius to the grey-clad leader before taking a few steps back. The Naruto duplicates eyed them in suspicion, but three near the front of the pack grew impatient. They each drew a kunai, the simple implements having been duplicated even though Kitsune was not. Armed and reckless, they charged the kidnappers. The grey Shizoku sliced deep into the first copy's chest and caught the daggers of the other two duplicates on his now paired short blades. And behind him, the red-garbed rogue started signing. Futun, Cyclone Spikes Jetsu, the lieutenant fired the eleven darts past the Naruto's engaged in melee, tearing into the front line, destroying six of them. The original grimaced, eight of his one-score copies had been killed without injuring either of his opponents or gaining him any significant insights. The teen had been hoping to preserve his chakra for their escape, but instead reluctantly clapped his hands together again. Multi-shadow clone jutsu, he hissed darkly, splitting off another ten duplicates. This time they did not pause, the new clones darted forward, even as a second of their engaged comrades exploded. The twenty-one blondes hit the grey Shizoku like a wave, and though he flailed about with blades and feet, trying to hold them back, all but six slipped past him. Three of those turned back, so nine Naruto's were surrounding him. And the rest went after the ninjutsu user. Hayatan, avalanche barricade, the red warrior combined his wind and water chakra and crafted a five-meter-high wall between himself and the Naruto's. But the defense was unstable by design, and began to fall towards the facsimiles. Two of the clones pushed their comrades out of the way, and two more were able to dodge on their own. But the rest were crushed by the collapsing ice. The remaining four approached the red Shizoku more carefully, and threes of the duplicates hemming in the captain broke off to help, while the original Naruto stepped forward to challenge the grey-masked leader. The red renegade exhaled from the effort of creating such a large ice jutsu, but he started signing again, and prepared to retreat if necessary. Seven versions of Naruto frowned in unison as they fenced with Grey Shizoku. The Gladius had been one of the fox-faced teens for Erank weapons during the previous Jonin trials, its length, weight, and straight-edge blade making it a good approximation of a staff blade. So the Uzumaki variants were all more than slightly surprised to catch the captain using tricks with the short blade that were specific to the Hidden Leaf Village. With that realization, two of the Naruto's suddenly recognized that the red and grey kidnappers had been trying to use the wood scorpion formation, where one ninja used two weapons to fend off opponents while his or her partner struck at them with ninjutsu. These guys fight like leaf ninjas, he pondered, are they Konoha missing nin as well, or did my uncle teach them this stuff? Those are leaf moves, another clone angrily vocalized their shared thoughts, did Guki teach you that? Before either of them could answer, all of the Shizoka's communicators suddenly squawked. Captain, a voice familiar to Naruto and Hinata, emerged from the radios, I have engaged Niji Hyuga and Tenten. They are currently neutralized. I want all of the sergeants, even those on perimeter duty or on break to assist you in eliminating the shinobi out there. 
Yes, ma'am, the gray Shizoku barked nervously, then added, You heard the general. The four Shizoka still at the corners of the fence moved forward, and a heartbeat later, two more exited the house. The outside guards converged on Choji, and the other two split up between Hinata and Ino. Ten Ten caught the reaper's trident with her wakazashi, and brought her ziffos down on the wooden haft of the pole arm. But despite the enhanced edge of the leaf shaped blade and the extra chakra she sent to her arms, Niji's lover failed to even chip the chakra hardened oak. The reaper swept the lighter woman into the wall, and Tin Tin had to disengage to avoid being pinned. Her spear freed, the mummified fighter twisted and jabbed in a single motion, slicing Tin Tin's t shirt and lightly cutting the jonin's skin. Ninja arts, shuriken swarm jutsu, Niji unleashed the entirety of the first pouch of ninja stars Tin Tin had given him. However, instead of flying straight for the reaper, they darted and weaved towards her, like hungry mosquitoes. The reaper loosened the grip of her right hand on the staff of her weapon and rotated it in a cone, knocking five of blades into the wall. But the others hovered around her, waiting for an opportunity. The killer scared, annoyed that she allowed herself to be surrounded. She considered her options, but like the leaf ninjas, her actions were limited by both the hostages in the room beside her and the space in the hallway. The first shuriken darted in, and she deflected it. But a second used the opening, burying itself in a hidden stone headband, and a few centimeters into the skin and muscle underneath. She glanced around at the remaining five stars, and came to a decision. Raitan, magnetic charge jutsu, she announced without signing. Niji's blades wobbled, and then smacked weakly into her, clinging to the ninja shields covering her, without piercing the metal. The Hyuga Jonin frowned, and his lover stepped forward, hoping to get a strike in while the reaper recovered from her jutsu. But the guarding rogue brought up her trident, the metal blades only slightly slowed by her fading technique. Even as Niji's weapons dropped to the floor, the reaper intercepted Tenten's ziffos and redirected it into the hidden path of the wakazashi. As Ten Ten tried to untangle her arms, the reaper rotated and smacked the younger woman's right temple with the butt end of her trident. The blow was relatively weak, but was enough to make the leaf Kunoichi's eyes cross momentarily. Guki's general released her trident with her left hand and pointed it past the stunned Ten Ten at Niji. Raiten, thunder pressure jutsu, the ninja hunter announced. The white beam exploded towards the Huka Jonin, denying him time to adequately defend himself. Sweitun, Niji shouted, barely keeping the desperation from his voice as he expelled a mass of unformed water chakra. He then slammed his back against the wall as his key drew in what water there was in air. But the thunder pressure technique was based upon the sonic shock wave, not the electricity itself, so while the mist Niji generated weakened the attack somewhat, it did not slow or deflect the column as it would of most other lightning release arts. The beam clipped Niji's left shoulder, scraped along his chest, barely missed his raised chin, and finally struck the outside wall of the house with a dull thump that lightly rattled the structure. Niji, are you okay? Ten Ten asked as she righted herself, barely blocking a one-handed thrust to her heart. The reaper regained her two-handed stance, as the pale-eyed young man lurched away from the wall. I believe in a matter of moments, my entire torso will be bruised, he wheezed, focusing his Byakugan inside his body, and I have three cracked bones. But no breaks and no major organ damage. I am lucky she was not able to craft that jutsu properly. Perhaps I was not trying to kill you outright, the reaper countered smugly, or maybe I just didn't want to risk damaging this house. What do we do, the leaf Kunoichi asked, fending off a slash at her neck, I'm fighting with one A-rank weapon and one S-rank weapon, and she's matching me with still trading ninjutsu with you. And most of your ninjutsu are too destructive to risk in here. Hmm, Niji considered that. Other than the enfolding dome, the other rotation techniques would have hit Ten Ten as well, and the dome was more defensive than offensive. He did not think the Reaper would let him easily get into range for the eight trigrams, 128 palms. And as Ten Ten had said, most of his other ninjutsu tended to be wide range and destructive. Which again, would put his teammate and also the hostages at risk. As the leaf ninjas considered her, the reaper paused, a smirk invisibly lighting her headband-covered face. She touched two fingers to her neck, and her radio beeped in response. Captain, she spoke smugly, I have engaged Niji Hyuga and Tenten. They are currently neutralized. 
I want all of the sergeants, even those on perimeter duty or on break to assist you in eliminating the shinobi out there. Yes ma'am, the answer returned quickly and crisply, you heard the general. Have you come up with a new plan, she asked her opponent sardonically, and the leaf ninjas grimaced angrily at her. No, the kidnapper prompted, in that case. Griffin's claw, spinning talons. The sword-like tines of the reaper's trident began to rotate, each along its central axis. As the blades picked up speed, even to Niji Spiakogan, they looked like cylinders instead of blades. The reaper hopped forward, driving her triplicate drill at Tenten's stomach Choji had been mildly relieved when the red Shizoku had been retasked with fighting Naruto, leaving him four of the returning scouts instead. Three of them seemed winded, they were all of the less skilled blue cast, and none of them had an active jutsu that would destroy the earth technique that was protecting his hands from their blades. The new battle had been going well. Akimichi's first attack had knocked down the largest renegade, and he had been slow to stand. Two of the others had tried to move in closer, but they had quickly learned the partial expansion jutsu was adaptable in its range. Still, they had escaped without any major damage. The last returning scout tried to hit Choji with a fireball jutsu, but his earth-jacketed hands enlarged enough to stop it with only a minor warming of his palms. Then the order came from inside the house, and six more Shizokas joined the battle. Choji grimaced as the Grey Warrior instructed four of those to assault him. He knew the former perimeter guards had been watching the fight. The large Takujo considered his human boulder technique and rejected it because if he aimed at them, he might continue through the fence and into the house. Instead, he closed his fists and swung the expanded dustem up jutsu at them like a hammer. But under the dirt and stone, his fingers were secretly signing. Ninja art, pitfall jutsu, Choji said, having maneuvered six of his opponents close enough together with his strikes. The ground dropped out from under them, and the six blue soldiers plummeted into the sudden hole. He split his hands, and attempted to smash the remaining Shizokas. The first dodged, but the second held her ground. Ninja art, giant's muscles jutsu. Her body appeared to strain against her uniform suddenly, and she caught Choji's huge fist with a grunt of effort. He held fast, and she lifted him into the air, swinging him towards the pit. Akimichi ended the enlarging jutsu, and instead of his fists pulling back towards him, he was reeled into the muscle woman. An instant later, his free arm enlarged again and collided with the kidnapper's jaw. Is that it? Choji asked the Shizoku as he landed. The last of his opponents did not answer, and the big youth suddenly dove to the side, his instinct screaming. A kunai passed by where his head had been. He glanced back and saw Guki's warriors emerging from his trap. I thought that would buy me a few more minutes, he lamented softly yet angrily. So he lashed out wildly and rapidly, hoping to push them back and buy himself some more room to think. But when he spun his large, protected limbs in a giant double lariat, one of the blue Shizokas, the first one he had knocked down, burying a shuriken in Akimichi's left shoulder, narrowing missing his neck. Naruto caught the red Shizoku's gladius with Kitsune, while a shadow clone caught the grey Shizoku's original sword between scissored kunai. A third Uzumaki launched a kick at the captain's knee, but the grey soldier lifted his leg to avoid the attack and stomped down hard enough on the clone's ankle that it disintegrated. The fox-faced man took stock. Out of all the clones he had spawned, only five. For now remained, two with him sparring with the captain, and two trading ninjutsu with the lieutenant. He was finally starting to get a feel for the grey-garbed warrior's fighting style, it was based firmly on the hidden leaf style as he estimated, but had enough differences to give the former Jinchuriki a few surprises. Naruto had also noticed that the red Shizoku had been running short on chakra, but he had failed to prevent the renegade from consuming a food pill. Uzumaki vaguely wished he had one of the restoratives as well, having spent more chakra than he had planned. Lieutenant, the captain barked. Katan blade jutsu, the red Shizoku intoned, after narrowly avoiding one Naruto's cyclone spikes. His fire chakra flowed into his sword, and the blade burst with an extension of white flames. The heat pushed the original Naruto back, and Uzumaki summoned Kitsune's wind blade. At the same time, one of the clones attempted to block the burning sword, but it seared through his kunai and destroyed the copy in a puff of smoke. Ino tried desperately to escape her currently lone attacker. 
the newest Shizoku facing her was instead repairing the renegade's injured arm. And from what Ino could tell, was doing a fairly good job of it. Yamanka knew that the opponent she was fighting, the one who had patched herself up temporarily would be next, and if she could not prevent that, she would be facing three more or less healthy enemies. Rotation, Hinata attempted to push her four attackers away, but each of them managed to activate the Iron Guard Jutsu, and their hardened bodies were not noticeably moved or injured by her attack. She wondered if using a Shadow Clone had been a good idea, as her reserves were beginning to fade. You can't beat me, Naruto said confidently, Kitsune's wind projection cutting into the fire chakra around the second gladius and nicking the blade of the first. He had sent the last melee clone to help the other two keep the red Shizoko busy. Alone, no, the captain admitted openly, but all I have to do is hold out until one of your friends fails. Then my men will be able to make short work of the other two. And then you will be alone. Even you do not have the skills and energy to fight twenty warriors, all at least as skilled as a chunin. There are only seventeen of you left, Uzumaki shot back, and even if there were fifty of you, it wouldn't be enough. If I didn't have to converse my chakra to get Nyoko home, he added silently. We will see, the captain said smugly, sweeping aside the staff blade with his borrowed gladius and slashing the other at Naruto's unguarded stomach. What are we going to do? Ten Ten caught the spinning blades of the Jifen's claw with her paired sigh, and the clashing metals threw a cloud of sparks into the weapon's mistress's face. An earlier strike had snapped off the blade of her Ziphos, and the younger woman had stored her wakazashi and switched to the sturdier, more defensive weapons. The irony that each sigh was like a miniature, blunt trident was not lost on the leaf kunoichi. Ten Ten pushed their locked weapons upwards, attempting to kick out at the reaper's knee. The killer borrowed the momentum, forcing their armaments higher still, so she could bring the opposite end of the pole arm to intercept the jonin's leg. We withdraw to the lower level, Niji decided, if she follows, we will have more space to fight her in the main room. If not, we go outside and help our comrades. Then, once we have defeated her minions, the six of us can deal with the reaper as a group. Okay, Ten Ten agreed reluctantly, and both leaf ninjas darted for the stairs. After a moment's contemplation, the kidnapper followed. As the reaper was halfway down the stairs, the Huga Jonin fired the eight trigrams empty palm, shooting a heavy recliner at her alongside the force of the jutsu itself. The ninja hunter swept down her triplicate spear, carving through the chair and also splitting Niji's jutsu. She skipped over the caltrips Ten Ten had deposited on the last two steps and landed on the floor facing them. This is much better, the reaper agreed with Niji's assessment, swinging her staff weapon more broadly, before pointing it at Ten Ten again. Hinata and Choji had been pushed back to back by the respective five and eight Shizokas they were fighting. The result was mixed for both sides, neither leaf ninja could be attacked from behind, but their movements were also limited. In addition, Hinata could protect Choji with the eight trigrams enfolding dome, but her chakra reserves were flagging. She had already reduced the amount of energy she was sending to her Byakugan, reducing its active range to just over 100 meters. The Kunoichi blocked a set of Raitan shurikens with Jinmaki, the bracers neutralizing the electrical attack. Behind her, Choji's latest punch was blocked by the gladii of three of the renegades, and one of the blades managed to cut through his earthen gloves and slice shallowly into his skin. As he withdrew his arms, he set more ki into the jutsu protecting his hands and wrists. We aren't doing well, are we, he said to her softly. Niji and Ten Ten should be able to handle the reaper, Hinata whispered back, we just have to hold out for them. The reaper of ninjas? Choji prompted more loudly, the woman who nearly killed Naruto and used to work for the Akatsuki? That was her voice, she ordered the remaining Shizokas to attack us, the pale beauty confirmed, catching a kanai aimed for her hip. She turned the spade-shaped dagger over and fired it at its owner. The sergeant dodged, and two of his comrades unleashed fire-release techniques at the Huga heiress. Hinata could not dodge without leaving Choji open, so she expended more of her dwindling energy in a double-purpose art. Dotan, Stone Spear's Jetsu, she intoned, and the rocky eruptions blocked the bolts of flame even as they forced the Shizokas to dodge or be impaled. What if Niji and Ten Ten can't handle her? Okimichi asked carefully. Two trios of throwing stars flashed towards him, and he brought up his arms, letting the steel dig into the dirt and rock. 
the blue Shizokas finally came to the same conclusion that the red lieutenant had as soon as Choji had used the dust em up jutsu, the earthen gauntlets had to go. Three of the sergeants began to craft seals for water or air techniques to negate Choji's protective art. I mean, she supposedly taken out the gods only know how many jonin in the past, right, the huge Takujo added, taking a sharp blast of wind to the chest rather than let it dispel his doton art. The disrupting attack barely cut through his heavy t-shirt, but did draw a few drops of blood. I don't know, Hinata's voice was touched with worry as she considered his statement. Naruto rolled backwards to avoid the converging swords. He then jumped forward, catching both blades with Kitsune, and scissoring them back towards the grey Shizoku's chest. But the captain was able to redirect the force of all three weapons past him, to his right. He attempted to kick Naruto in the ribs, and Uzumaki spun narrowly out of the way of the attack. Naruto's last clone faced the red Shizoku warily. The copy had received only a pittance of chakra when his final comrade had been destroyed, and he was not sure he could shape more than one or two mid-rank ninjutsu before he ran out of power and dissipated. But the crimson-clad warrior only stared back speculatively, and the duplicate speculated his opponent was nearly out of key as well. Except he won't go poof when he runs out of chakra, the clone reminded himself, and that would leave the other me alone. He wondered briefly about the face of the man who had pushed him this far, even if the leaf ninja facsimile and his brothers had been fighting in less than ideal circumstances. That doesn't matter now, he banished the speculation, I have to take this guy out, so the other me won't end up fighting two on one. Naruto catalogued the ruby renegade's moves briefly. The lieutenant had used mostly wind and water jutsu, occasionally mixing the two into ice release arts. But he had also used two katan techniques, once each. As the red Shizoku drew a kanai, the clone decided on his last move. Futon, Cyclone Spikes Jetsu, the copy fully signed the technique, judging that the increased chakra efficiency was worth the cost in time and in his opponent's recognition of the attack. The Shizoku quickly crafted his counter. Swayton, blocking wave Jetsu, the lieutenant summoned a small wall of water to absorb the darts, panting slightly from the effort. Gotcha, the copy of Naruto thought triumphantly, while out loud he incanted, Dotan, Stone Claws Jutsu. Though he did not use the hand seals, Uzumaki's mastery of the technique was nearing the point where he did not need them. And the clone poured every scrap of chakra he had into the Jutsu, even though it resulted in his destruction. Seven limbs of stone tore out of the ground around the wheat stalks and grabbed onto the red Shizoku. Their granite talons, drawn from the bedrock under the topsoil, sliced through the renegade's uniform and into his flesh. They wrapped tightly around him, pinning his arms to his sides. The exploding clone grinned happily, as Gookie's follower grunted in surprise. What were you saying about not being alone, the original Takujo asked smugly. Don't get ahead of yourself, Naruto-san, the grey Shizoku chided, then called out, Sergeants, kindly free the lieutenant when you have a chance, and provide him with a food pill if he is out. I still have my supplies, the red-clad warrior gasped weakly, the rocky arms compressing him, making it difficult for him to breathe. The clone just surprised me with that suicide maneuver, he added roughly, as if trying not to sound totally incompetent. Two of the blue Shizokas surrounding Hinata and Choji stepped back, believing their comrades had the two leaf specialists contained, and raced over to their trapped senior. Ino stepped to the side, and launched an elbow at the injured Shizoku's solar plexus, again succeeding in driving her away from the healer. So far Yamanaka had managed to keep herself between the self-patched solider, and the healer and the restored rogue. If she could force her opponent to keep the ikkyur graft in place, it would continue to drain her chakra, and her actions would cause her wounds to slowly worsen. Unfortunately, Ino was so intent on her strategy that she failed to notice the Shizoka's pattern until she bumped into the stone wall Hinata had risen earlier. Damn, she immediately placed one foot against the barrier and dove forward. She barely escaped the healer sergeant's attack, an outstretched hand wrapped in an ominous purple aura. But her flight took Ino out from in between the injured warrior and the medic. The repaired blue Shizoku turned and struck at the leaf chunin again, while the healer began to work on his ally's masked wounds. Hinata and Choji finished their subtle orbiting of one another, so that now the larger Takujo was facing away from the farmhouse turned prison. Are you sure about this? He moved his lips, but no sound emerged. Instead, she read his words with her Byakugan. 
If these guys know that iron guard technique too, I'll have left you alone for nothing, he added silently, his expression anxious if they hit you. I'll be fine, she reassured him softly. He nodded resolutely, and then glared at the Shizokas before him smugly. Choji hopped, and his body expanded almost instantly as he pulled in his limbs. Human boulder jutsu, he shouted before tucking his head in. The Akimichi was already spinning when he hit the ground and tore through the crops as he rocketed towards the three sergeants. Doton, stone jacket jutsu, one of the blue-clad soldiers incanted fearfully, but Choji shattered the rocky shackles even as they formed around him. Another of the Shizokas managed to leap away, but Akimichi's two remaining targets were both hit directly and bounced away. Though his actions punched a hole through the Shizoku's formation, the two rogues who had freed their red comrade returned to plug the gap, and they all started to close in on Hinata, cautious of her rotation techniques. Naruto also found himself surrounded, with the humiliated lieutenant moving in behind him, looking for payback. Shock wave jutsu, the reaper announced, swinging her trident in front of her. An arc of energy emerged in the wake of her blades, flashing towards the leaf teens. Eight trigrams, in folding dome, Niji attempted to stop the attack, but the defensive sphere only delayed the wave. The moment the Huga Jonin ended his art, the reaper's strike continued, moderately weakened. Power trap jutsu, Ten Ten sent her chakra into her paired Sai, and caught the force attack with them. The leaf kunoichi was pushed back, but the reaper's jutsu could not overcome the younger woman's technique, and after a few seconds it dissipated. Ten Ten was left panting from the combined physical and spiritual effort. Ten Ten, are you all right? A hint of deep concern touched the male Jonan's normally flat voice. He turned his head towards her briefly, though his Byakugan continued to watch the Reaper prepare another jutsu. I'm fine, her tone did not match her statement, I'm just getting, huh, just getting my second wind. I fear it is too late for that, Niji told her, and the Reaper's seal slowed, as the hunter tilted her head in interest. We must withdraw, the leaf field commander informed his teammate. But where? Ten Ten said curiously, we don't have a safe house in the area, and they will probably try to track us anyway. I do not mean a temporary retreat, he elaborated, I think we should scrub the mission and return to the village. What? Ten Ten stammered in shock. If we flee before we waste any more energy, we may have a chance to escape. And if we provide her with the intel that the Reaper is working for Guki, and that the hostages were unharmed, the Hokage may forgive our transgression. I thought we were going to wait for Hinata and the others, his lover prompted nervously. Hinata, Naruto, and Ino are all in precarious positions, Niji's eyes flickered towards the closed front door, and both women realized he was watching the other battle as well, and while Choji has broken free, at Hinata's expense, I am unsure he will be able to turn the tide alone. If we act now, we should be able to help them to break free, so that we can all get away from here. What about Nyoko? Ten Ten demanded, and the Earth Prince? If I believed our deaths would help them, or that there was some other course of action available to us, I wouldn't be suggesting this. And you think I will just let you escape, the Reaper sounded amused as she interjected. In response, Niji turned away from her and chose a spot in the far wall between two of the support beams. Eight trigrams mountain crusher, he barked, thrusting out his right hand. The column of force broke through the wall, leaving a nearly perfect hole, just over a meter in diameter. Both the leaf ninjas and the shizokas paused in surprise, as a portion of the east wall of the farmhouse exploded noisily outwards. Hinata tensed, having seen what Niji had said, and she found she was unable to disagree. A moment later, her cousin and his fiancé exited the building, and everyone turned to look. Ten Ten, Hinata, Niji barked without hesitation, Choji, help Ino. I will assist Naruto. We are leaving. Where are Nyoko and the Earth Kid? Naruto demanded, as he caught one of the gray Shizoku's blades, and dodged the other Gladius. Choji spun himself into a ball again and rolled towards the renegade healer. Still trapped, the Jonin leader answered, we were not able to get past the Reaper. He drove his chakra-laced finger towards the red Shizoku, who danced away. Regroup, Niji ordered tersely. Naruto frowned and complied. Ino slipped past the Shizokas when they scattered to avoid Choji, and she joined Niji and Naruto. 
how are we going to save them, the blonde Kunoichi questioned tersely. We are not, Niji explained regretfully, our chances of winning this fight are very low, and even if we were to be victorious we would not be in any shape to escort the hostages to safety. So we are evacuating. The reaper burst through the front door, as if to prove his point. Solo rising dragon, Ten Ten jumped forward, unwinding the scroll from her left hip, and pelting the Shizokas on Hinata's left with her weapons. Most of the renegades suffered only minor hits, but Lied Beauty was able to maneuver through the gap her friend created. No way, Naruto growled, we came all this way to rescue them. I don't like this either, Ten Ten agreed as the Leaf Ninjas finished regrouping, and the Shizokas shifted their attacks towards the unified teens, but Niji is right. There's nothing else we can do right now. Not to be a downer, but it doesn't look like they're planning to let us get away, Choji pointed out. The Shizokas were moving to cut them off, as directed silently by their leader. The Reaper indicated positions for her men with Griffin's claw while observing the injuries of the rescue party. Ten Ten, cover. At her lover's instruction, the Jonin Kunoichi unwrapped a specific section of her right hand scroll, and instead of deadly weapons, hundreds of smoke bombs scattered forth from the parchment. The air between the Leaf Warriors and the Shizokas became a solid mass of gray, and when it cleared, the teens were gone. Captain, Lieutenant, the Reaper hissed angrily, before pointing specifically at the healer sergeant and then at three other random blue garbed soldiers, and you four, take the royals to the hidden grass village. Gookie is there, checking on pain, so deliver them to your boss. The rest of you are with me. Without waiting to see if they complied, the shinobi hunter raced forward, following the teen's nearly invisible trail. Naruto's nose twitched, and he inhaled deeply. The breeze at their backs had carried a scent to him, and he frowned as he picked apart the odors. They're following us, he growled. The moment he said it, Hinata's eyes flashed briefly silver, and she shook her head. They're gaining on us, the pale beauty qualified. How? Ino snapped in annoyance, all of our intel says that the Shizokas are narrowly focused combat monsters, but that they suck at stealth, tracking, and anything else a ninja is supposed to do. The Reaper, Hinata said tersely. She did claim to have undergone a special, advanced version of the Shizoku training, Ten Ten informed her younger comrades. I doubt she needed it, Naruto interjected, given the number of ninjas she's hunted down and killed, she must have had at least some tracking skills before we ever met her. Niji recognized that they were neither making the best time nor doing a good job of concealing their path. But if we eliminate the Reaper, we may be able to escape from her men, the male Jonin pondered aloud. Then his expression became resolute, and he started to give orders. We will stop to ambush them when we reach those trees, he announced, Naruto and Hinata will disable or kill the Reaper, while the rest of us keep her troops from interfering. Can we assume our extra mission is over, too? Naruto asked his voice sharp with anticipation. The other ninja's eyes all focused on their leader as well. Yes, I think so, Niji said officiously, but with an undercurrent of smugness. I guess it's a good thing I snagged this, then, Choji grinned, holding out a scrap of cloth. It only took them moments to realize it was a pouch off a blue Shizoku's uniform. And when he showed them what was inside, they all joined in his grim mirth. The Reaper darted forward, her pace such that the slowest of her men could just barely keep up. She expected they would catch sight of the Leaf Ninjas in a matter minutes. Then she noticed an increase in the space between their tracks, indicating they had accelerated again. She expected it was because one of the Hugas had seen them. She signaled for the Shizokas to hurry up, and sent another burst of chakra into her leg muscles. Odama Raitan Raisingan, Naruto, and Hinata exclaimed in unison, forming the sphere of turbulent lightning chakra in the eight-foot space between the oaks they had hidden behind, their dark civilian clothing concealing them in the gloom of the overlapping foliage. The reaper's eyes widened behind her mask of headbands. She plunged the griffin's claw into the ground and vaulted over the deadly orb. She banished the trident as the apex of her assisted leap, so it would not fall into the raisingan. She called forth her weapon again as she landed, and turned to face the young couple. Naruto and Hinata had dismissed the energy ball and readied their own weapons to meet her. And here I was afraid I wouldn't get to see you too this time, she managed to purr and hiss in the same sentence, Sergeants, give us a perimeter, but don't interfere unless I give the order. What, did you forget about the rest of us? 
Ino complained, before intoning, Shadow Snap Jutsu. The blonde kunoichi drilled one kunai each into the silhouettes of two of the shizokas. They looked up at her, the angle of their faces and shoulders suggesting incredulity. They reached into their pockets for flash bombs, but Yamanaka had only wanted to hold them for a few seconds anyway. Ninja art, mind destruction jutsu, she yelled. Her psychic energy struck the trapped renegades, burrowing into their brains. All memories, all rational thoughts were burned away. Their skills were left mostly intact, and in place of their psyches was branded an almost animalistic notion that Ino was their pack leader. By the time the blonde Chunin severed the flow of chakra to the blades holding them, her new pets were already straining at their jutsu tethers. As they were freed, each let out a savage growl, drew his blade, and leaped at the nearest threat to his new alpha. The first attack Shizoku tried to craft a jutsu to trap her former ally, but she underestimated him. With no self-control or worry for the future, the brain-damaged warrior poured chakra into his legs with reckless abandon, damaging his muscles but tripling his speed for the moment. His sword bit deeply into the foe Kunoichi's gut, and he angled his head for her throat, trying to bite her neck, but failing thanks to his mask. The second betrayed renegade had more distance and less loyalty, he caught the feral rogue's gladius on his own, and then backhanded his opponent in the face. Ino's victim snarled as he scrambled back to his feet, incidentally dropping his weapon. The mentally sound Shizoku swept his blade out and took off the head of his mindless comrade. A second later, Ino's other target was felled in a crossfire of lightning and water jutsu. Naruto caught the trident's tines with his staff blade and then spun closer, trapping the haft of the pole arm between his bicep and his right side. The reaper started to unleash a jutsu at his exposed back, but was instead forced to surrender her weapon and somersault away, as Hinata interceded, Jinmaki's electric extensions stabbing towards the reaper's neck and back. As she landed from her retreat, the murderess extended her hand, and Griffin's claw reappeared in his palm. She unleashed her half-formed fire art at Naruto, more to keep him off balance than out of any expectation it would work. Uzumaki smashed the gout of flame with Kitsune. She really did get better, the blonde Takujo noted with bland surprise. There's no need to be cruel, Naruto, Hinata admonished him. What's going on here? Kuki's general demanded angrily, ten minutes ago you were running for your lives. Naruto just flashed a smug grin. We have Choji and one of your men to thank for that, Hinata offered, but she also had a sly little smirk on her face. What does that mean, the reaper demanded. We noticed some of your men taking food pills, always from the same pouch, Naruto boasted, and then when Choji used his human boulder to break their circle, he also tore that pocket off the uniform of one of the guys he hit. And those ten tablets helped us out quite a bit. The killer snarled and stabbed out at Uzumaki's face. Human boulder jutsu, the object of their discussion, practically sang the name of the technique as he rolled forward. His rotation was faster this time, and his structure sturdier, and the first two shizokas he hit did not bounce off, but were spun under him and crushed. Iron Guard, a third sergeant, tried to stop Choji as he had seen his comrades do, however this time Akimichi's forward motion was only briefly slowed. Instead, the Shizoku's arms shattered and a moment later he too was flattened by the large Takujo. The last blue-clad renegade in Choji's path was able to take advantage of the delay his fallen comrade had created and adjusted his tactics. He flung himself out of the path of the human boulder, and at the same time threw a kunai sidearm at Ino. The young woman took her eyes off her mind destruction victims just long enough to deflect the dagger, and then turned back her attention in time to see the first of the converted Shizokas be beheaded. Windblade, Naruto focused his energy into Kitsune with the verbal cue, and slashed at the reaper's weapon, attempting to sever one of the tines. The trident was tougher than he expected and caught the staff blade instead. Naruto changed tactics and leaned forward, throwing his weight against the locked weapons, trying to push her back. The Reaper forced their weapons down, and when Kitsune's tip hit the ground, she rotated the griffin's claw like a staff, sending the head of the pole arm away from Naruto to attempt to smash the back end into his skull or shoulder. Hinata stepped in and interposed her right arm cote. Naruto placed his free hand to her wrist, and the trident clanged harmlessly off Jinmaki, its momentum unable to overcome the couple's combined strength. The Hyuga heiress slid partially away from her lover, 
placing her back against the reapers and then drove her elbow into the older woman's side. But the layers of pilfered ninja headbands both reduced the physical impact of the blow and prevented Hinata's gentle fist from reaching the intended tenketsu. The murderess jumped away from the couple, leaving her weapon behind, and starting to sign. Ninja art, negative chakra wave, the reaper hissed, pointing her spread fingers at both Naruto and Hinata. Push, they countered in unison. The couple had been expecting the reaper's preferred attack, though they were moderately surprised by the upgraded version. Their counters each carved a furrow in the arc of inverted energy, protecting them. But the edge of the wave hit Choji, and Ino moved in to guard her paramour as he stumbled from the sudden loss of strength and ki. The five remaining blue Shizokas attempted to take advantage. Unfortunately for them, another of the leaf warriors had been waiting for them to group themselves. Ninja art, twin rising dragons. Tintin shouted as she jumped out of her hiding place and rebounded off a tree to gain height. Weapons rained down on the renegades, and only the one Shizoku closest to Tintin's original position was able to escape. The warrior closest to Ino and Choji was impaled by four kanai and seven shurikens. The blue-clad soldier behind him was only struck by one of each sort of throwing blade, but was also hit in the neck by a sledgehammer, and took a jin to the gut. As he fell, a kukri clipped the side of his head, and the curved blade ripped the cowl off of his face. The next sergeant caught one comma, but the second went into his left eye and he also took her gladius through the heart and a mace to the right knee. The last Shizoku in Tintin's range was hit by two kunai, a long sword, and a quarterstaff, before being nearly bisected by a demon windmill shuriken. The Jonin Kunoichi reeled back in her armaments as she landed on a tree branch. Naruto swung Kitsune horizontally at the reaper, adding to the reach of the wind projection to counter the length of her trident. The mummified killer responded with an opposing attack, and the spinning blades of her weapon arced towards Uzumaki's back. For a moment, it looked like it would be a mutual homicide. But Hinata appeared next to her beloved, catching the griffin's claw on Jinmaki. The reaper tried to bowl the pale beauty over with her greater leverage and mass. But the Huga Sion leaned back into her fiancé, who instantly adjusted his stance to support her. This reduced the force of his attack slightly, but he still cut through her armor, taking advantage of the damage previously inflicted on the trophy headbands. The green key cut into her flesh, but the reaper spun away before the wound became vital. Die, she hissed, reverting to bad habits in rage and pain. Lightning erupted from each of the three tines of her pole arm. Naruto and Hinata pushed off one another, so that the middle strike passed between them, and each blocked one of the outer bolts with their bonded weapons. Each had been crafted to stop weak lightning jutsu from being transmitted to the user. That only infuriated the reaper further. Meyer, she incanted again without signing, and the forest floor around Naruto and Hinata started to suck them in. The reaper fell back and remembered to sign her next jutsu. But the two warriors had been prepared for her move, and they sent modulated streams of chakra out of their feet, countering the pull of the mock. Naruto began to step forward, but Hinata took the moment to glance around, and she caught his arm. Naruto, look, her eyes locked on what her all-around vision had seen, the face of the Shizoku Tenten had accidentally unmasked. His gaze followed hers, and he frowned. He could tell the young man looked familiar, but the precise memory escaped him. Isn't that the cloud genin we fought on the movie set, she prompted, understanding his expression, the one who was riding the giant porcupine. Yeah, you're right, he exclaimed in remembrance. Then his brow creased again, and he pondered, why is a cloud ninja dressed like a Shizoku? Did he become a missing nin and throw in with Gukio, Kagasama? He nearly referred to Guki by the familial honorific, but remembered in time to change into an expression of extreme respect for one of the five shadows. It was hardly convincing given his normal manners, but no one besides Hinata seemed to notice. The last surviving sergeant stumbled away after narrowly avoiding Tenten's onslaught. Thought his face was still hidden, his body language spoke of extreme terror. How, he stammered, you were all so weak before. He took another step, half-turned, and froze. You? What are you doing here? His voice reflected dawning understanding. But before he could act on the epiphany, Niji stepped out from behind the tree the sergeant was staring at, and placed his hand against the stunned Shizoku's chest. 
8 trigrams, assassin's palm, the jonin intoned sending chakra out the tenketsu in his palm, stabbing repeatedly the shizoku's heart and the chakra network around it. The reaper's last soldier gasped once before he collapsed. Katan, cauterizing restoration jutsu, the reaper completed her technique, partially healing the gash Naruto had given her, and burning closed the rest of the injury. As she returned her attention to the teens, she caught up the fallen Shizoku's thought thread. What is going on here, the reaper demanded, pointed her spear at Naruto again, you were fleeing in fear a half hour ago, but now. You did give us a chance to recover, Naruto pointed out again. You also left your two strongest subordinates and your only medic behind, Hinata added. No, there is more to it, she stabbed out in anger, and Uzumaki blocked it easily. Hinata, Naruto, Niji called out, we will go on ahead. Don't worry, Uzumaki grinned, we'll catch up in a few minutes. The Reaper glared at Naruto, but switched her attention to the other leaf warriors. She watched in a fury as the six shadows faded amidst the widely spaced trees. Then her rage was replaced briefly by surprise. Six of them, she hissed, before stabbing at Naruto and Hinata randomly, you two are just shadow clones left to delay me. Wrong again, the blonde Takujo growled back, slicing his thumb to release his blood and then incanting, summoning Jutsu. A light orange toad, approximately the same height and twice the width of a warhorse, appeared behind Uzumaki. He wore a blue vest and had oddly smooth skin for a member of his clan. The amphibian glanced around warily, before addressing his ally Hei there, Naruto, the toad offered in a high-pitched voice, as Hinata cut through a water jutsu with one half of her kota and deflected the trident into the ground with her other protected wrist. Hey, Tatsu, the human male returned the greeting. What's going on? Gamma Tatsu asked, isn't that the reaper lady who tried to kill you and big brother Kichi a few years ago? Yup, Naruto agreed easily, blocking a kunai attack to Hinata's left side while his lover pressed Jinmaki down on the older woman's spear, attempting to disarm the trident. You need me to help fight her? The gentle toad asked fearfully. No, we can handle it, Naruto answered, we'll just need someone to carry her. Oh, okay then, the younger toad nodded sagely. Then he hopped back to observe from a safer distance. Not shadow clones, the reaper babbled wildly, stabbing and swinging heedlessly. Hinata took a solely defensive position, keeping her at bay while Naruto spoke to Tatsu. Then what, the crazed killer spun her trident at the Hyuga heiress's head, but was blocked again by Jinmaki. She continued to push down on Hinata, and then randomly kicked out, score a light hit to the younger woman's ribs despite their awkward positioning. Hinata grimaced slightly, and the reaper prepared to do it again. Naruto jumped in under the griffin's claw, catching the general's foot, and then slamming his elbow into the seared skin under the gap in her armor. The reaper coughed harshly, blood wetting her lips and the headband covering them, as something inside her ruptured. She released her pole arm and stumbled back. Sent shadow clones away? But why, she rambled, starting to sign almost unconsciously, wait. Six? He didn't see Niji? What did he see? Could it? Couldn't it? No, 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 and no, oh, and oh. She surged to her feet and roared, Katen, scorched Yarti. Two palms, Hinata darted past Naruto, and hit one chakra point each in the reaper's chest and right arm, destroying her jutsu before it could be unleashed. Four palms, eight palms, sixteen palms, thirty-two palms, Hinata mercifully ended with the weakened version of the Hyuga's primary art, and the reaper slumped to her knees. How? When? Why? she demanded weakly. Naruto stepped closer, and she appeared to grasp a few shreds of lucidity. She turned her head up at him, and struggled to find an open path to form a jutsu. You want to make this a game, demon spawn, she snarled more or less coherently, well, I'm not done playing yet. Yes, Naruto said almost kindly, you are. Kitsune lashed out, its wind extension banished, and clanged loudly against the headbands covering the reaper's temple. Gookie's general collapsed. Niji's team shuffled into the room in tight formation. As soon as they had been spotted on their way into the village, they had been met by an ANBU squad, who escorted them straight to Ops, and into the Hokage's office. Tsunade was looking out the window, her back to them, and Shizune shut the door tightly behind them. 
I received a report yesterday, she started, and despite her attempts to keep her voice even, hints of rage and disappointment crept in, Nyoko Hanakataheim and Aran Ishigamiyaji have been delivered to the Kuzagakure by two high-ranking Shizokas. And less than an hour ago, the rakage arrived in the grass village for a meeting with leader. Given the circumstances, I'm afraid you six are going to face some stiff penalties, for the sake of the royals and our village. You'll be lucky if this only costs you your careers. But Grandma Tsunade, you haven't even seen the souvenirs we brought you, Naruto interrupted happily. The last Sanin turned around to glare at him, and as she did, her eyes widened in surprise. Guki Namikaze and leader walked into the interior meeting room. Inside, the two kidnapped nobles were seated anxiously. The same red Shizoku and grey Shizoku, who had escorted them to the Kuzagakure from the grass safe house, each stood in a corner, watching their hostages carefully. The captain and lieutenant also held themselves nervously, and they straightened as the rakage and pain joined them. Good morning, Nyoko-sama, Aran-sama, despite the honorifics he used, there was something casual in Guki's voice, as if he were addressing peers or even juniors, it is good to see you again, though I understand if you do not feel the same. He observed them carefully, curious what as to how they would react. Each was thoroughly aware of the threats he had offered to their respective fathers. The young man looked down at his feet, obviously frightened, while the fire princess glared at him defiantly. Guki frowned, and stared at the earth daimyo's air more closely. Then the rakage surged forward and grabbed the boy's neck, lifting him out of the chair. He stared into the prince's eyes, and then exhaled angrily. Even as the breath left his nose, he casually tossed the boy into the wall with bone-shattering force. What is Gamatatsu doing here? the Hokage demanded, who is that woman? Is she one of the Shizokas? The woman in question was bound and gagged, and strapped onto the toad's vest. Even her hands were tied down, so she could not move her, her fingers. Lacking rope, the leaf ninjas had used the steel cable from Tenten's shuriken string jutsu and strips of cloth from shirts the teens had sacrificed to complete her bindings. She was dressed in one of Hinata's dirty t-shirts and pairs of shorts, Ino and Tenten's apparel had been too tight across the captive's hips and bust, so Naruto's lover was forced to make a sacrifice, though their height difference left the older woman's toned and scarred stomach visible. Their prisoner had dingy, poorly conditioned, and slightly ragged blonde hair. She possessed a thin, hawkish face. Her bright purple eyes stared at them lividly, promising that if she could have moved, she would have slaughtered them or died in the attempt. Kinda, Naruto smirked as he answered non-committally, it would probably be easy to just show you, Grandma Tsunade. The blonde Takujo reached into his backpack, and with a cacophony of clanking metal, extracted what appeared to be a shirt made out of ninja headbands. That's. The Hokage's eyes widened further, and Niji concluded her thought. Our first prisoner of war, and Guki Namake's newest private general, the mission leader explained, the so-called Reaper of Ninja. That's. Tsunade slumped slightly and shook her head, that's commendable, but it's not enough to get you off the hook. What about us, a sharp voice prompted from the midst of the closely packed ninja teens, are we going to be enough? Nyoko Hanakata, though initially amused by the overprotection and the deception it engendered, had grown tired of waiting, and she elbowed her way out from amidst her friends, dragging her younger peer with her. All right, the Hokage growled angrily, start talking. The moment he hit the reinforced wall, the Earth Prince exploded into a cloud of chakra smoke. Guki turned his attention back to Nyoko, chuckling slightly. As I might have expected, your impersonation of Nyoko-sama is flawless, the former leaf ninja nodded and smiled, Naruto Uzumaki Kuen. What gave me away, in another puff, the princess vanished and was replaced by the number one knucklehead. Initially? You weren't frightened enough, Guki answered cordially, that poor child was so afraid of me, he would literally start shaking at the sound of my voice. And on closer examination, the granite pattern in his hair wasn't quite right, and that other clone was about a centimeter too tall. You are a shadow clone as well, are you not? Yup. That is quite impressive, maintaining a clone for, what is it now? Thirty-four hours? Just about, the copy Uzumaki confirmed, but the real Naruto has been taking food pills and splitting off other clones, so when they cancel themselves, the two of us got a recharge. Still, that is a clever usage of the shadow clone technique, Namikaze congratulated the younger shinobi, 
but I wonder why you went to all the trouble? Niji thought if your people thought they still had Nyoko and the Earth Prince, they wouldn't follow us, Naruto answered, and the grinned as he continued, I guess he wasn't counting on the Reaper. Then Uzumaki's expression hardened, and I agreed because I wanted to meet the man who was brother to one Hokage and student to another, but still chose to betray the Leaf Village. And, what do you think, the rakage smiled in genuine amusement. Well, you aren't creepy or sinister like Orochimaru, Naruto mused, sounding almost confused, and you're not like Madara either. But I think you might be more dangerous, because you seem like a nice, reasonable guy. That sounds like what Sarutobi sensei told me, Guki chuckled, when he offered me the position of Hokage. Then why are you doing this? Guki Namikaze regarded Naruto for a moment, pursing his lips and tilting his brow in thoughtful confusion. Then he shook his head no. I could try to explain it to you, the renegade said, but I think you are too much like Yuki Hana to ever understand my point of view. He spread his hands apologetically and asked the younger man, is there anything else you wanted to know? About me, personally, that is. I guess not, Naruto grunted, I suppose it would be too much to expect you to tell me anything too useful. I may be a reasonable man, Cookie agreed, but I am no fool. Your presence here means I will be clashing with the Hidden Leaf Village soon enough, and I see no reason to offer Tsunade Sensei any more ammunition. May I ask you a question instead? I suppose, Naruto said nervously. What do you think of my brother? Guki asked openly, what is your opinion of the man who made you into a Jinchuriki? I used to be really confused, Naruto answered honestly, while tucking away that one important fact, I idolized the guy, but I also kinda hated him for what he did to me. Used to, the elder Namikaze prompted, but not anymore? No, Naruto confirmed, I've had it beaten into me that sometimes a leader has to make impossible choices. And I also learned my life isn't that bad at all. In fact, it could have been a lot worse. The renegade leader nodded. You might also be more dangerous than I initially suspected, Naruto Uzumaki, Guki stated, but without Naruto's worry at the admission. The two men observed each other for a moment, and then Uzumaki clapped his hands together. Pain and the Shizokas tensed for an attack, but Naruto just grinned. Release. The duplicate vanished, and Guki chuckled at his subordinates. You knew he wouldn't attack? Leader asked dubiously. His manners and speech might be rough, but he has a strong sense of right and wrong, Namikaze confirmed, ending a polite conversation with an assassination attempt would have been bad form, especially when he knew he did not stand a chance for on one. The rakage sprout creased in thought, but now that I see him up close, I wonder who his mysterious father is. His coloring could be from the Yamanaka clan, but somehow he reminds me of Minato. Could my brother and Yukihana have kept something like this secret from me? Payne recognized a rhetorical question, and Guki shook his head to clear away the musings, I'm not sure that that matters at this moment. But rather, I think we need to figure out what to do with you too. His eyes seemed to darken as he turned to face the red and gray Shizokas. Okay, let's go over this one more time, to make sure I understand it all, the Hokage glared at them in wonder after the younger ninjas finished explaining. First, you sent an Ino and Choji, the Sanin medic indicated the first couple, to pretend to try to sneak in, so they could draw some of the guards outside and try to see if there was anything your Byakugans missed. They were supposed to stall for 15 to 20 minutes, and then accidentally blow their cover. Expect this lunkhead almost gave us away too early, Ino affectionately punched her lover in the arm. After that, Naruto's blood clone and Hinata's shadow clone joined them to engage the Shizokas, Tsunade continued, they were intentionally drawing out the fight, both as a distraction, and to get more information on the Shizokas' combat abilities. That was the most dangerous part of my plan, Niji conceded, if Hinata's clone had been hit, or if either of the duplicates had run out of chakra, the guards could have figured out what we were planning. But my clone did let them tag him a couple of times, to help sell it, Naruto boasted, and they lied about you and Tenten, while the two of you snuck in to deal with the remaining guards, the Hokage continued, your job was to get them away from Nokoheim and Aranaji, so the real Naruto and Hinata could rescue them and Naruto could replace them with his transformed shadow clones. Well, we were going to just take out the guards to clear a path for Naruto, Tenten explained somewhat defensively, but when we realized it wasn't going to be that simple with the Reaper there. She even broke my Ziphos. 
so we went with Plan B instead. And you believed that if they thought you had failed to rescue the hostages, they would not pursue you, Tsunade concluded. We expected some pursuit, Niji countered, but I thought it would be more a perfunctory action, not a full mobilization. In the end, that did work, if not so well as I hoped. The Reaper did follow us, but she did not call for reinforcements. Still, it seems unnecessarily complex, the Sanin pointed out, pretending to try to talk your way in, only to pretend to fight your way in, only to have two different groups sneak in, one of them another distraction. It was a complicated plan, the team leader agreed, but I also thought it offered the greatest chance to rescue the prisoners without putting them at risk. I calculated that by the time they encountered Ten Ten and myself, the last two they had not seen, they would believe we had run out of gambits. The six of us would have been hard-pressed to defend both Nyokoheim and Aranaji if every Shizoku in the grass had been hunting us. Better to trick them than to fight them. There you go, Grandma Tsunade, Naruto grinned triumphantly, we not only rescued Nyoko and Aran, Sama, but we found out all about how the mid-level Shizokas fight, what kind of ninjutsu and taijutsu they use, and how good they are with their gladii. And on top of all that, we caught one of Guki's generals. Tsunade's frown forced Uzumaki to add an honorific to the name of the Earth Daimyo's son, and after that she settled down, nodding. She signed briefly, and pressed the call button on her intercom. Shizun, the Hokage summoned her assistant, and the younger medic hurried into the unsealed office. Gitabiki Marino, the last Sanin instructed, we have a new prisoner for him to talk to. And prepare a dispatch to the village hidden in the stones. Shizun nodded, and vanished from the room. You all have done very well, the Hokage congratulated them, I want you to stay here until Ibiki arrives to collect the Reaper. After that, escort our guests to the Octagon Shuriken. I will arrange for the eight of you to stay in one of their suites. I want you to continue to guard Nyokoheim and Aranaji until preparations are made to return them to their parents. All of the shinobi nodded, and both of the royals looked happy, Aran for the continued protection, and Nyoko for the chance to send more time with her friends. You have failed me, Guki informed the Shizoka sadly. The red-clad soldier tensed visibly, while the grey-clothed captain exhaled in defeat and nodded. Do you wish us to commit seppuku? the ranking Shizoku asked evenly, or will you claim the honor of our deaths yourself, Gukisama? Namake's eyes widened in surprise, and then narrowed in annoyance. He studied them carefully for any hint of mockery, but all he could read from their stances was fear and resignation. His glare softened. What do you think I am, some sort of B-movie villain, he asked, disappointed. You did say you failed me, Payne offered, with a hint of amusement. Gookie could not suppress a chuckle and inclined his head in acceptance. Then he sobered again and faced his anonymous underlings. That can't be the only reason you expect lethal punishment, the rakage prompted them. The two warriors remained stock still and said nothing. Explain, Gookie ordered forcefully, and both started talking at once. Stop, Namikes raised his voice over theirs, and after they shut up, he instructed, Captain, tell me what would make you think I would demand your deaths. Madara Achiha, the grey Shizoku answered. Though she was not present, both Guki and Payne could all but hear Conan interject, a B-movie villain if there ever was one. I understand that was how Madara treated the lower echelon members of the Akatsuki, Namikaze frowned, but that is no reason to expect that foolish behavior from me. Again, the rakage watched as they fidgeted without refuting or affirming his statement, and he asked darkly, Am I to infer from your silence that Madara's murderous leadership has not ended? It has not, the red Shizoku said bravely, Achi Hasama has been known to execute our comrades who have failed their duties. The grey Shizoku could not repress a derisive snort, and Guki's wrathful glare turned on the captain. What does that mean? Namikaze asked in clipped tones. It means Madarasama has occasionally killed Shizokus who technically succeeded, but did not live up to his expectations. Guki snarled under his breath, and both Shizokus took a step back. The rakage forced his anger back down and addressed them regretfully. Payne and I will be having a discussion with Madara, he informed them firmly, but you have my word that none of my followers will be killed for failing a mission, unless it is the result of a willful betray. Follow the strictures, try your best, and you will not be subjected to capital punishment. All right? Both nodded thankfully. Good. 
please spread the word to your comrades, he requested, if Madara, or any of my generals or even a higher-ranking Shizoku attempts to execute them improperly, they have orders for me to fight back or escape. Thank you, Gukisama, the red Shizoku sighed in relief. Now, for your punishment, Guki continued, I am thinking you will each be docked two weeks' pay and spend two weeks working with the Tan Shizokus. They bobbed their heads, happy to receive the minor censure in place of what they had been expecting. Over the next three days, all missions in the village hidden in the leaves were suspended. And every Kanoha shinobi who returned from a job was instructed to remain in town and on high alert. But whatever reprisal the Hokage was suspecting never materialized, and at the midpoint of the fourth day, a different sort of invasion reached the ninja stronghold. Thirty-six foreign ninjas entered the Kanahagakur, five four-man teams from the village hidden in the stone, and four identically configured teams from the village hidden in the sand. The leaf ninjas carefully confirmed the identities of the three dozen shinobi, before allowing them inside the walls. They were met by the Hokage and six squads of chunin or higher-ranked leaf soldiers. Tsunade stepped forward to greet the leader of the escort battalion. Welcome to the Hidden Leaf Village, Mitsuru, the Sanin offered her hand to the Tsuchikage, who shook it gravely. Thank you, Tsunade, the weathered woman said. Then she shook her head, I have plotted many ways I might enter this village, but never anything like this. I see Gara provided you with an escort, Tsunade commented, leading her fellow leader towards the Leaf Operations Center. Yes. He knew I wanted to provide a suitable protection detail, without stripping my resources along the grass and rain borders bare. Of course, he also wanted to make sure I was not tempted to stray while in the land of air. And, I suspect, he also hoped the presence of the sand ninjas would prevent you and I from brawling as soon as I arrived. Tsunade nodded with a slight grin, knowing the last was thin joke. Despite any lingering enmity between the stone and the leaf, both the current state of affairs and the presence of the Earth Prince would prevent the erstwhile alliance from breaking down. But even with that, as the three sets of ninjas walked through the streets, they naturally fell into formation, with the sand ninjas standing between their stone and leaf counterparts. How is Aransama? the Tsuchikage asked carefully as they moved through the deliberately emptied boulevard. We have given both royals every test we can think of, the Hokage answered, they were not poisoned or drugged. They do not have any sort of implants. They have not had any fuinjutsu placed on them. Nyokoheim's free will and psychological profile are unchanged, so she was not subject to any brainwashing. We do not have the information to confirm that with your prince, but from what we can tell, he has not been tampered with either. Other than some natural mental trauma, both appear fine. I suspect Guki was true to his word. Mitsuru nodded, but said, No disrespect to your people, but we have our own tests we would like to run. I would expect nothing less, Tsunade agreed, in fact, I would request that your people check out Nyokoheim as well. That is, if you don't mind myself or my assistant observing. You understand, only to assuage my daimyo's fears. I believe something can be arranged, the stone leader's face creased with a slight grin. Then she added more seriously, We owe you and your people a great debt, Tsunade. Both for rescuing Aranaji and for freeing us to act. What do you intend to do next? the Hokage prompted. Once we have returned home, I will call for another meeting of the Conclave of Shadows, the Tsuchikage stated firmly, I intend to call for another vote on Yasuo's proposal that Guki be removed as Rakage. It sounds like the Fourth Great Ninja Wars is about to begin. The earth and fire countries are no longer restrained, Guki-sensei, Payne's leader body reminded his master, should we withdraw our troops attacking the sound village and the snow countries, and strengthen our own defenses instead? No, the rakage said confidently, we need to accelerate our plans. If we can complete a conquest of the rain, mines, and sound villages before the others get organized, we can begin converting the survivors of those villages and arrange a strong defensive line right into the heart of our opponents. Then we should at least retreat from the snow, Nagato's proxy reiterated, we can send those to brigades to the land of rice paddies. Daimyo Koyoki has strong ties with the mist and especially the leaf, Guki countered, if we do not at least keep the snow village tied up on defense, we might end up with a fifth powerful opponent. Don't worry, Nagato, the surviving Namikaze grinned expansively, we can maintain our advantage, so long as we don't lose momentum. 
I am not happy about this, Tsunade glared out the window at the stark landscape of the hidden sand village. There is nothing we can do about it, Yasuo tried to mediate, we could have expected the claws and star villages to opt out for now. That's not what I meant, the Sanin denied, though she still sounded disappointed, given Guki's actions so far, it's hardly surprising the smaller villages are laying low if it keeps them out of his line of sight. She slammed her hand down on the map and explained, I'm talking about this. The Leaf Village should also be sending aid to the Land of Snow, not focusing all our troops on the Land of Rice Paddies. Especially if the Sand Village is also going to assist the Sound Village. The Leaf Village should split our troops for both of our besieged allies. That would leave you short on defensive teams, Gara pointed out. The Rice Paddies country is critical, Mitsuru explained more thoroughly, because the Hidden Sound Village is small, and even now is still recovering from the Civil War, Guki has been able to sneak supplies and troops to the waterfall and grass under their noses. If he takes control of that country, it will be that much harder to stop him. And on the other hand, if we reinforce them, we can cut off his support of the nations he has already taken, and his efforts to conquer the rain country. Which will help my people in our efforts to reinforce the hidden rain village. Tsunade nodded unhappily. It galled her to leave the fate of the second strongest ally of the Land of Fire in the hands of another village, she also knew they had to consider the broader picture if they were going to win the war. Have you learned anything from the Reaper yet? The Mizukage shifted the topic. No, the Hokage shook her head in disgust. The others frowned at her reaction, and the Kazakage asked what the others were thinking. Why do you say it like that? Because someone did some pretty crude tampering with her mind to try to make her sane, the medic explained angrily, some sort of drugs to alter her brain chemistry and some powerful, probably illegal, genjutsu to reshape certain aspects of her personality. Losing to Naruto and Hinata seems to have partially undone whatever they did to her, Tsunade continued regretfully, to the point where she almost seems to have dissociative identity disorder. She keeps flipping back and forth between Guki's rational and lucid general and the raving ninja hater. Unfortunately, that has made it much harder for our interrogators to make any headway with her. Of course, we don't even know if she knows anything useful. Is there anything we can do to help? Yasuo offered. Not really, the young seeming woman shrugged, not unless you have any new breakthroughs on treating paranoid schizophrenia or dissociative identity disorder. I believe the prescribed treatment for both of those conditions is a battle to the death with Naruto Uzumaki, Gara stated with only a hint of ironic sarcasm. The other three leaders all chuckled appreciatively. Yeah, well, she's had that treatment a few times now, Tsunade shrugged, and she seems to have a natural resistance. We'll just have to keep working on her with traditional methods. If there is nothing else, I believe we should adjourn to our respective homes to prepare our assault forces, Mitsuru rumbled after their brief moment of mirth faded. The others nodded and gathered their materials off the table. Conan padded silently into their shared room, hoping Negato was already asleep. Not because she did not want to see him, but because she knew he needed the rest. But he was not in their bed. Instead, he sat at the table in the center of the room, his eyes closed and his elbows were on the table, both hands propping up his chin. That position seemed to accentuate the three bars of black metal piercing each of his forearms, the six pieces of galvanized chakra each represented one of the paths of pain. As the sliver of light cut through the darkness, his eyes flashed open, their rinnegan glowing in the shaded room. Chagrined, she quickly shut the door. I'm sorry, Negato, she whispered, I did not intend to bother you. You could never bother me, love, he smiled tiredly at her, and extended his left hand towards her. Conan tiptoed over and sat opposite him, carefully lacing her fingers with his. Her heart ached looking at him. In the dim illumination he looked almost like a skeleton. There was no meat, no weight to him. He looked like his pale skin and the oddly accentuated sinew underneath were all that held him together. Every time she touched him, she was afraid she would break him. It had been months since they had had a proper hug, more or less. Conan, his more insistent prompting broke through her thoughts. Sorry, she smiled at him at him, and despite her best efforts, there was something wistful to the tilt of her lips, what were you saying? I was telling you what has occurred in the hidden grass and hidden rain villages, he said, frowning at her in concern, is everything all right? 
she almost laughed at the irony of his question, but she kept her composure and just sighed instead. I just have a lot on my mind, she offered vaguely, sorry. I'm sure, he nodded understandingly, trying to rein in Madara, controlling the cloud ninjas in Guki sensei's absence, testing the new Shizokas, and directing the attack on the Land of Snow. It is unfortunate that all of the Grey Shizokas are in the field. Hopefully we can find a few more captains, so you can offload some of those responsibilities. What about you, she countered, a sliver of concern leaking out, your animal path does just as much in the cloud village as I do, plus you have to run the grass village, and you are commanding the attacks on the rain, sound, and mines villages. You have more to worry about than I do. But I have my six paths, so I don't have the same level of mental strain as a normal person, he told her kindly. She sighed sadly, but she nodded. Then she half stood, leaned over the table, and kissed him tenderly. That may be, she forced herself to agree diplomatically, but even you have limits. So if you need a rest, or if there is any other way I can help you, tell me. I am your partner. I will, he said sincerely. The primary outpost of the village hidden in the sound was a valley surrounded by the treacherous mountains that rose amidst the fertile fields that give the land of rice paddies its name. There were three ways to reach the ninja town without battling the snow-covered and wind-battered peaks, but only one was commonly used. On the western side of the mountains there was a series of caves, and two sets of unconnected tunnels lead into the caldera. The larger of the two was the primary entrance into the hidden sound village, and could fit three people at its smallest point. But it was also a maze, filled with natural young chakra. It suppressed all light and vision, torches, lights, and illuminating jutsu cast a much smaller glow, and consumed their respective fuels much faster. The only safe way to navigate it was with a series of special tuning forks all sound ninjas carried. The other cavern was further north, and more difficult to find on both ends. In the past it had served as Orochimaru's private entrance. A few months after Kabuto's flight, scraps of information lead the true sound warriors to the hidden tunnel. Like the primary caves, the second path was a labyrinth, but it was also far narrower, with many sections of tunnel only a person with an average or slender build could slip through. The final entrance was a pass through the eastern side of the mountains, though calling it a pass was generous at best. Most of the year it was partially blocked by snow. The snow made the already unstable cliffs more slippery, and covered many random drop-offs. Even in late August and early September, when the blanket of white finally melted, the path was only wide enough for two people in many places, and the treacherous terrain remained it difficult to bypass. The Shizokas invading the hidden sound used all three of the entrances. They had multiple tan warriors camped out in the caves, using high-powered portable searchlights to overcome the gloom and guide their comrades and the higher-ranked Shizokas who used the tunnels dropped off extra batteries with the guides to keep the route through the cavern lit. And above ground, the mountain pass had been cleared and stabilized by red and blue Shizokas using repeated and reinforced earth and fire release arts. So while they could not move in en masse, Guki's forces trapped the ninja university in between two slowly growing attack fronts. So far the sound village had held on, but the Shizokas were appearing faster than the real ninjas could remove them. Along the southern side of the mountain, the invaders established a set of seven camps. They held reinforcements and medical units for the invaders, and also acted as waypoints for the troops and supplies moving through the land of rice paddies to the other countries Guki had attacked. As the allies of the Sound moved into the besieged nation, they targeted those camps first. Counting from the east, the Leaf Ninjas prepared to attack the second and fourth camps while the San Shinobi targeted the sixth camp. They chose this tactic to isolate the four remaining temporary bases so they could not easily consolidate their forces and mount a strong counterattack. The central Shizoku station was the mission of the smaller of the Leaf Strike forces, currently less than one-fifth the size of the other team. Though that was certain to change once the signal to attack was given. Naruto Uzumaki crouched, his legs aching to spring forward. His fingers were already crossed in front of his chest, chakra flowing into them. Next to him on the front line was Akameru, with Kiba Inazuka on the far side of the giant dog. And both the ninja hound and his human were similarly tense. Approximately one dozen paces behind them and more widely spread apart, Hinata Fuga, Sasami Fuma, and Shino Aburame formed the second line. 
and slightly further back waited Sakura Haruno and Yugo Yuzuki. The elder Jonin was their mission leader, and she waited for the signal. And the master medic had her bow drawn and was using a jinjutsu to lengthen her field of vision. The enemy camp was held over thirty of Guki's troops, mostly green Shizokas, but with a few of the weaker tans and stronger blues were mixed in the group. And a single red-clad lieutenant ran the camp, directing his subordinates without knowing what awaited him. Their tents were pitched against the base of a high, sharp, and concave cliff face, giving them a 120-degree arc of protection. Yugo Cellular, currently in calm mode, beeped a certain complex pattern, and the former ANBU agent signaled Sakura even as she pocketed her phone and began to sign. The first arrow struck the renegade leader in the throat and passed through so quickly and cleanly that it made almost no noise, and the lieutenant did not notice his own death. The projectile continued through the taller brown-clad solitaire behind its main target, perforating the private's right lung. Finally, the shaft buried itself in the rock up to its fletching, the clang of steel on granite attracting the attention of those nearby. Before the red Shizoku even started to slump, a second missile hit his heart and again pierced both him and the tan Shizoku behind him, this time striking the junior warrior's stomach and spine. As the second arrow hit the wall, Yugo's Jinjutsu took hold of them. The Shizokas heard and saw the cliff splinter and start to collapse towards them. They broke ranks as they attempted to avoid the illusionary falling rocks. Sakura's attack acted as a signal to her friends, and Naruto and Kiba each released the jutsu he had been holding ready. Multi-Shadow Clone Jutsu Paired Transformation, Canine Sapiens Jutsu How long do they intend to keep this up, one of the assembled Shizoku lieutenants complained, staring out of the tent at the snowstorm. Cookie's troops were protected from the blizzard by a series of linked domes of wind and fire chakra. The overlapping hemispheres were being maintained by the blue and green-clad warriors. They not only kept out the cold, but washed away the melted water crystals, forming a small stream behind their encampment. Normally at this time of year the weather in the northern country was more mild, especially now that the reflectors the previous daimyo had helped design and build moderated the frigid winds rushing down from the uninhabitable regions closer to the pole. But the snow ninjas were using a massive cooperative ninjutsu to trap the Shizokas, forcing the invaders to use their own techniques to stay alive. It doesn't matter, one of the two grey-masked captains countered, once Konandano returns with the third brigade, we will be able to blast through this annoyance and capture the capital of this god's forsaken country. The other captain just rolled her eyes, though her allies could not see it. This was the same conversation they had had the previous day. Even though the Shizokas had the numerical advantage, the snow ninjas were stronger on average, this was their territory, and they were fighting fiercely to defend it. The junior Grey Shizoku doubted it would be as easy as her fellow officers expected, even with the general and additional warriors. This isn't just a stall, she thought to herself, and not for the first time, the snow ninjas must be planning something. But her comrades did not agree with her, and the other captain had seniority, so unlike the previous day, she kept her opinions to herself. And even though the others had dismissed her fears, she had sent five greens into the storm. Three had not returned, and the two who did had been severely frostbitten and had been unable to find the boundaries of the weather-altering jutsu. For now just have your teams continue to keep the domes up, the mail captain ordered, switch out every hour to avoid exhaustion, and keep an eye out for anything fishy. He inclined his head towards her slightly, as if he had heard her thoughts, and she nodded in thanks. But as the red started to disperse, two blue Shizokas ran into the tent. Captains, the lead sergeant shouted without prologue, the storm is thinning. They must have realized they can't hold out like this, one of the lieutenants smirked. Maybe they ran out of chakra, another suggested. Or they have finished whatever they were preparing, the female leader could not hold her opinion, or this is a trap to lure us out before they start up the blizzard again. Let's go find out, the ranking captain stated neutrally. As they exited the tent, the difference was immediate. The sun was shimmering overhead, and the wall of the city was fading into view through the thinning snow. Do we attack? one of the more conservative red Shizokas asked. No, the female brigade leader's eyes widened under her cowl. At first she had thought the snow village's barricade was closer than she had remembered. Then she noticed it was white rather than grey. 
A second later she realized she was looking at a 15-foot-wide mass of ice and snow built up between the village and the invaders. Are they trying to invite us in? The arrogant red Shizoku chuckled. We can just melt stairs into the snow and walk over their defenses. Idiot, the female captain snarled as she turned around. Her eyes tracked the rivulet of runoff they had created, to the point where a wall of ice had been crafted from the liquid, twice as high as the wall of the fortress they were attacking and at least as thick. And on top of the improvised barrier there were people. Her eyes narrowed as the lieutenants gasped and swore around her. She could barely make out hidden mist headbands on the newcomers, and estimated there were at least eighty of them, more than enough to shift the advantage of numbers away from Gookie's men. She was already signing as she heard the rumbling from the direction of the city. Ninja art, frog legs jetsu, she intoned, shooting almost seventy feet straight up. She sailed above the oncoming the avalanche and noticed both red and blue Shizoka signing desperately. She flattened her body to slow her fall, as the rolling snow hit the ice stop and began to settle. She rolled as she hit the new ground, her uniform covered by the flakes, but her chakra keeping her from sinking. Around her, a few dozen other Shizokas dropped out of the sky, mostly from her unit. And moments later, another thirty or so warrior burrowed their way free. In the end, just over a quarter of the original besieging army escaped the avalanche, though the captain suspected there might still be some others alive but without the jutsu to free themselves. Before she could act to test her theory, the mist and snow ninjas converged on the survivors with matching roars. Well? Hiba demanded. I had two kills, Hinata answered, recalling her former teammate's predilection. As did I, Sasami noted, also having learned of Inazuka's desire to keep score. Only one reached me, Shino said flatly, not caring for the ritual, but also not considering it worth the hassle to deny the dog trainer. I had the first two kills, Sakura shrugged, but none of the others got past the second line. I took out thirteen of them, Naruto tabulated from his clone's memories. Ha, Kiba barked smugly, Akamaru and I had seventeen. Naruto dropped his head in defeat, but as turned away, he grinned slightly. Hinata sidled up next to him, and laced her arm with his. That was kind of you to do, she whispered to him proudly. What? Uzumaki countered with false humility. I know you let Kiba win, she said softly, and that you let those other four slip past you so he wouldn't be upset about letting the first one get past him. Well, I didn't just do that for him, Naruto scratched him cheek in chagrin, I also didn't want you, Sasami, and Shino to feel left out. And that is part of why I love you so much, she informed him, before kissing him quickly on the cheek. I love you, too. The rest of his reply was cut off, when Yugo's portable crackled to life. This is Team Shuriken, Shikamaru's voice emerged, and his tone was unnaturally urgent, we hit position too, but we have a problem. They had about twenty extra men, including one with orange hair and the Rinnegan. Pain already took down Aoba and Rado. Rado is stable, but Shizun isn't sure she can save Aoba. Choji, Choza, and Hana are holding him off, and Enko Sensei and the others are dealing with the Shizokas. But if they can't beat him, we might be. Naruto's eyes locked intently on Yugao's face as the transmission cut off. Go, she nodded. Uzumaki darted away in a flash of golden fur, and before he was out of her range, Hinata saw him palming a pair of food pills. The small army of stone shinobi slowly approached the rain village. There were no signs of any invaders, Shizoku or otherwise, although the moderate drizzle that was assaulting them could have cleared away some slight level of evidence, like the footprints they would have expected another ninja to leave. The water-aligned city looked peaceful, though the river beside it did not. The rain village had two natural barriers protecting it, the high plateau to the south was the lesser of the two. The modern village was bounded on the east by the most dangerous waterway on the continent. It was wide, yet also deep, and the near-constant rain and the elevated ground from which it originated generated a high speed currently rife with turbulent rapids. Even the most skilled of shinobi could barely stand on its surface, walking more than a few steps was effectively impossible. The river flowed briefly past the village, and the curved back to west, providing only a small strip of land between it and the north side of the town. In addition to the defenses provided by the terrain, the Amage Kira was surrounded by a huge iron wall, taller and thicker than any other man-made barrier on the continent. 
the land of earth ninjas could see the tips of many smokestacks of the industrialized town over the reinforced metal. As they moved closer, the Tsuchikij's men were gripped by a feeling that something was off. Not only were the enemies they had been sent to fight missing, there were absolutely no signs of battle, nor was there any sort of reaction from the village. Even those who had not attended a Chunin exam at the rain village had heard stories of the almost paranoid manner with which the mid-tier shinobi outpost treated its guests. That they had not been acknowledged spoke louder than the absence of Shizokus. The field commander of the stone ninjas ordered his men to fall back, and asked his second to contact the Tsuchikij and keep her informed. After that, the middle-aged Jonin approached the city cautiously. He padded forward gingerly, his hands and fingers spread apart in a universal gesture of non-aggression. Suddenly there was a loud humming sound, as if someone had plucked the string on a giant guitar. The sound echoed over them again as it was joined by a loud whistling. A giant boulder, almost four times his volume and ten times his mass, landed just two feet to the right of the stone Jonin. The second projectile landed an equal distance off his left. You are not welcome here, stone ninjas, a voice announced, turn back now, and we will let you leave in peace. We are here to provide assistance in your battle with the followers of the renegade rakage, Goki Namikaze, the rock country shinobi did not flinch, but his eyes searched the wall for the speaker. Then you have come here under false pretenses, the rain spokesman countered, Goki Namikaze is the rightful rakage, and the land of rain has recently, willingly, joined him in his pursuit of a better world. Finally, the stone ninja's verbal opponent stepped forward. He was tall, slender, with bright orange hair and blue ringed eyes. On his brow was a hidden rain headband with a furrow carved messily through the insignia. Pain, the elder Jonan rumbled, what right do you have to speak for the hidden rain? As the one who killed Hanzo, the right to lead the rain has been mine for some time now, the Deva Path answered, though I have just recently claimed it. The rain ninjas follow me, and as I'm sure you know, I follow Gukisama. Now I ask you again, please leave before the situation escalates. The Land of Earth warrior backed away cautiously with a frown, and once he reached a safe distance, he turned around and strode hastily towards his comrades, drawing out his phone as he went. Put me through to the Tsuchikij, he instructed before the operator could even offer him a greeting. Shikamaru, what's going on? Naruto growled slightly as he ended his flash step next to his genius friend. If the Nara Chunin was surprised by Uzumaki's sudden appearance or his ascendant fox form, he did not let on. We finished mopping up the Shizokus, the shadow user reported, but there were more reds and greys than we expected, so it took a little while and we have some casualties. Ino and Shizun are patching up the survivors now. That's not why I'm here, the blonde youth interrupted impatiently. I figured, the other man shrugged, Pain managed to break Choji's arm and Hannah brought him back. Ino's dad and Anko-sensei took their places. He seems to be like the one the Takamichi twins killed, except this time he's more wary of poisons, and he hasn't been letting Anko-sensei get close. They've drifted into the forest to the north. Chosa-sen ordered everyone else to stay back, until they can figure out a way to deal with the guy. Naruto nodded and grinned darkly, stating, I guess it's a good thing I'm under Yugao's command instead of Chozo's. Shikamaru chuckled briefly and nodded his understanding. The vulpine Takujo sampled the air and then disappeared again. He landed in a tree and continued forward on foot, taking another pill to restore his rapidly depleting chakra. It took him only seconds to reach them, just in time to see Pain stop Chozo's massive fist like it was nothing and backhand Enko towards a tree. Naruto appeared in between his staff blade teacher and a broken spine, catching her gently, and supporting her as they both dropped to the grass. You okay, Anko-sensei? Naruto asked, managing to sound concerned despite the natural growl his altered form instilled in his voice. I'll be fine, the jonin snapped slightly, then amended with a blush, now. He just knocked the breath out of me, no major damage. Chosa's been pulling his punches, so Pain's not as strong as he could be. But thanks for the save. What are you doing here? Chosa frowned, I ordered everyone to stay back. Yeah, but Yugao is my mission leader, and she told me to take this guy out, Naruto said sprightly, and Enko snorted in amusement. Pain turned to face Naruto, and the Takujo was relieved that it was was not anyone he recognized. The orange hair, rinnegan, and control rods in the nose and ears were the same, 
but this incarnation was short with a modest build. His face and the exposed sections of his arms were a road map of scar tissue, and this pain only had one eye, the right socket was empty and half of the lid was chopped away, giving a clear view of the fact it cleared out to the bone. That your new unbreakable path? Uzumaki turned his attention to their opponent. Though the body was different, not only were the powers the same, but so was the smell. The youngest warrior drew his staff blade, deliberately scraping the steel post of the weapon on the metal trim of the scabbard in an intimidating manner. Pain shuddered in spite of himself, as both the Nagato and Naraka path portions of his merged psyche recalled the damage Naruto had done to his prior incarnation, as well as the destruction of his previous human path. He snarled with anticipation and tensed to attack. Then his face creased as if remembering something else unpleasant, and he relaxed. Well? Naruto prompted, confused by Pain's reactions. Then the Shizoku's general clenched his fists again and reached for the weapons on his belt. But instead of the warhammer or a kunai, he pulled out a pair of smoke bombs and dashed them on the ground. Naruto charged recklessly into the smoke, but Kitsune met with nothing. Though the screen of ash interfered with his nose, he still was able to track Pain's path downwards. He went underground with a doton jutsu, Naruto estimated based on the motion of the odor and the slight rumble he felt, do you have a Hyuga on your team? Choza shook his head, and Uzumaki glared at the ground again. Damn it, Naruto sighed, allowing his transformation to lapse. Damn it, Nagato growled. What is it? Conan asked in surprise at his sudden outburst. Naruto Uzumaki, he said more calmly. Conan nodded. She had been present when Guki had ordered Nagato not to fight Naruto alone, unless it was with his deva path. The Rakage rightly believed none of the other paths had a significant chance of defeating the former Jinchuriki one-on-one. -on -one. Guki decided the impact a path's destruction had on Nagato, the difficulty with replacing a path, and the loss of the instantaneous communication between the pains outweighed any potential to remove the young man. Nagato believed Guki was letting his belief that Naruto might have been Minato's son influence the order, by agreed to avoid Uzumaki nevertheless. If he had not been there, I could have taken out a large chunk of the leaf command structure, the true pain told his lover, instead I was only able to kill two of them and injured three or four others, before I was forced to retreat. But you were able to escape, she prompted hopefully. Yes, he nodded slowly. And the land of rice patties? Naruto did not appear out of nowhere, he pondered, which means that there were at least two teams of leaf ninjas. We will need to confirm, of course, but I believe we will find that the siege of the sound village is under a counter-assault, of not totally broken. Then maybe you should put your Nakara path to sleep until Guki-sensei returns, she suggested carefully, trying not to sound too eager. I can't, he sighed, stone ninjas have approached the rain village so I intend to take the initiative and send my Naraka path to the Land of Silver. Once we have the Mines Village, we can reinforce our other conquests and if needed, divert more troops to the Land of Snow. Speaking of the Land of Snow, she started regretfully, I don't have much more time. I need to return to the Snow Village with the 3rd Brigade. Their last report said that the Snow Ninjas had us pinned down with deadly weather. At least with Madara and the Akatsuki, we weren't separated as frequently, she whispered sadly. He took her hand, and her anguish only deepened, feeling the weakness of his grip. I should not have kept you, Nagato said. Take care of yourself, she instructed, try to eat more, even if it doesn't agree with you. I'll be back as soon as I can. He nodded, and she ran out of the room, before she decided to delay again. The scouts returned with bizarre and worrisome news. A massive wall of ice, now slowly melting, had been erected near the Snow County's capital, and judging by its position, it had been behind where the two Shizoku brigades had camped. But on the other side of the wall, the field was empty. There was no sign of nearly two hundred soldiers she had left behind. Conan knew that could have meant that Guki's men had been victorious, and were now occupying the city. But she also had had no contact from them, which meant that unless the captains had decided to surprise her, the frigid barricade and empty field boded ill for the origami kunoichi and the warriors marching with her. She silently signaled for the Shizokas to pick up the pace. The wall was just as the forerunners had described it, not quite twenty meters tall, five meters thick, more than one hundred meters long, and softened around the edges by the warm weather. 
water trickled down the barricade, forming into a small stream that flowed on the side of the cobblestone road in a trough designed specifically to channel the runoff. Conan ordered the Shizokas to stay back and cautiously approached the barrier. She was already holding a dozen sheets of paper in each hand and was ready to channel Chakra into one of the stronger Katan scrolls under her shirt. As she drew closer, she felt a tingling between her shoulder blades. She wrapped the pages in her hands around her wrists and then began to sign slowly and deliberately. Ninja art, illusion sever jutsu, Conan violently dispelled all foreign chakra from her body and grimaced at the result. The wall remained unchanged, but the other side of it was not clear. Instead a mass of snow was piled against the huge barricade, and here and there she could see the body of a tan or green Shizoko crushed against the ice. But that was not the main source of her frown. Ice makes an excellent medium to focus a genjutsu, Kid Mizuno said, stepping away from the frozen barrier, but not a comfortable resting place. The face of the hidden mist, Conan noted neutrally, does that mean your people are responsible for this? The snow ninjas did most of the work, the platinum blonde explained, channeling the storm, getting the snow ready for the avalanche. All my people did is take the melt water your men provided, and build it into the backstop. But without the wall, Conan noted the snow would have spread further, the impact would have been less, and more of my men would have been able to flee from the avalanche. Keed shrugged in false modesty, refusing to take the bait. Conan felt another impulse in her spine, but his time it was like a cold finger running up her back. This is still a trap, Goki's student realized, and she unleashed two paper kunai at the Miss Jonan. The origami blades hit her chest and neck, and the Mizukage's daughter collapsed, the water that had formed her clone joining the stream. Conan began looking around, calling up a handful of sensory enhancement techniques. She expected one of two things from their opponents, either they had prepared to bring the wall down and send it crashing into her forces, or the snow and mist ninjas were in the process of surrounding them, using the wall to keep them contained. Her mind raced as she tried to determine which plan the allied ninjas would use. If they were going to crush her forces under the ice slab, she needed to order her men to scatter and run. But if the trap was to box in her brigade, then she should call her people to the wall, to create a defensive line and start looking for a place to break through. Seconds ticked by and she did not find evidence of either plan. The wall was sturdy enough to withstand multiple tons of snow and would take a focused effort to bring down in the manner she was anticipating. But there were no signs of paper bombs or snow shinobi preparing to launch such an attack. Nor could she see any enemy ninjas taking up position around her men. Unless they just expect us to run and don't want to put themselves at risk, she considered. The thought of retreating was tempting. With only one brigade, she no longer had a numerical advantage over the hidden snow, and that was not counting however many mist ninjas were present. And the mass of ice and snow before her represented a tactical advantage for the local shinobi, who were skilled in both navigating and using the material. That was part of the reason Guki and his students had decided to wait until the end of spring to attack the northern country, they wanted the thaw to be in full effect. Conan looked back and noticed some of the Shizokas were getting restless. She doubted they would make a move without her orders, but she also knew that if they were unfocused, it would make things easier for the other side, especially if there was a trap. The Kunoichi jogged back to her unit and signaled for the captain and lieutenants to join her. The gray and red masked warriors hurried over, obviously unsettled by her indecision and the nervousness of their underlings. We are alone here, she informed them, the snow ninjas received reinforcements from the mist, and they destroyed our comrades. It was a total rout, the captain seemed slightly incredulous. I can't say that there were no survivors, the general answered, but if there are, I doubt they are in any position or have the numbers to help us. What are we going to do, the youngest red Shizoku asked, a tremor in her voice. Conan recalled the girl had been a young but promising cloud chunin before she had been converted. The paper user reflected that talent and physical ability could not prepare one for the reality of war. We will withdraw carefully to the ship and sail out a few kilometers, Conan ordered, once we are comparatively secure, I will contact Gukisama and discuss what options are open to us. The high-ranked Shizokas nodded, many obviously relieved. But their commander felt just the opposite. She wondered why the snow and mist shinobi had not made a move yet. 
though she had considered the possibility that they would be allowed to leave, she did not feel it was actually likely. It would be foolish of her opponents to let such a substantial force leave when the other side held all the cards. She continued to ruminate as they proceeded slowly to the shore. The Shizoku Brigade was not hindered, nor could they detect anyone watching them. Their transport was waiting for them, and despite her choice of words, the vessel was a modern iron ship with a pair of coal-powered engines instead of sails. The boat was built for speed, and was a tight fit for the one hundred warriors, but they packed on without complaint. A trio of former waterfall shinobi quickly engaged the motors and steered the ship back out to sea. Conan joined them on the bridge, and once they out of the line of sight of the land of snow, she used the radio to call home. Conan, it seems too early in the day for this to be good news, Gookie's voice stated amiably, have you made landfall, or was there a delay? No, we made it to the snow capital, she answered sadly, but our other forces were wiped out. It seems the village hidden in the mist has come to the aid of the snow country in my absence. We retreated to the ship and are in open waters, waiting for new orders. Good. Gookie seemed to agree, but then his voice crackled and faded. Conan? One more word emerged from the static, and then the connection was gone. Another chill went down her spine, and a moment later, an impact rocked the boat. Conan ran out onto the deck in time to see the first dozen mist ninjas peel away as the second wave moved in. Each oceanic shinobi was standing on the back of an oversized dolphin, and they were signing in concert. As they completed the concurrent jutsu, a seven-foot-tall scimitar of water flashed across the intervening space and shook the entire ship as it sliced halfway through the vessel. The water was tinted red around the two cuts from the Shizokus killed by the attack. The ship was starting to list badly, and the red Shizoku who served as the ship's captain despite not holding that rank began to give orders. Seal those compartments, weld them shut if you have to, he barked, I want anyone not keeping us afloat on deck, countering those tsunami blades or taking out the mist ninjas. Conan found herself next to the gray Shizoku and red teen she had recognized earlier, as a third set of mist warriors surfed closer. Gookie's warriors attempted to follow the mariner's orders, but most of them would have been unstable with the rocking of an intact ship and could barely aim on the damaged transport. And the mist ninjas were in their element. The third tsunami blade hit the ship unimpeded. As the first squad of mist raiders began their second run, the remaining lieutenants plus a handful of sergeants finally made it to the rails and began to rain fire and lightning on the ninjas and their summoned mounts. But before they could release their jutsu, a small explosion hit the other side of the ship. Most of the attacks went high or low, and only one mist warrior was hit. More impacts kept them off balance. Who's watching the left side? The greyclad leader roared, and a number of middle-ranked warriors staggered over to look. Snow ninjas, a blue Shizoku reported. Organize another team to counter, the real captain ordered. It's too late, Conan murmured, as the fourth, if slightly smaller, liquid sword carved another furrow in the damaged ship. They're out of range, the sergeant countered, their floating paper bomb covered ice balls into us. I'm sorry, the origami kunoichi whispered. She grabbed the young lieutenant and pulled her close, and reached for the captain. But the grigarbed warrior pulled away. Ma'am, what are you doing? He hissed softly, having caught her words. I'm leaving, and I'm taking you two with me, she stated firmly. With all due respect, I'm staying here, he stepped back. Captain, everyone on this ship will be killed or captured, she said angrily, I'm not even sure I have enough paper to take both of you, but we can't afford to lose high-ranking officers, either and I cannot risk being taken prisoner. Nor can I die, I still have someone I must protect. He did not respond, but ran over to the far side of the deck and began picking off ice mines with a fire jutsu. Conan admired his loyalty, and considered ordering him to accompany her. But she suspected he would rather take the consequence for disobedience, and she was not going to deny her men an able hand. She consoled herself by rationalizing that there was a better chance to escape with just the two of them. Hold on tight, she ordered the young woman, and the Shizoku complied nervously. Conan dove over the side of the ship, and as she did, her paper flowed out from her pockets and from under her uniform, taking the form of a large shark around them. The waxen chakra treated pages repelled the water, and the parchment predator rocketed away from the doomed vessel. 
Koyoki Kazahana handed the spyglass back back to Kid Mizuno. The two women stood on the beach, observing the destruction of the second invasion force. And a handful of snow ninjas stood close by, apparently not trusting the allied Kunoichi quite enough to leave her alone with their daimyo. The Miss Jonan glanced surreptitiously at the other woman, judging her reaction to the second slaughter in less than a week. It is an unpleasant way to handle this, the actress noted, controlling her tone, but it saved lives on our side. I thank the Hidden Mist Village for their rescue. In this case, you don't need to, he keyed shrugged, snapping shut the collapsible telescope as the port side deck of the ship reached the level of the ocean, the conclave of shadows has decided to do whatever it takes to remove Gookie Namikaze and to protect those he has chosen to attack. In that case, I will make a deal with you, Koyuki said officiously, for every mist ninja who remains here to help defend my country, I will send two snow ninjas to assist in putting an end to this struggle. Up to half my available forces, that is. The face of the mist nodded. Though she might weaken her overall defenses, the snow daimyo was decreasing the likelihood Guki would attack her again by putting more pressure on other fronts and also by making it so any attack on the snow would also be an attack on the mist. And at the same time, Kazahana was also not entrusting her country wholly to her allies. I'll need to confirm with my father, the Mizukage's daughter qualified, but I have little doubt that he and the other Kagas will find your proposal acceptable. After leaving the Red Shizoku with the medical corps, Conan marched quickly to the Rakage's palace. She all but ran through the halls, ignoring the servants and Shizokas who hailed her, until she reached Goki's war room. Then she paused, settling herself, and smoothing the water-wrinkled edges of her uniform. She took a deep breath and carefully opened the door. Welcome back, Conan, Namikaze greeted her immediately, as if he was expecting her. The Kunoichi had thought she detected someone else in the room, but her teacher was all alone. She stepped into the chamber and closed the door. I was saddened to hear about the loss of the three units sent to secure the Land of Snow, he told her, but I was pleased you were able to escape and save at least Lieutenant Tashiji. It is unfortunate you could not bring Captain Makuto as well. I tried, she admitted, still shocked by his ability to remember the names of every one of the supposedly anonymous Shizokas, but when I asked him to join us, he decided to die with the others instead. I could have ordered him, but if he refused. I understand, Guki nodded. I am sorry, Guki-sensei, she bowed deeply, I lost three brigades, and have allowed the snow and mist to join forces. None of that is your fault, he reassured her magnanimously, we never had a hold on the mist to begin with, so even without the conclave's edict, the snow still could have asked them for help. Even if you had left on schedule, there is no guarantee the 3rd Brigade would not have been caught in their avalanche trap or been able to break the snow's defenses before they launched their trap. She caught the minor barb, but straightened nevertheless. She faced him with a slight frown of confusion. You are taking this better than I expected, she admitted frankly, between this defeat and what Negato told me about the land of rice patties before I left. Well, the invasion of the sound ended better than we knew before you left, he explained, we were able to inflict some losses on the leaf and sand invaders, and thanks to Naruto's presence forcing pain to retreat, the captain and lieutenants there also ordered a withdrawal, and almost two-thirds of expeditionary force survived. But more importantly we have had two other major successes, the rakage said contentedly, the rain surrendered sooner than we expected, and we were able to take control of the village before the stone ninjas arrived. The unexpected need to deal with the rain's defenses caused them to delay, giving us a chance to secure our hold and improve our position. That further encouraged them to hold off their attack. The stone shinobi are preparing their assault, but we will be ready for them. In addition, the land of silver collapsed with almost no resistance. We caved in one of their mines, and the two dukes convinced the king to surrender without resistance. They were not ready to fight us, an opponent who was not after their mineral resources. Her eyes flicked over to the map on the table. The dispersal of their forces had changed, and those victories and the additional conversions had almost made up for the lost Shizokas in the Land of Snow. With these four battlefronts concluded, there is something I would like to ask you, Guki-sensei, Conan switched topics carefully. Nagato, right? Guki said, with a hint of sadness and exasperation. With things the way they are now, Surely you can spare a few of the paths of pain for a day or two, she pleaded desperately. 
We have been over this before, Conan, he said kindly, I rely on pain. His instantaneous and untraceable communications are a tactical advantage. If two or three of my generals were to disappear for days at a time, it would have a negative impact on moral. And pain is what is keeping Madara in line. The first Uchiha has been growing restless and confident again, and without the paths of pain, I think he might actually be foolhardy enough to attack me. Guki smirked and shook his head, not that the possibility worries me, it would just be easier to avoid the battle and the troubles it would cause. But he is so weak, she argued, even at the height of the Akatsuki's hunt for the tailed beast two years ago, he never had all six of Pain's paths active for so long. He barely eats, there is nothing to him. And he sleeps so often. Nagato is tougher than you think, the rakage said firmly, and I know well the cost Pain takes on him. Don't forget, I am the one who helped him transform that random power into a formal jutsu. You are just overprotective. It is understandable, given what the two of you went through before I found you. Besides, you don't have to worry, he tried to reassure her, so long as at least one of Payne's path's lives, Nagato will remain, at least after a fashion. Now if there isn't anything else, I need to work my new plan for the Sound Village, he dismissed her, and then turned back to the map, muttering, now that I have full control over the mines and rain, they will be expecting a pincer attack over land from the east and west. But an attack from the sea? Conan's eyes narrowed, and she glared at her second teacher from a moment. Then she swallowed most of her anger, and spun around and left. I don't think she was convinced, Kahaku detached from the wall, partially unclothed. Conan believes in our dream, as much as Nagato does, Guki looked at his wife dubiously, she knows Nagato does this willingly. The Jinchuriki shook her head, wondering if her otherwise brilliant husband was letting himself be blinded by trust. But she did not want to argue further, so she went back to draping herself over her husband, trying to distract him while he planned the coming battles. She claimed the dichotomy helped his creativity, but Guki suspected she was just feeling ignored, and promised himself he would indulge her once he finished revising their strategy to resume the broken sound siege. Do you really think your people can reach the waterfall country by sea, and still be in time? Tsunade asked Yuseo Mizuno. You will have to travel around the lightning country, she continued, tracing the course on the map, and Guki has increased the patrols of the northern waters. You honestly think the cloud ninjas can match my people on open water, the Mizukage was more amused than insulted by her doubts. Of course not, the Sanin confirmed, but whether your men avoid them or fight them, it will increase your travel time. I can't deny that, he agreed amiably, but I can send new troops to the snow, and my daughter and her new allies go to the waterfall. Then they can bring with the snow reinforcements, once we decide where. Lady Tsunade, Gunma burst in, using the jutsu-bonded key that would let him bypass the seals on the Hokage's office once. The Sanin started to glower at her temporary aid, until she saw the expression on his face. Lady Tsunade, you need to come to the front gate immediately, Gunma panted. The Hokage shared a look with her peer, and then the water and fire shadows both followed the Tokubetsu Jonin. The slender, lime-haired Kunoichi breathed carefully, trying to keep her skin away from the wakizashi at her neck. Next to her, her teammate, a short chunin with legs slightly too large for his body watched the blade ready to stab into his heart. Conan stared passively at the other seven leaf ninjas who had arrived after her intrusion. She kept the captured gate guards between her and their comrades, with each of her paper srods positioned for a one-hit kill. A few moments later, Gunma and the two kages reached the entrance to the ninja village. Sunadidano, Conan inclined her head, though we only met once, I'm sure you know who I am. That's right, Jiraiya introduced Orochimaru and I to you and your two friends, when we tracked him down to bring him back, the last Sanin recalled with a casual tone, what can I do for you, Konan-chan? I am here to discuss the terms of my surrender to the Hidden Leaf Village. Tsunade chuckled twice, and then began openly laughing. You came here to surrender, the Hokage guffawed. Then she suddenly stopped, and her eyes turned hard, what kind of fool do you take me for? I did not say I would give myself up freely, Conan maintained her cool, but if you are willing to meet my conditions, I will remit myself to your custody, and tell you everything I know. About Goki Namikaze, his generals, his plans, the Shizokas. Information that could win you this war. You hardly look ready to negotiate, 
Tsunade's eyes narrowed thoughtfully as she reigned in her anger. She gestured to indicate the paper daggers the other woman was holding. I had to make sure I would not be killed or captured before we could talk, the origami shinobi argued evenly. Then let's talk. Not in public, the renegade shook her head. You don't expect me to be alone with you, do you? The Sanin countered. No. So my first deal is this, give me a 24-hour amnesty. So long as I do not spy or harm your people, I am free to come and go for the next day, unhindered by your people. Then we can go and talk, somewhere secure. For your safety you may have any three of your people present. And for mine, I want Naruto Uzumaki there. Tsunade frowned. She felt a general honesty in the younger woman's words, right up to the end. She could tell that there was some other reason Conan wanted Naruto there. Really, the Hokage probed, why do you want the knucklehead there? We all know how stupidly honorable and uncommonly strong he is, Conan shrugged without altering the placement of her blades, if you promise my safety, I know at least he will uphold that promise. The last Sanin again sensed the truth in Conan's words, though she still felt Jiraiya's student was holding back. Unless, of course, she is a much better liar than I think she is, Tsunade thought to herself, wishing a Hyuga or an interrogator was present to confirm her impressions. Fine, Tsunade waved her hand, you have a 48-hour amnesty, starting now, unless you violate our hospitality. That is generous of you, Conan frowned as she released her hostages. The two Chunin scrambled away, leaving the two women facing each other openly. Why, the paper user prompted. Because Naruto's team isn't due back from the Sound Village until tomorrow, and I didn't want you worrying that we would run out of time in the middle of our talks. Conan nodded her understanding and relaxed, if only a little. After escorting their guest to the Octagon Shuriken, Tsunade flipped open her phone and called operations. Change the guard rotations, she ordered, I want every Huga, Inazuka, and Aburim out. Put 60% of them on the walls, and have the rest patrol the village. Tell them to keep an eye on our guest, if she chooses to venture out. But more importantly they should look for any other incursions, in case this is a distraction. Like last time. Conan sat on one side of the table, and behind her sat Naruto and Hinata. Across from her sat the Hokage, with Kakashi Hataki on her right and Shikamaru Nara on her left. Unlike Naruto and Hinata, the two shinobi with the Hokage were at her side, at the table, not placed a few feet back. Tsunade would have rather had Shikaku than his son, but the elder tactician was still directing the cleanup of the Shizokas in the land of rice paddies. Similarly, Hinata was not the best lie detector among the Hugas, but she was available and she would help keep Naruto in line. Beyond that, her fiancé would have told the Pale Beauty about the negotiations anyway, so including her instead of another member of her clan kept the loop smaller. Though he had been annoyed to be excluded, Tsunade had kept Yasuo Mizuno out of the meeting at Conan's firm request. Instead the Hokage promised to fill in the Mizukage and her other peers as soon as possible. There must be something you want very badly from to come here and offer to betray Guki, Tsunade said smugly, so, let's start with you telling me what it is. I want you to rescue Negato, the paper user said, unable to keep a hint of desperation from her voice, and bring him here. And use your skills to help him recover. Then, decommission both of us, and let us live here freely as civilians, under your protection. Those are my demands. Do that and I will tell you everything I know. The five-leaf shinobi all gawked at her openly, too thoroughly shocked by Conan's statement to maintain their composure. Just to clarify, because we've had hints and suspicions, but no definite proof, the Sanin said after she recovered, but your friend Nagato is also the one we know as pain, right? Yes, Conan nodded shallowly, the six paths of pain are extensions of Nagato, one of the powers afforded him by his Rinnegan. They are also what is killing him. Let me get this straight, Shikamaru interjected incredulously, you want us to rescue Guki's most loyal, most powerful, and most vital follower? Presumably from the Kyomoga Cure, or the Amage Cure, or some other nigh-impregnable fortress. Is Guki holding this Nagato guy hostage, and forcing him to use the pains to help him? Naruto asked, his eye squinted in confusion. No, as Narakuen said, Nagato is loyal to Guki-sensei, Conan answered, and in addition, he believes helping Guki-sensei achieve his goals is penance for killing Yahiko. 
that is why he is willing to push himself to the verge of death. Surely Guki wouldn't give up his most valuable general? Tsunade mirrored Shikamaru's disposition. I used to think that, Conan agreed, but Guki-sensei relies heavily on pain. And he arrogantly believes he can keep Nagato alive, at least long enough to complete his plans. But worst of all, Guki-sensei knows that the paths of pain will survive Nagato's death. Without Nagato, they would be unable to replace any paths that might die, but the existing proxies would continue to operate as they have been. I don't buy it, Tsunade shook her head, if Nagato really did kill Yahiko, and if he wants to die because of that, why would you stop him and betray Guki all in one stroke? Who is, or I guess was, Yahiko anyway? Naruto interrupted. I guess I will have to start from the beginning, Conan sighed. There were many orphans after the Second Great Ninja War, and Yahiko, Nagato, and I were among them. Yahiko had been born into a wealthy merchant family in the Land of Rain, and after his parents died, his relatives stole all his money, and left him in an orphanage. But the other children resented his previous life, and tormented him, so Yahiko ran away. Nagato was also born in the Rain Country, but in a small village near the Leaf Border. One day his village became a battleground between groups of rain, leaf, and stone shinobi. Nagato had been playing at a friend's house when the fighting started, and when he got home, he saw three ninjas run out of his house. The last, a leaf ninja, stopped and asked if Nagato lived there. After Nagato said yes, the leaf ninja apologized and ran after the first two ninjas. Nagato went inside and found his parents and older sister all dead. He went berserk, activating his Rinnegan instinctively. Then. Then he killed every single ninja fighting in his village. She took a deep breath, which came out as a sad sigh, even though he had saved them, the rest of the townsfolk were frightened of him, and they drove him out. Conan paused as if trying to decide, and Hinata prompted gently, And what about you, Conan-san? I was born in the Grass County, right next to the border with the Rain Country. My father was on a business trip when he was killed by a shinobi, I never found out from which village. And then my mother took ill and died. I was sent to live with an uncle, but the way he treated me was inhumane, so I also ran away. You mean he? Hinata interjected sadly. No, Conan chuckled ironically, if he had done something like you are thinking, I might have been able to understand it. But when I said inhumane, I meant it literally. He collected porcelain dolls, and I became part of his collection. He gave me beautiful, fancy dresses to wear, and I was made to sit or stand for hours without moving. If I blinked or fidgeted, he would ground me from reading for a few days or give me bread and broth for dinner while he ate normal meals. He never hurt me physically or starved me or anything like that, but it was strange and creepy, and I when I couldn't take it anymore, I fled. I met Yahiko a few months later. There was a temple that was providing meals for people hurt by the war, and he approached me because I was alone and about the same age. He started talking to me and after a few days I opened up and started talking to him as well. We became friends and started to stick together. We discovered it was easier together than it was alone. People would be more generous giving alms to a poor brother and sister, and we could also watch each other's backs. A few more months after that, I took some money that I had saved up, and went to buy a new book. But the shopkeeper refused to serve a grubby little orphan, and accused me of being a thief. When I complained, he tried to punch me. But Nagato was there, and he protected me. He stepped in between me and the salesperson, and took the hit on the back. He did it without flinching, and when he turned to look at the bookseller, the older man looked afraid. He even took a step away from us. But then the salesman got his nerve back, and demanded we both leave or he would call the police. Nagato just bowed and gently pulled me outside. He started to leave, but I grabbed his arm and asked him to come with me. I took him to Yahiko and told him what happened and asked if Nagato could join us. Yahiko resisted at first, but he ultimately agreed. That was how the three of us became a team. The next few years were hard. Even after the end of the war, there was not a lot of food, nor did people have a lot of more to give away, even to three children. But we stayed together, and sometimes resorted to theft, and ultimately we managed to survive. And then we met him. Jiraiya, Tsunade noted with a tone to match Conan's sadness. 
Yes, the younger woman nodded, the three of us were leaving the latest village we had been haunting, and Jiraiya Sensei was on his way in for the night. And when Nagato saw Sensei's hidden leaf headband, he went crazy and attacked him. I'm not sure if it was because Jiraiya Sensei was just that much more skilled than the ninjas who attacked Nagato's village, or if Nagato was just too weak from two years of barely surviving, but Jiraiya Sensei subdued Nagato with little trouble. I remember him staring very intently at Nagato's eyes, and I was afraid, so I gave him a peace offering. Conan suddenly produced a sheet of paper, and the leaf ninjas tensed. But she sent a sliver of chakra into it, and it folded itself into a flower, similar to, yet simpler than, the one in her hair. Interesting, Jiraiya noted as he took the flower, who taught you how to do this? No. No one, sir, she quailed slightly under his gaze, I just sort of, do it. Is this another Kekiai Jinkai, the leaf Jonin pondered under his breath, or just a natural talent? He looked over them again cannily, and then released the bearer of the Rinnegan. Jiraiya took a step back and assumed a non-threatening stance. It looks like you three have had it pretty rough, he said, openly and jovially, how would you like me to teach you a few things to make your lives easier? Yahiko agreed immediately, Conan continued, and Nagato didn't say anything, but it was obvious from his expression he wanted to refuse. They both looked to me to decide, and I decided to trust Jiraiya-sensei. The next year and a half went by very quickly. At first, he just taught us how to survive, how to hunt, trap, and fish. About which fruits and berries tasted good, which ones tasted bad but were still nutritious, and which one would kill us. But then he slowly began to teach us other things. How to harness and control our chakra. How to fight and how to sneak. We didn't realize it at first, but he was teaching us to be ninjas. Then we showed up, Tsunade interjected when the younger woman paused to collect her thoughts. The defector nodded. Yes, you and Orochimaru tracked down Jiraiya-sensei, to bring him back here, Conan recalled, you said he was needed for a mission. He offered to take us back with him, to let us become leaf ninjas. I wanted to jump at the chance, and was ready to drag Nagato with us. Even though he had grown to trust of even respect Jiraiya-sensei, back then Nagato still bore a grudge against the leaf village, he thought sensei's conduct was the exception, not the the rule. Are you saying Nagato doesn't hate the Kanahaga core anymore? Naruto interrupted. Yes, the origami user confirmed, but I will get to that shortly. Anyway, once again, Yahiko was the first to speak for us, she resumed, but this time he surprised us by turning down Jiraiya-sensei's offer. I thought he did it for Nagato, so I followed his example. Jiraiya-sensei seemed upset by our choice, but accepted it. You three left, and once again we were on our own. But that wasn't going to last long. The next day, Yahiko told us why he had decided not to follow Sensei. There were many other orphans in the villages we frequented, and Yahiko wanted to start taking care of them and training them like Jiraiya had done for us. Nagato and I were shocked at first, but as he laid out his plan, we got caught up in his excitement. We decided to do it, and found our first new wards only a few days later. Over the next few years we amassed a group of almost forty other kids, and trained them. At the same time, we honed our own skills, and to learn more, we acquired books and scrolls on chakra and combat, sometimes legally and other times not. As our abilities and numbers grew we began to take on odd jobs in local villages, basically doing D-rank missions. Yahiko started calling us the Akatsuki, saying we could be the dawn of a new era for the people of the rain country. Wasn't that dangerous? Kakashi interrupted in his normal, bland manner, you were kind of stepping on the hidden rain's toes. Yes, but back then, Hanzo was rejecting most of those kinds of jobs, she answered, if there wasn't a chance for combat, the possibility his genin would get some kind of battle experience, he was not interested. At first, we only took the jobs from people after the rain turned them away, but in time people figured out Hanzo was just going to throw them out, and that we charged less, so they started coming to us first. Nagato and I worried that it would be like you said, but we heard through the grapevine that Hanzo was actually happy that we were saving him the time and paperwork of having to deal with requests he considered inconsequential. In time, we saved up enough money to buy our own plot of land, and began to build more permanent residences. And also during that time, as we approached physical adulthood, both Nagato and Yahiko started to court me. 
then the Third Great War started. And as the rain began to send out shinobi to do battle, they had less manpower to devote to bodyguard jobs and hunting bandits. But at the same time, the number of bandits increased as people were displaced by the fighting. And the people started coming more and more to our little fake ninja village. I said we should turn them away, but Yehiko said it was our job to help them, Conan sighed in regret, and to be honest I, we didn't really fight him on it. We had improved a great deal since Jiraiya Sensei left us, and we had dozens of less experienced comrades. We were overconfident and self-important. And we might have gotten away with it. The war came to an end, the rain ninjas returned, and Hanzo had new crops of genin to train. But in our arrogance, we kept taking jobs hunting thieves and protecting merchants. We decided since the rain couldn't keep up during the war, they forfeited their right to those missions. Hanzo felt differently. It happened three months after the treaties were signed, three months to the day, her expression clouded in painful memory, Nagato and Yahiko were out guarding a caravan, but everyone else was at home. Hanzo and six of his elite Jonin assassins appeared out of nowhere, our sentries died before they even noticed the invasion. They slaughtered everyone. It was barely a fight. I managed to kill one, but was hurt in the process and the other rain ninjas surrounded me almost immediately. I thought I was dead, but Hanzo ordered them to stop. He realized the Negato and Yahiko were not there, and he had somehow heard that they were in love with me. So he took me hostage and made camp to wait. Yahiko was their target. Hanzo had learned that Yahiko had come up with the idea to train other orphans, and that he was our leader. As we waited, some of his men asked if they could play with me, she shuddered at the thought, but Hanzo stopped them. He said if they broke me, I wouldn't be as useful as bait. Just after noon on the fourth day, Nagato and Yahiko returned. They found our friends, our students, massacred, left to rot where they fell. Nagato told me later he almost snapped. You see, he recognized the wounds on our comrades, they were just like the ones on his family. When Hanzo and his men revealed themselves, Nagato almost attacked them, but when Hanzo showed me to them, both Nagato and Yahiko froze. So you are the boy who has been stealing from me, the rain leader's voice sounded mechanical through his complex breathing apparatus. He pushed the young woman into the arms of his second and took a step closer. After staring at the orange-haired teen for a moment, Hanzo turned to crimson-haired Rinnegan Bearer. I understand both of you have a more than passing interest in this fair lass, he taunted Negato, but I also am lead to believe she is more interested in your friend than in you. But I don't care about you or the girl. Hanzo tossed a kunai to Nagato, before stepping back. The teen unwittingly caught the blade, and noticed the edges possessed an odd, purple hue. So I will make you a bargain, Hanzo continued, kill your friend, the one who organized this insult to me, and I will allow you and the last to live. Provided you leave the land of rain, of course. Nagato glanced back and forth from Yahiko to Conan, his remarkable eyes betraying uncertainty. The blade is poisoned, Hanzo added, in case you were thinking about trying to trick me with an attack that looks worse than it is. Even the slightest cut should do the job. He wanted to save me, Conan wiped away a tear, but he didn't want to kill his best friend, and he was afraid if he did it, I would think he was doing it so I couldn't be with Yahiko. And he told me part of him wanted to do it for that very reason. So you were in love with Yahiko, Tsunade mused. The Hokage took that as further reason to suspect the supposed defector, but kept her doubts out of her voice. No, Conan's expression suddenly shifted from sad to wistfully happy, Yahiko was a ladies' man, the sort of guy who could make any girl giggle and blush. Even me, which is why some people might have thought I was interested in him. But I could never really trust Yahiko's intentions. No, Nagato was the one I fell for, his gentleness, his determination, his loyalty and he needed me in a way Yahiko never did. Hinata found herself nodded in agreement. Naruto glanced at his beloved, and she smiled at him and took his hand. When he thought Nagato wouldn't make a decision, Hanzo took another step, Conan's expression darkened, he told Nagato that if he didn't kill Yahiko, then he would make both of them watch while he let his men do whatever they wanted to me. I started to try to fight back again, until Nagato began to turn towards Yahiko with an apologetic look. For a moment, it looked like he would do what that bastard Hanzo wanted, and the rain ninjas looked almost gleeful. 
but then Nagato hesitated, and Yahiko did not. He grabbed Nagato's hand to keep him from dropping the kunai. And then he sliced open his own belly. Yahiko forced Nagato to help him commit seppuku to save us both. Ha 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 ha, Hanzo's laughter rang out over the ruined village. Wonderful, the rain leader guffawed, what spirit, what loyalty. After a few more moments of grotesque joy, Hanzo calmed down and addressed this man. Release her, he ordered. Hanzo-sama, the jonin hold Conan hesitated. His hand held the knife that killed his friend, Hanzo explained, making him ultimately responsible. And so I must honor my bargain. Nagato couldn't take it anymore. Before we knew what was happening, two of Hanzo's men were dead, crushed where they stood. He charged forward, enraged, and Hanzo was able to avoid him, but Nagato quickly killed the last three jonin who had slaughtered our friends. I think their surprise cost them as much as his rage, but in the end it didn't matter. Nagato turned and went after Hanzo. But even berserk and intuitively using his rinnegan, Nagato was not able to overcome Hanzo. The fight lasted a few minutes, and Nagato pulled out every jutsu he knew, but in the end, Hanzo was too powerful, too experienced. He was able to fight the three of us to a draw, Tsunade noted.